Their lobbying also tells a different story. Today, the committee is releasing a new staff analysis showing that over the past 10 years, these four companies have dedicated nearly only a very tiny fraction of their immense lobbying resources to enact the policies they publicly claim are key to address climate change, while spending tens of millions to protect their profits from oil and gas. Earlier this year, a senior lobbyist at Exxon admitted the truth. He was caught on video saying that Exxon's support for a carbon tax was merely a, quote, talking point, which would never become reality. And even today, lobbyists from American Petroleum Institute and other industry groups are fighting tooth and nail against key climate provisions in the Build Back Better Act. But we must act. Just this week, the United Nations released a new report stating that nation's current climate pledges fall far short of what is necessary to advert catastrophe. These experts agree that we will still have a narrow and fast disappearing window to prevent the worst outcomes from climate change. To do that, we need to immediately cut fossil fuel emissions by 3 to 4 percent each year and rapidly transition to net zero carbon emissions. 27 years ago, seven tobacco executives appeared in this room before Congress. Rather than admitting the truth about their product, the executives lied. This was a watershed moment in the public's understanding of big tobacco. I hope that today's hearing represents a turning point for big oil. I hope that today the witnesses will finally own up to the industry's central role in this crisis and become part of the change we need. That also means cooperating with this committee's investigation. We asked each of these companies for documents six weeks ago, but they have not come close to producing the key internal documents about climate change and the money trail we asked for. So let me be clear. We are at the beginning of this investigation. I assure you we will not stop until we get to the truth. And if we need to call the CEOs back to testify again, we will. After four decades of deception and delay, it is time for the fossil fuel industry to finally change its ways. Thousands of companies have already recognized the imminent threat of climate change and are working with community leaders and scientists to bring down emissions. It's time for Big Oil to finally join the rest of us in this fight. We can prevent a climate disaster while keeping energy costs low and creating good paying jobs, but only if Big Oil acknowledges its central role in this crisis and commits to meaningful and immediate action. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Comer, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, and I want to thank the witnesses for their willingness to testify before the committee today. However, I have concerns about today's hearing and the legitimacy of Democrats' so-called investigation of America's oil and gas companies. First, let me remind Chairwoman Maloney and committee Democrats that the Oversight and Reform Committee exists to root out waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal bureaucracy. When are we going to hold a hearing with a Biden administration cabinet member so we can hold the federal government accountable? It's critical that this committee examine the pressing concerns of American citizens. Inflation caused by the Biden administration economic policies is sitting at 5.4%. Gas prices are at a seven year high and heating bills are expected to rise as much as 54% this winter. The Biden administration continues to allow illegal immigrants to pour over the southern border. Questions remain about the disastrous handling of the Afghanistan withdrawal. All while the White House fails to manage the COVID-19 pandemic they said would be over by July 4th. 
Instead of convening hearings on any of these topics and holding Biden administration accountable for its actions, committee Democrats have called this hearing because they watched a deceptively recorded and edited eight-minute video clip of an Exxon lobbyist. Committee Democrats won't tell the American people that the basis of their misguided inquiry appears to be a multi-month operation launched by activist group Greenpeace UK involving fake web websites and LinkedIn profiles, false job opportunities, and deceptive emails and interviews. Given the questionable activities undertaken by Greenpeace UK to obtain the so-called information at the heart of this investigation, the American people must question the legitimacy of the Democrats' actions. When committee Republicans asked Chairwoman Maloney to join us in requesting the full video back on August 12, 2021, they refused. Ironically, just yesterday, over two months later, the Democrats wrote saying they now would like to join our request. I don't know what took so long, but they apparently didn't want the full video to be shown at today's hearing. In reality, they don't want to see it, and they don't want the American people to see it. Democrats didn't invite the person who was secretly recording to the hearing today because they're more interested in a spectacle. Instead, committee Democrats took this questionable information and wrote letters to the CEOs who are appearing today. They requested internal documents and communications that these entities had with the federal government and lawmakers. They struck at the very heart of the First Amendment protections that exist for these groups and any American to petition their government. We raised objections to Chairwoman Maloney about the protected nature of these communications and the chilling effect these requests would have on the ability of entities to petition their government. However, Democrats have not bothered to respond to our concerns. The purpose of this hearing is clear, to deliver partisan theater for primetime news. Subcommittee Chairman Khanna went to the media threatening subpoenas months before any of the witnesses were even invited to testify. Now, despite receiving well over 100,000 pages of documents from today's witnesses, Democrats are complaining that no one is cooperating with them. Chairwoman Maloney, this hearing is simply a distraction from the crises that the Biden administration's policies have caused for the American people. Just last week, President Biden admitted that he had no solution for the skyrocketing gas prices. He said prices will not go down until 2022. That's a problem for all Americans, especially low-income households. Meanwhile, hours after President Biden took office, he canceled the Keystone Pipeline and put 11,000 workers out of a job overnight, including the Republican witness, Neil Crabtree, who is still looking for work. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman yields back. I now rec represent uh, Chairman Rokana for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Comer and I have a good relationship. This isn't about partisanship. This is about getting at the truth. Today, the CEOs of the largest oil companies in the world have a choice. You can either come clean, admit your misrepresentations and ongoing inconsistencies, and stop supporting climate disinformation, or you can sit there in front of the American public and lie under oath. Now, let me remind you of a fact that I'm sure your many lawyers have brought to your attention. In 1994, the CEOs of the seven largest tobacco companies appeared right here before our committee. They, too, faced a choice. They chose to lie under oath, denying that nicotine was addictive. As I'm sure you realize, that didn't turn out too well for them. I hope Big Oil will not follow the same playbook as Big Tobacco. You are powerful leaders at the top of the corporate world at a turning point for our planet. Be better. Spare us the spin today. Really, we have no interest in it. Spin doesn't work under oath. We've all heard 
your spokespeople's talking points. Speak from the heart today. You will tell us your companies have contributed to academic research on climate science. That is true, but that is not the issue at hand. Despite your early knowledge of climate science, your companies and the trade associations you fund chose time and again to loudly raise doubts about the science and downplay the severity of the crisis. In short, the question is not, did you prevent academic research on climate science? No one says you prevented that, but did any of your executives at any point mislead the American public? You will say you've now seen the light. You will say you're for a carbon tax to have, quote, a talking point, even though the former Exxon lobbyist Keith McCoy tells us you believe, quote, it's not going to happen. You will say you're for the Paris Accords, of course. Most of you will say you're for working to reduce emissions, though notably one of you will say not the 80 to 90 percent of emissions that actually come from the gas you sell, just the 10 percent arising from your own operations. You'll tout carbon capture and storage, even though all of the carbon captured, I want to make this point clearly, all of the car captured carbon is being used to enhance oil extraction and actually increasing CO2 emissions in the world, even though there is no economically proven way to store CO2 indefinitely. Here's the problem. This hearing will show that your actions continue to be inconsistent with the climate goals you now espouse. I wish they were consistent. My goal, honestly, is not to embarrass you. It's not to have a gotcha moment. That doesn't help any of us. You actually have a moment to shine today. You could commit to changing course and taking actions that would avert a climate catastrophe. Or you could continue to deny and deceive out of a sense of institutional loyalty to your company's past. The choice is really yours. As you make it, Think of the indigenous-led demonstrations last week and the five young activists from the Sunrise Movement who have been outside the White House on a hunger strike for nine days and counting. They're putting their lives on the line because they know that countless thousands will suffer and die if we continue on our current path. Just today, don't think of yourselves as the CEO. Just think of yourselves as human beings. And I have this question, what will you do to end the hunger strike? What do you have to say to America's children born into a burning world? Find it in yourself today to tell the truth. It will be better for your company's futures and it will be better for humanity's future. Thank you. And I now recognize Congressman Norman for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, and I want to thank the witnesses for their willingness to testify before the committee today. Uh, today, committee Democrats have contrived yet another hearing to demonize the oil and gas industry. The folks represented before us today run organizations that are providing good paying jobs and secure affordable and clean energy for all Americans, something this administration is attempting to dismantle. Instead of conducting actual oversight, as Congressman Comer mentioned, uh, oversight that shows the disastrous decisions the Biden administration had made this year. The Democrats are focused on destroying an industry and the jobs it provides to distract us from the fact that they have no plan to recoup our energy workforce or energy independence. That's, I assume that's why they canceled the Keystone Pipeline. I assume that's how they justify Gas, buying gas and oil from countries that don't like us. I assume they do not understand the effects of the colonial pipeline shutdown, what it had on this country. Now we're begging OPEC uh, to make more oil and make it affordable. Members of this committee need to start focusing on the issues that are impacting everyday Americans and the consequences of an overly ambitious and unrealistic climate agenda. I don't know about the rest of you all uh, on this committee, but the people of South Carolina did not send me to Washington to bankrupt our country. And the, even the phrase, build back better, needs to be changed to bankrupt America quicker. We should have a hearing about some of the proposals by Democrats to spend hardworking American taxpayers' money on liberal pipe dreams. 
I'd learn, I would love to learn more about the proposal to spend $3.5 billion for the Green New Deal Youth Patrol aimed at helping jobless climate activists. Does anyone really believe the Youth Patrol will reduce the impacts of climate change? Will the Youth Patrol uh, make China and India less of a polluter than they are now? Uh, China continues to pollute at record levels while the United States continues to reduce emissions. Do Democrats really believe that putting the oil and gas industry out of business will suddenly make China less of a polluter? I'm afraid extreme proposals by Democrats will do nothing but destroy good-paying American jobs and ruin our economy. What Democrats will not un won't discuss and how President Biden and his administration's policies have caused a litany of issues for the American people. This administration's out-of-control spending is causing inflation to skyrocket. As a result, Americans are now paying more for goods and services while taking home less money in their paychecks. Everyone can see that. And look on your screen. The price of gasoline today is $1.22 more per gallon than it was this time last year under the Trump administration. As we enter the upcoming holiday season, the price of a Thanksgiving dinner will be a minimum of 5 percent more expensive than it was last year. Americans are feeling the effects of inflation in their wallets, and I fear it will only get worse. Uh, Chairwoman Maloney, we'll be getting you a letter uh, to hopefully have the Democrats' expert, John Kerry, fly over here, I assume, in his private jet on fossil fuel to participate in a debate with him offering the expert for the Democrat side, and we let us have another expert that can con contradict many of his statements. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kerry has, has a large contingent from the Biden administration, uh, and I'm sure he can bring them in to help him out. The Biden administration is headed to, to attend this conference this year uh, on climate change without a clear mandate from the U.S. Congress to make vague commitments that will never be met. And while, on, uh, while the top leaders from the largest polluters in the world, as I mentioned, China, uh, President Xi, refused to participate. While the Biden administration is in the United Kingdom, back here in America, our constituents are dealing with the growing crisis related to supply chain, gasoline prices, rising prices at every level. It is a truly sad that the American people are being abandoned by their leaders at such a critical moment. This crisis is not Democrat, it's not Republican, but it's intentionally caused by the Democratic Party of today. The oil and gas industry provide good paying jobs that help Americans reliably heat their houses, power their cars, and keep the lights on through the storm when the sun doesn't shine. Folks, we're heading down a dangerous path with the Biden administration's policies. I fear this winter and going into 2022 will only continue to get worse. It was recently reported that the home heating costs this winter would rise as much as 54 percent. The Biden administra administration, uh, as it has done on all the crisis it has had over the last nine months, has no plan to confront these mounting problems, uh, especially that affect everyone, but especially low-income Americans. The United States has abundant clean energy, natural resources. We, we must use these resources to advance America's interests while continuing to lead the world in emission reductions. This is a path forward, but the Democrats wants to, want to block it at every chance they get. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Mr. Darren Woods, who is the CEO of ExxonMobil. Then we will hear from Michael Wirth, who is the CEO of Chevron. Next, we will hear from David Lawler, who is the CEO of BP America. Next, we will hear from Ms. Gretchen Watkins, who is the president of Shell Oil. Next, we will hear from Mr. Mike Summers, who is the president of the American Petroleum Institute. Next, we will hear from Ms. Suzanne Clark, who is the President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Next, we will hear from Neil Crabtree, a former welder. Thank you. The witnesses will be unmuted so we can swear them in. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. 
I do. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Madam Chair. Thank you. And without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. And with that, Mr. Woods, you are Ma now Madam recognized Chair. for your testimony. Madam Chair. Who seeks recognition? Right here. I, I have a question. I'm curious, is there a reason why none of the witnesses traveled here to Washington today to represent their respective co companies? They elected to appear remotely, and they have that right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Woods, you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, Chairman Canna, Ranking Member Norman, and members of the Committee on Oversight and Reform. My name is Darren Woods. I am the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of ExxonMobil Corporation. On behalf of the company, I welcome the opportunity to participate in this important discussion today. ExxonMobil provides essential, an essential component of modern society, affordable, reliable, and abundant energy. For more than 150 years, oil and gas has played a critical role in our society, improving human lives, raising standards of living, and enabling unprecedented economic growth. Without them, the living standards that we enjoy today would not be possible. Those of us fortunate enough to live and work in the United States and other developed countries often take for granted our ready access to energy. That is not the case for billions of people around the world. Many still lack basic electricity or clean cooking facilities for their homes. Access to reliable and affordable energy is more than a convenience. Energy delivers longer, healthier lives, better education, greater mobility, and improved living conditions. It's one of the basic requirements that power economies and societal progress. ExxonMobil and its roughly 70,000 employees are proud of the contributions we make every day to improving the lives of people all around the world. It is vitally important work. We also recognize the society must continue to diversify our energy mix to address climate change. ExxonMobil has long recognized that climate change is real and poses serious risks. But there are no easy answers. As the International Energy Agency has said, oil and gas will continue to be necessary for the foreseeable future. We currently do not have the adequate alternative energy sources. At the same time, we know the combustion of oil and gas releases greenhouse gases, and that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that increased greenhouse gases can con uh, contribute to the effects of climate change. That's one of the issues we must address, and one that we are well positioned to continue our work on, reducing the emissions that result from the combustion of oil and gas. This hearing comes at an important time as the world is challenged with how to meet the growing need for energy while reducing emissions to mitigate climate change. The recent disruption of energy supplies in parts of the world has resulted in outages, fuel lines, and manufacturing shutdowns. The very real impact on families and businesses demonstrates how critical it is to thoughtfully manage the transition to a lower emissions future. ExxonMobil is committed to being part of the solution. Our scientists and engineers are applying their expertise to help responsibly meet the world's need for energy, while working to find ways to accelerate the transition to a world with fewer emissions. Starting with our own operations, we reduced emissions by 11 percent between 2016 and 2020. Our plans through 2025 are consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. They are expected to deliver significant additional redu reductions in both emissions intensity and absolute emissions. We launched a low carbon solutions business to commercialize carbon capture and other technologies such as hydrogen and biofuels, to reduce emissions in the parts of the economy that are the hardest to decarbonize. As the International Energy, Energy Agency recognized this year, carbon capture contributes to the transition to net zero in multiple ways, and it represents one of the biggest opportunities for innovation to address emissions. 
ExxonMobil is the world leader in this technology, has a share of approximately one fifth of global CCS capacity and is responsible for approximately 40% of all the captured anthropogenic CO2 in the world. We are pursuing several projects that can deliver large scale emission reductions in hard to decarbonize sectors like heavy industry and power generation. In addition, we are investing in breakthrough research to develop the next generation of lower emission fuels and fuels technologies, including advanced biofuels. We do that through research and development by our own scientists and by collaborating with leading universities, governments, and private companies around the world. Finally, ExxonMobil has been engaged in policy discussions related to the energy and environment for years. Our views on policies and its implications have been guided by our, our understanding of the science. We've been vocal and transparent in our support for governments to implement policies that are cost effective and achieve the greatest emission reductions at the lowest overall cost to society. We have advocated for an economy-wide reven revenue neutral price on carbon for more than a decade and have publicly supported the Paris Agreement since its inception. I hope that today's hearing stimulates thoughtful discussion and a greater understanding of the need for meaningful action from all of us, governments, businesses, and individuals. All of us use and depend on today's energy system. We all have a role to play in finding solutions to climate change that will reduce emissions while meeting the growing need for energy in order to improve lives around the world. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Wirth. You are now recognized for your testimony, Mr. Wirth. Chairwoman Maloney and Ranking Member Comer, Subcommittee Chairman Khanna and Ranking Member Norman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Michael Wirth and I am the Chair and CEO of Chevron. For more than 140 years, Chevron has proudly delivered energy that drives the world forward. Light, heat, mobility, mechanized agriculture, modern medicine, quite literally the food we eat, the clothes we wear, and the standard of living we enjoy are made possible by affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy. In many ways, our story and that of our industry track the history of human progress. These are stories of extraordinary achievements over the past century plus, achievements that were once believed impossible. Today, we're one of the world's leading integrated energy companies. We contribute to the communities where we operate by creating jobs, sourcing from local suppliers, and giving back to the community. Just as when we were founded in 1879, we continue to believe in the power of human ingenuity to overcome obstacles and find responsible solutions for meeting the world's growing energy needs to deliver a better future for all. The issue we're here to discuss today, climate change, is one of the biggest challenges of our time. At Chevron, we've been very clear about where we stand. We accept the scientific consensus. Climate change is real, and the use of fossil fuels contributes to it. We are committed to helping address this challenge. I also want to address directly a concern expressed by some of those calling for today's hearing. Today's hearing. While our views on climate change have developed over time, any suggestion that Chevron is engaged in an effort to spread disinformation and mislead the public on these complex issues is simply wrong. In recent years, conversations about climate have intensified, innovation and technology have accelerated, and the energy system that underpins our global economy has continued to evolve. So has Chevron. We believe the future of energy is lower carbon, and we're committed to being a leader in making that future a reality. We set ambitious targets for our own greenhouse gas emissions. We've announced a net zero aspiration for our upstream scope one and scope two emissions. And we intend to invest more than $10 billion to reduce emissions and grow new energy businesses. Our strategy is straightforward will continue to be a leader in efficient and lower carbon production of the traditional energy the world uses today while growing new lower carbon businesses that will be a bigger part of the future. I look forward to sharing the actions we're taking and more details about those actions are included in my written testimony. 
We welcome a thoughtful discussion about the path ahead and how we can achieve a lower carbon energy future, while at the same time avoiding supply disruptions and preserving American leadership in energy. As part of this discussion, the undeniable reality is that oil and gas remain an important part of the energy equation. Honest, thoughtful climate policy discussions should account for that. Chevron is a proud American company. The affordable, reliable energy that the more than 35,000 women and men of our company produce every day has improved the quality of life and enabled a higher standard of living for people around the world. Our products fuel hospitals, schools, offices, restaurants, stores, and homes. They enable the movement of goods around the world and right to our very doorsteps. They create good paying jobs that support families across the country. And they enhance our national security by reducing dependence on foreign energy. This should all be part of the conversation as we seek an orderly and predictable energy future that works for everyone. Confronting the climate challenge requires critical thinking about investment, technology, pace, goals, and timetables. This must be a comprehensive effort. No one company, no one industry, and no one country can meet this global challenge alone. This is a conversation necessarily about both supply, which Chevron helps to provide, and demand, driven by consumers worldwide. At Chevron, we believe government action in partnership with the private sector is essential to enable evolution of the energy system, and we stand ready to work with you. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lawler, you are now recognized for your testimony. Chairman Woman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, Chairman Khanna, Ranking Member Norman, and members of the committee. I'm Dave Lawler. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about BP's low carbon transformation and our ambition to get to net zero by 2050 or sooner and to help the world get there too. I first joined BP in 2014 as head of our oil and gas operations in the continental United States. I was named chairman and president of BP America last year. Our U.S. operations are part of the economic fabric of this country. We directly employ some 10,000 people, support nearly a quarter million jobs, and contributed $60 billion to the national economy last year. Almost a quarter century ago, BP was among the first major companies in our industry to recognize publicly the scientific consensus about the human contribution to climate change and supported policies to address it. That recognition has guided many of our decisions since then. These decisions include launching a separate low carbon energy business in 2005, which invested more than $8 billion over 10 years. By 2007, BP publicly supported carbon pricing. When we announced our net zero ambition in February 2020, we recognized it wouldn't be easy, but we believed it was vital for both society and the success of our business. We know that the world's carbon budget is finite, and we've set clear, verifiable, short and longer term targets on our path to net zero. By 2025, we aim to grow our low carbon investments to three to four billion dollars per year, and then to five billion dollars per year in 2030. This would represent nearly a third of our projected capital expenditures. At the same time, by 2030, we expect to reduce our global oil and gas production by 40% from a 2019 baseline. Beyond capital investment and reduced production, we plan to eliminate routine flaring in our U.S. onshore operations by 2025. We also have an ambitious global methane intensity target of 0.2% based on our industry-leading measurement approach. I recognize that some may doubt 
how serious we are about our net zero ambition. I get it. Our progress hasn't always been a straight line, but we've learned a great deal and we view the path we're on as a business imperative. That's one reason we continue to report regularly on our progress. And we've already taken concrete steps to meet our targets. Through the first half of 2021, we more than doubled our 2019 low carbon investments to $1.1 billion, undertaking transformative offshore wind and solar energy power generation projects in the United States. This doesn't mean BP is getting out of the oil and gas business. As we transition, our oil and gas business will continue providing the energy the world needs while funding our investments in wind, solar, and other renewable energy sources. As we work to make BP a net zero company, we are trying to help the world get there too. We've redoubled our advocacy and support of policies to address climate change. We've advocated directly and with a range of partners to advance carbon pricing at the state and federal level. We're advocating for the direct regulation of methane emissions from the oil and gas industry. We aim for alignment between our positions and those of the trade associations to which we belong. We recognize that associations' positions are often a compromise of various perspectives, and we advocate within them for our views on climate change. With world leaders on the verge of an important international climate gathering in Glasgow, it's more critical than ever that governments and industry work together to find solutions to this challenge. We know we have a hard road ahead, but it's also filled with opportunities. Along the way, we welcome debate and public scrutiny because succeeding in the energy transition is critical, both for BP and for the world. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Watkins, you're now recognized for your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, Chairman Kama, Ranking Member Comer, Ranking Member Norman, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the urgent need for action on climate change and Shell's effort to advance society's transition to a lower carbon future. Through Shell's global powering progress strategy, we are working with our customers across sectors to accelerate our own progress and support the transition to net zero emissions in the United States and globally in step with society. Shell has been and remains vocal about the needed energy transition and we continue to advocate for sound carbon policies that support the transition to renewables and lower carbon energy sources including seeking to ensure a transition that is fair and equitable. This kind of challenge is not new to Americans. We have tackled enormous challenges before and we can do it again. I lead Shell Oil Company, the US subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Shell's position on climate change has been publicly documented for nearly three decades. As early as 1991, our annual reports discussed concerns about climate change. Our first sustainability report in 1998 noted that human activity and the use of fossil fuels could affect the climate. Shell has issued a sustainability report every year since, and the subsequent reports have discussed climate change and the challenges that it poses. Shell has long advocated for governmental policies that will reduce fossil fuel demand, stimulate innovation in cleaner energy technologies and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and ensure access to reliable and affordable energy. Shell strongly advocated for the United States to remain in the Paris Climate, Climate Agreement and later to rejoin it. Shell has a long history of advocating for carbon pricing, such as Waxman-Markey, which passed the House in 2009. Shell supports a number of provisions in the pending infrastructure legislation related to climate change, and we support climate provisions and budget reconciliation including electric vehicle infrastructure, hydrogen production, carbon capture and storage, and a well-constructed methane fee. In 2017, Shell was the first energy business to announce an ambition for reducing net carbon intensity. And in the years since, Shell's ambitions have progressively developed, 
In 2020, we announced our intention to be a net zero by 2050 company in step with society. We have sh short, medium, and long-term intensity-based reduction targets. And today, in announcements made early this morning in Europe, we've announced our intent to reduce our scope one and two absolute emissions by 50% by 2030 on a net basis. Shell companies have invested billions in lower carbon energy, including solar and wind, electric vehicle charging and infrastructure. For example, we purchased a large stake in Silicon Ranch, a leading solar farm developer in Nashville, Tennessee, with more than 145 operating facilities coast to coast. And we acquired Green Lots, a California-based company that provides electric vehicle charging solutions. Meeting the demand for reliable energy while simultaneously addressing climate change is a huge undertaking and one of the defining challenges of our time. Fuel is needed to power trucks, airplanes, and ships that move people and commerce around the globe. Petrochemicals are needed for everything from clothing to cell phones, from hand sanitizer to the fibers and the masks we have all become accustomed to wearing. For this reason, Shell will continue to develop fossil fuel energy sources, yet even here we are seeing an energy transition. For example, Shell's production in the Gulf of Mexico is among the lowest in the world in greenhouse gas intensity. And we do not anticipate frontier exploration for new oil and gas repositories after 2025. We are committed to a leadership role in the energy transition and continuing to provide the life-sustaining and life-enabling products that Americans need. Shell is proud of its history providing energy to consumers in the United States and around the world. And we look forward to enabling a future where we all move to net zero emissions. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Summers, you're now recognized for your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, Chairman Khanna, Ranking Member Norman, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Mike Summers, and I am President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Petroleum Institute. API is the National Trade Association representing all segments of America's oil and natural gas industry. Our nearly 600 members, from large integrated companies to small independent operators, provide much of our nation's energy and develop safe, responsible operational standards. API's mission is to promote safety across the industry globally and to advocate for public policy in support of a strong, viable U.S. oil and natural gas sector. I would like to focus on three points. First, our member companies make products that enable modern life. Every day, the men and women of America's oil and natural gas industry provide the energy to maintain our quality of life, power our economy, and improve the condition of people here at home and around the globe. This industry meets Americans' needs with a strong commitment to safety, reliability, and environmental performance. And it is my high honor to work in this essential industry. Second, we meet today at a defining moment, one where energy demands are rising and the focus on a cleaner environment has never been greater. Climate change is real, industrial activity contributes to it, and the challenges of ushering in a lower carbon future are massive and intertwined, yet fundamental. It is the opportunity of our time to address climate change while meeting the world's growing need for energy. API released a series of policy proposals, industry actions, and initiatives in our climate action framework to make a measurable difference in advancing energy and environmental progress. This plan is centered around advancing innovation and technology to tackle this challenge. 
The five main actions are, one, accelerating technology and innovation to reduce emissions while meeting growing energy needs. Two, further mitigating emissions from operations to advance additional environmental progress. Three, endorsing a carbon price policy by government to drive economy-wide market-based solutions. Four, advancing cleaner fuels to provide lower carbon choices for consumers. Five, driving climate reporting to provide consistency and transparency. In the meantime, API and its members are not waiting for a government mandate to address the real and serious challenge of climate change. Our view is that innovation is the foundation of meaningful action, and as such, our industry is making significant investments in carbon capture, hydrogen, and cleaner fuels. API companies are actively reducing methane emissions from their operations through technologies and other solutions. More work remains. But one area where experts agree is that oil and natural gas will continue to be the leading energy sources for decades to come. And it is important that we take action to reduce emissions while providing that energy. In closing, API supports climate action. Governments, industries, and consumers must accelerate policy and technology solutions together. Yet legislative proposals that punitively target American industry will reverse our nation's energy leadership, harm our economy and American workers, and weaken our national security. We look forward to continuing to work with Congress and others to shape and advance effective energy and climate policy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Clark, you are now recognized for your testimony. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, Chairman Khanna, Ranking Member Norman, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Since March, I've had the privilege to serve as the President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate this opportunity to discuss our efforts to address climate change. The Chamber's position is clear. The climate is changing, and humans are contributing to these changes. Addressing the climate challenge with bold solutions and advancing economic prosperity are not mutually exclusive. We can achieve both goals, and the Chamber is dedicated to doing so. The Chamber's message on climate is also clear. Inaction is not an option. We advocate for market-based solutions to reduce emissions while supporting U.S. competitiveness, national security, and working people across America. We have focused on effective climate solutions, and we see ample common ground for all sides to come together to advance policies that are practical, predictable, and durable. The American business community is essential to developing, financing, building, and operating the solutions needed to effectively combat climate change and meet our energy needs. Businesses are already taking action by investing in technology and enhancing their efficiency. Their actions are good for business, the economy, and our planet. The government also plays a critical role in our country's efforts to address climate change. We believe Congress must enact durable climate policy with bipartisan support. This will help ensure that policies withstand the changing priorities of different administrations and reduce uncertainty for businesses. The Chamber supports policies that encourage innovation and investment in market-based climate solutions. We believe in transparent, well-designed market mechanisms that reduce emissions while supporting economic growth and job creation. Our implementation of these principles has led to meaningful progress over the past few years. Let me share a few examples. The Chamber played a leading role in the 2020 passage of the Energy Act, the most significant, significant climate and energy legislation adopted in more than a decade. Over several years, we mobilized business community support, partnered with NGOs and others to get the bill enacted. 
We worked closely with policymakers on both sides of the aisle to ensure that it contained innovation-focused measures that addressed climate change, promoted American technological leadership, and fostered economic growth. The Chamber also played a leading role in bipartisan legislation to implement a phase down of hydrofluorocarbons, which will significantly reduce emissions that contribute to global warming. We have called for direct regulations on methane emissions from oil and gas operations and worked with Congress to improve pre-disaster mitigation and resilience policies. We also strongly supported the Biden administration's decision to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, and we engaged early with this administration and provided principles for its consideration as it revised the U.S. national emission reduction commitments. Finally, this year, we organized a coalition in support of bipartisan infrastructure legislation that would advance efforts to decarbonize the economy. Building smart, modern, resilient infrastructure has long been a priority of the Chamber. The bipartisan infrastructure framework is exactly the type of bold, economy-growing action needed to address climate change. The Chamber and its members are proud to support it as standalone legislation. Our country has made positive strides forward and could build greater momentum with bipartisan cooperation on the solutions before us, and we must. More needs to be done to protect our planet for future generations. Earlier this year, President Biden's climate envoy, former Secretary of State John Kerry, stated that 50% of the reductions we have to make to get to net zero are going to come from technologies we don't yet have. Whether or not 50% is the right figure, Secretary Kerry's central point is correct. We must take urgent action now to develop the technologies necessary to meet our climate goals. I'll say it again, inaction is not an option. For more than 100 years, the Chamber has advocated for pro-growth policies that help businesses of all sizes create jobs, strengthen communities, and grow our economy. There is broad consensus across our membership and the business community that combating climate change is an urgent issue, requiring citizens, government, and business to work together. The Chamber remains dedicated to working with Congress to identify solutions that improve our environment. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Crabtree, you are now recognized for your testimony. Mr. Crabtree. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and uh, Ranking Member Comer and all the distinguished committee members. Uh, it's definitely not something that I'm proud of, but I may have been the first casualty of the Build Back Better plan. Uh, three hours after President Biden's inauguration, I lost my job on uh, the construction of the Keystone Pipeline. Now, I realize this was only one project, but what I really feared was the consequences of the decisions uh, would have on my future. And now I see those uh, fears being realized. Uh, not only did I lose an opportunity for employment on the Keystone, but I'm losing employment opportunities because of energy companies seem to be hesitant to plan other needed projects that we need in this country. And all this is happening uh, while the demand for energy is rising. Uh, the Build Back Better shouldn't mean the total neglect and destruction of our energy infrastructure as we know it. Uh, people from coast to coast are feeling the pain of rising energy prices, and there seems to be no thought given to the hundreds of thousands of workers in this industry or the millions of products that we use every single day that, uh, that, that you know are provided by fossil fuels. Then there shouldn't be a fear of a heating shortage in the Northeast this coming winter, but uh, yet. Uh, here we are, and Americans need to know that there isn't a fuel shortage. Uh, that's not the cause of the rising prices. Rising prices are a direct result of the lack, uh, lack of infrastructure that it takes to get the products moved to where they're needed mostly, and it's uh, mainly pipeline construction. The, uh, the construction of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the Constitution, the Penn East would have all taken much needed energy uh, to the Northeast this year. Instead of being built and being in service, they're now canceled. And they were canceled because of overregulation and, uh, and a push uh, for a green new uh, energy sector that just isn't capable or uh, reliable enough to provide the energy that, uh, that we uh, need right now. Uh, every penny in the increase of uh, energy 
uh, on Americans, it takes uh, about a billion dollars out of the pockets of Americans over a year's time. And I, I can't see how that's a popular decision right now. And I believe that elections in the coming years are going to prove that point. Uh, the CEOs and the presidents of the companies that are gathered here today have uh, provided uh, this country with that something that we've all demanded. Uh, and that's clean, affordable, reliable energy. Uh, we've built military bases in other countries to protect resources. Uh, you know, our government has contributed to this and to treat these CEOs as villains. Uh, I, I don't agree with it. The disruption of the colonial pipeline earlier this year should have proven just how important that the work that myself and these companies do uh, really is. I mean, we took one pipeline that was down for one week and uh, we seen the panic it caused. And I was hoping it would shed a light on a bigger problem. And that is why do we only have one pipeline servicing uh, such a, an important part of this country? And the answer is simple. It's because of a, it costs right now more to permit and plan a new pipeline than it does to actually build one. And uh, neglecting to uh, add to the capacity with new pipelines is a dangerous thing for our country, just like neglecting uh, roads and bridges. Now, I believe it's going to take a, an all of the above approach uh, for our energy uh, future. Renewables are gonna play a part, they will be developed. Carbon technology needs to be developed, uh, but we can't demonize the fossil fuel in uh, industry. Uh, it's only gonna hurt the economy and the country. Now, I belong to a union that specializes in pipeline construction, and I've spent over 25 years, you know, developing the skills that I have, and I'm compensated well for it. And uh, the government's idea of shutting down my industry and retraining me in another career, it's not realistic. Uh, I'm too far in, uh, in life to be starting over at an entry-level uh, position. Uh, it's just not realistic for me. Now, there's a whole generation of workers coming up that uh, if they want to pursue uh, careers in the green energy, then I support that, just like I support private companies' rights to uh, develop green energy. What I don't support is a government lim uh, limiting my employment opportunities in my chosen field, uh, especially when the product is in huge demand. Uh, to sum this up, uh, the administration is having a direct negative impact on energy prices in this country. They're having uh, an impact on my ability to find work right now. Uh, my crisis right now isn't the climate. My crisis is the mortgage payments I have due every month. It's the food I need to put on my table. And it's the health care I need to provide to my family. And instead of demonizing the CEOs and presidents that are here today, I would like to thank them for the opportunities they've provided me and my family and my union uh, to work in these past few decades. And uh, I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Uh, pursuant to Rule 9C, the chair authorizes an hour of extended questioning to be equally divided between the majority and the minority for this hearing. I have consulted with the ranking member, and we have agreed to divide up the hour of extended questioning in four 15-minute blocks. First, the chair will ask questions, then the ranking member, then Mr. Khanna, and then Mr. Norman. The ranking member intends to yield a portion of his time to Mr. Brady and Mr. Graves. And without objection, both members are authorized to participate in today's hearing. With that, I now recognize myself for 15 minutes, and I want to start with a few simple questions, and I would appreciate a yes or no answer on each of them. Uh, Mr. Woods, uh, CEO of Exxon, do you agree that climate change is real? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Lawler, CEO of P BP America, do you agree that climate change is caused by human activities? Yes. Mr. Wirth, CEO of Chevron, do you agree that burning fossil fuels is a significant cause of climate change? Chairwoman, uh, we've been clear on where we stand, uh, and we accept the kind scientific consensus that the use of uh, fossil fuels contributes to climate change. 
So that I'm taking as a yes. Ms. Watkins, president of Shell, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a new report in August concluding that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. The Secretary General of the United Nations called the report, quote, and I'm quoting, a code red for humanity, end quote, and said, quote, the alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable, end quote. Ms. Watkins, do you agree that addressing climate change is now a code red for humanity? Yes or no, please. Chairwoman Shell agrees that this is an urgent issue that needs addressing by companies, governments, and society. And, and it's not just the United Na Nations that called it a code red. Last week, the Defense Department issued a report calling climate change, quote, an existential threat to our nation and the world. Ms. Watkins, do you agree climate change is, an, is a threat to our existence? Chairwoman, I agree that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we have in the world today, which is why at Shell we're in action on providing lower and no carbon products to our customers. We believe this is something we're all in together. We need to work in collaboration with society, with governments, uh, with other companies and other industries. But do you agree that it's an existential threat? I yes or no? Yes. I, yes or no? I, I agree that this is a defining challenge for our, our generation, absolutely. Well, let me put it another way. Does anyone on the panel disagree with the statement from the United States and the Defense Department that climate change is an existential threat to our existence? Does anyone disagree? So uh, the truth is clear, climate change is real Burning fossil fuels is the primary cause of this crisis, and it is urgent that we fix it. This is the first time each of you has told Congress this and the companies that you represent, and it is significant and important. Thank you. But it's also true that if it weren't for the actions of the big oil companies, we might have taken action to fix this problem decades ago. Mr. Woods, I want to ask you about some public statements that your predecessor, Lee Raymond, made in 1996 and 97 as the world was debating an agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions known as the Kyoto Protocol. Here's what Mr. Raymond said in 1996, and I quote, currently the scientific evidence is inconclusive as to whether human activities are having a significant effect on the global climate, end quote. And I'd like to place his statement in the record without objection. And this was no slip of the tongue. In 1997, he gave another speech where he denounced the effects in Kyoto and said, quote, the case for global, global warming is far from airtight, end quote. Mr. Woods, when Exxon's CEO made these remarks about the inconclusive nature of the scientific evidence, were they consistent with the views of Exxon's own scientists? Uh, yes, Chairwoman, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to address that. Uh, our understanding of the science has been aligned uh, with the consensus of the scientific community as far back as 20, year, 20 years ago when you uh, referenced uh, our chairman at that time's uh, comments. And as science has evolved and developed, our understanding has evolved and developed, as has our work and position on the statement. Well, as you make your statement, I'm reminded of another hearing that we had with the tobacco industry. And we had all the executives seated in this room, and, and they were asked uh, about their statements from their companies that the science was uncertain. And they said they did not believe that nicotine was addictive. 
Well, it came out that they lied. Tobacco, nicotine was very addictive. And, and now I'm hearing from you that uh, the, the, the science that was reported publicly where your, your executives were denying climate change, we know that your scientists internally were saying that it's a reality. So I was hoping that, that you would not be like the tobacco industry was and lie about this. And I was hoping that you would be better than the tobacco industry and that you would have uh, come out with the truth and I'm disappointed with the statement that you made. James Black was an, was an Exxon scientist and I'd like to put up on the screen what he told the company's top executives in a secret briefing back in 1978, more than 40 years ago. And he said, and I quote, there is a general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels, end quote. And Mr. Black was not the only Exxon scientist to recognize that burning fossil fuels would cause dangerous climate change. In 1982, Roger Cohen, one of Exxon's most senior scientists, wrote a private letter to Exxon's management, and I'm putting it in the record. He said there was a, quote, scientific consensus about the impact of increased carbon dioxide on the climate. And, and there was, quote, unanimous, unanimous agreement in the scientific community end quote, that doubling carbon dioxide levels would lead to significant climate change. So I'm asking you, Mr. Woods, do you agree there is an inconsistency between what Mr. Raymond, the Exxon CEO, told the public and what Mr. Black and, and Mr. Cohen, both Exxon scientists, told top executives? Chairwoman, no, I do not agree that there was an inconsistency. If you look at the full extent of that report, you'll find that the comments in the report and that briefing to our management committee, which was not a secret meeting, uh, was, was entirely consistent with where their intergovernmental panel on climate change was and where the general uh, consensus of the scientific community. And I think our position in that has continued to evolve with the scientific community. I think our messaging has been that this is a complex problem that's been required thoughtful uh, practical solutions, and that has been something that we've continued to emphasize over time. Reclaiming, reclaiming my time, I think the quotes speak for themselves. I'm putting them in the record. There is a clear conflict between what Exxon CEO told the public and what Exxon scientists were warning privately for years. But you don't need to take my word for it. In 2019, two former Exxon scientists testified in this very hearing room. They were here where the tobacco ex executives were, and they testified before Representative Raskin's subcommittee. They said Mr. Raymond's statements were just plain wrong. One former Exxon scientist, Dr. Martin Hoffert, testified, and I quote, Exxon was publicly promoting views that its own scientists knew were wrong, and we know that because we were the major groups working on this, end quote. And the disinformation from Exxon did not end there. In 2000, in 2000, Exxon ran at an, an advertisement in the New York Times entitled Unsettled Science. And it said, and I quote, even less is known about the potential positive or negative impacts of climate change. In fact, many academic studies and field experiments have demonstrated that increased levels of carbon dioxide can promote crop and forest growth, end quote. So Mr. Woods, was this the statement that climate change could actually be positive for our planet, consistent with the private views of Exxon's scientist. Chairwoman, if you read the full uh, article that was advertised that you referenced there, it concludes with a statement that says we know enough now that uh, governments, people, and companies should be taking uh, reasonable action to address the risk of climate change. 
So again, I would come back and say that our position in this space has been consistent uh, with the general consensus in the scientific community. Our research was in line with that. It was a, it was a small thank, portion. Thank you so much. Reclaiming my, my time, the documents tell a different story. Uh, let me read you uh, an excerpt from a 1982 memo, which I'd like to place in the record, that M.B. Glasser, Exxon's manager of environmental affairs, sent to Exxon management about the potential impacts of climate change. And he wrote, there are some potentially catastrophic events that should be considered, end quote. He said those events could include melting ice caps and flooding along the East Coast, including in Florida and Washington. And another private memo from 1981 issued similar warnings. Mr. Cohen, a top Exxon scientist, wrote that it was distinctly possible that climate change would, quote, produce effects which will indeed be catastrophic, at least for a substantial fraction of the Earth's population, end quote. And that also unanimous consent to place in the record, Mr. Woods giving these grave warnings from Exxon's own scientists over and over and over again. Do you believe that it was ethical for Exxon to run a New York Times advertisement that downplayed, downplayed the risk and instead highlighted the potential positive impact of climate change? Chairman, I would again say, if you look at the full context of the memos that you're referencing, uh, the messaging that came across in that full, those full memos with, and, and is very consistent with what the general consensus of the scientific community was. And our, our uh, advertorial that you mentioned, again, concluded uh, that there's enough mm -hmm. knowledge to know that we should be taking action, that, that people, governments, and companies should respond and take practical, reasonable action. And we that was the consistent with what the scientific community was at the time. And as time has progressed, we continue to maintain a position that has evolved with science and is today consistent with the science. Our, our witnesses today would like uh, you to think that their actions that I have laid out and put in the record are ancient history. But they are not. Just this year, an Exxon senior lobbyist, Keith McCoy, was caught on a video boasting about these efforts, these efforts that deceived. Let's play that clip now, please. Did we aggressively fight against uh, Uh, some of the science, uh, yes. Uh, did we hide our science? Absolutely not. Uh, did we uh, did we join some of these shadow groups uh, to work against uh, some of the early efforts? Yes, that's true. Uh, but there's nothing there's nothing illegal about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were looking out for our investments. We were looking out for our, our in uh, uh, our. And, and and how did Re Exxon respond? Did they come clean about this shocking conduct? No, Mr. Woods called Mr. McCoy's comments inaccurate, and then they fired him. And they are obviously lying, like the tobacco executives were. So I want to ask each of the witnesses here today representing fossil fuel companies and trade associations to take a simple pledge. I want each of you to affirm that your organization will no longer spend any money, either directly or indirectly, to oppose efforts to reduce emissions and address climate change. Ms. Watkins, will you take that pledge on behalf of Shell? Chairwoman Maloney, we spend a lot of money in lobbying for climate policy right now, and I can pledge Will you to take that pledge, yes or no? Uh, if you just want to filibuster, I'll take it as a no. Yes or no, will you take that pledge that you will stop uh, spending money with dishonest? I, I, will, I will pledge that we will continue to spend our money on 
climate advocacy, climate policy advocacy, as we have for many years now. So in the interest of time, let me ask the rest of the industry representatives on this panel, do any of you refuse to take this pledge? If you refuse to take this pledge, will you please just raise your hand? Uh, Chairwoman Floney, um, what I would say is that uh, we have stopped all reputational advertising at BP. Well, but will you take the pledge? I know that you've taken steps in the right direction. I heard that in your testimony. Thank you. Will you take the pledge, yes or no? Well, for your specific pledge, what we're pledging to do is advocate for low-carbon policies that do, in fact, take the company and the world to net zero. That's the pledge I'm, I'm willing to commit to. Well, I'm asking uh, if you'll stop spending money, either directly or indirectly, to oppose efforts to reduce emissions and address climate change. Just stop spending money. Madam Chair. That's on lies. Time. Okay, I, I take that uh, you don't want to take the pledge. All right. I hope that. Uh, Madam Chair. I hope we're, that after. We're nearly I, two minutes over. Okay, may I just close for one second? <laughs> I hope that after 40 years of misleading the public to block climate action, our nation's oil and gas industry will finally change its behavior and join the many good corporate citizens, community leaders, scientists who are working together to save our planet and our children. I now yield to my good friend and colleague, Ranking Member Comer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Crabtree, thank you for appearing here before the committee today and to like to ask you what it's like to be a worker in this Biden economy. Uh, how long had Joe Biden been president before you were fired from your position working for the Keystone Pipeline? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for the question, but I think I made that clear in uh, my opening statement that it was three hours after I'd lost my job. Now, I've got to be truthful and I've got to be fair. Uh, I've got to work since then, but most of the work that we're doing now is uh, kind of maintaining the aging infrastructure of the pipeline systems that we have in this country now and like I said in my testimony not adding additional capacity when there's still such a great demand for it is causing um, is causing these fuel prices to rise and it, it, to me it's a serious national security issue uh, when we have to write letters to uh, OPEC asking for more oil uh, I it's couldn't, a serious I couldn't issue agree when more. we consider uh, it, drawing it, oil out of the strategic uh, petroleum reserve. The, the strategic right. petroleum uh, petroleum yeah. reserve wasn't put in place to uh, right. bail out. We, yeah, we, let, 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 let me say, we're going to talk a lot about that during this hearing, and I, I appreciate that. My next question, did, did President Biden or anyone from the White House ever apologize to you uh, for creating a situation where you lost your job immediately upon his taking office? Uh, well, of course not. I'm just a, a simple uh, welder. I, I wouldn't expect an apology. Uh, uh, it probably wouldn't have meant much to me. You know, apology isn't going to put food on my table. Apology doesn't pay my bills. Uh, being able to work uh, is what I need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, last week, President Biden said that uh, gas prices won't go down until 2022. And he said during his town hall when asked what he was going to do to reduce gas prices, he didn't have an answer on that. Uh, what, in your opinion, impact does shutting down one pipeline, in this case Keystone, have on energy prices? Well, I can give you a number. Uh, uh, number one is uh, transportation cost. Uh, this pipeline was going to replace uh, the transportation, this oil has already been coming to the country. We're using it, it's coming in by rail. And when you can build a pipeline, you can cut transportation costs by nearly a third. And uh, probably reduce you your know? carbon footprint at the same time, right? Exactly, this was a pipeline that was gonna run off of green energy. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, and number two is uh, market speculation. You know, uh, the country seeing uh, what was happening, uh, it, you know, the very first thing that President Biden done, and uh, uh, when you see an attack on the industry like that, you know, some of the prices uh, in the 
you know, on the markets or a lot of it's speculation. They see this attack on it and, uh, and uh, you get people buying up contracts because they're worried about not being able to have any. Uh, well, I, I tell you, I, I hate to see what's happened to you and so many other workers, union workers in America with the disastrous Biden energy policies. It's just been a terrible time in America to be a worker in this Biden economy. It's been a good time to be on welfare and someone who doesn't work or works from home, but a terrible time to be a worker. I want to shift gears and ask uh, quick questions to the oil and gas CEOs. I'm going to start with Mr. Woods, and we're going to try to run down these real quick because I'm going to yield to Kevin Brady momentarily. But Mr. Woods, how long have you been CEO of Exxon? Uh, since 2017. Mr. Woods, in your time as CEO, have you ever approved a climate disinformation campaign? I have not. Ms. Watkins, how long have you been president of Shell? For three years. Ms. Watkins, in your time as CEO, have you ever approved a disinformation campaign? No, I have not. Mr. Worth, how long have you been CEO of Chevron? For almost four years, Congressman. Mr. Worth, in your time as CEO, have you ever approved a disinformation campaign? I have never approved a disinformation campaign. Mr. Lawler, how long have you been CEO of BP America? About a year and a half. Mr. Lawler, in your time as CEO, have you ever approved a disinformation campaign? No, I have not. Well, thank you all for being here and answering my questions. We're going to have a lot of questions throughout the day. I look forward to working with the oil and gas industry to create more jobs here in America. Uh, I would now like to yield to the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, the ranking member on the Committee of Ways and Means. Thank you, Ranking Member Comer, for having me this morning to Chairwoman Maloney, and thank you to America's affordable energy leaders for joining us today. American-made energy boasts an enviable track record of hiring, training, promoting, and empowering all Americans. I've seen this firsthand, where our energy companies are providing good-paying jobs, quality health care, and secure retirement for workers from the lowest skills to the brightest researchers in the world, with remarkable opportunities for women, and people of color. The success of this industry isn't just important to my state of Texas, but important to the success of our nation, where we recognize good paying jobs and rising paychecks do so much more to lift Americans out of poverty than the promise of never ending government checks. Today's disappointing economic report points out why good paying energy jobs should be protected. Today's report was awful. And if you take out the inventories, America's growth last quarter was zero. The president is a disturbing zero for three in meeting quarterly projections for growth this year, even with expectations dumbed down in some cases by 80% or more. The president's best economic growth peaked last spring, and he remains nearly a million jobs short of his promises. He's making an alarming labor shortage worse for Main Street businesses and is demanding more government stimulus that will drive prices up higher and longer. Too many Americans have lost faith and the president now faces serious questions about his competency to heal our economy. Part of that is due to a relentless attack on American energy workers by the administration and this Democratic Congress. The taxation and regulatory attack that could kill over a million and a half good paying American energy jobs over time and drive prices even higher for struggling families and Main Street businesses. Ironically, for an administration that's made climate change a central focus, these attacks damage the very industry that holds the key to addressing greenhouse gas emissions around the world in a smart way that raises the standard of living here in America and in our poorer nations as friends. The solution of climate change isn't to drive energy prices up higher for everyone and kill off American energy jobs. That's flat earth thinking. The smart solution is to make affordable energy cleaner through technology, and then exporting American technology tax and tariff free to help the entire world solve our climate challenges. This industry has already proven it can increase production of American energy to meet our growing demand while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This industry continues to invest more in research, innovation, and technology to make affordable energy cleaner than any other industry. Instead of vilifying them and trying to end their existence, Congress should be working with them to accelerate this technology and clear the path for sharing it with the world. Renewables do play a big role in reducing emissions, but natural gas is the real bridge to the future. 
Since the major shift away from coal to natural gas, the U.S. has reduced carbon dioxide emissions by 32% more. Affordable energy is the way to lift Americans out of poverty. It's the key to ensuring the low and middle income Americans can grow and thrive. And instead of demonizing the very industry whose success has made our country independent and secure, instead of raising energy prices on those who can least afford it, let's empower America's innovators. Let's rebuild the momentum we made in unleashing LNG and crude oil exports and use that success to make America a leader in discovering new clean energy technology. There is a smart way to transition to a cleaner energy future, and it's time both political parties in Congress join forces with these energy leaders to achieve it. With that, Ranking Member Comer, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Garrett Graves from Louisiana, the Ranking Member on the Select Committee on Climate Crisis. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Comer, and I want to thank uh, uh, the Chair for allowing us to participate today. Um, I, I want to first um, just, just point out, uh, Madam Chair, that I, I'm going to take a guess that every single person that came to Washington this week, uh, that they came here using some form of fossil fuel. Uh, everybody. Uh, Madam Chair, I've got, I actually have two electric vehicles, and, uh, and I've actually rigged up a solar generator to charge them, uh, the most ridiculous and cost prohibitive thing I've ever seen in my life, but it's fun anyway. I'm from South Louisiana. If, if CLI's projections are correct, then, then we are absolutely ground zero, ground zero for what's going to happen moving forward. We have some of the fastest subsidence rates in the world, so with sea rise, it means the fastest relative sea rise in the world. We also are home to some of the uh, uh, most robust oil and gas production in, in North America. And these, uh, at the same time, we have one of the most productive ecosystems on the North American continent, right there where all this energy production is occurring. Madam Chair, I also want you to know that uh, when the Deepwater Horizon accident happened, I ended up being the lead trustee and the negotiator for the state of Louisiana. And in that settlement, I'll tell you, we reached the largest settlement in U.S. history from a single company, and I'm proud of that because you know what? There, there were actions that were wrong, and we held them accountable. I want to ask the witnesses a question. If, if we stopped, uh, maybe Mr. Summers, if we stopped producing energy today, stopped producing oil and gas in the United States, yes or no, would there be a, 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 a stoppage or would folks cease to use oil and gas domestic, excuse me, across the world? Yes or no? Uh, no, Congressman. In no. fact, as you know, the, the world consumes about 100 million barrels of oil every single day. And even during the worst part of the pandemic, the world was still consuming about 81 million barrels of oil every single day. So the world's going to continue to consume a lot of oil and natural gas from now into uh, very long into the future. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back, and I apologize. I was, I was in and out because we had another hearing going on. I believe it was Shell, but I may be mistaken, uh, that noted in their testimony that the most efficient energy production in terms of emissions on the globe uh, some of the most efficient on the globe is, uh, is actually in the offshore Gulf of Mexico. Could, could one of you confirm that, whoever noted it in your opening testimony, make sure I heard that correctly? Yes, Congressman. Hi, it's me, Gretchen Watkins from Shell. That Great. is a fact. Uh, we're, the, we're the largest operator uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and we're really proud that the oil and gas that we provide to the country from the U.S. Gulf of Mexico is the lowest greenhouse gas um, that we can that we can so, so, so yeah. putting these two things together if there's clearly going to be continued demand for energy because there will because oil and gas has 30 times the energy density of the next closest renewable 30 times so so there's going to continue to be demand we produce it most efficiently in the United States why would we stop everybody in this committee used it to get to work this week everybody did you know, something else that's really interesting is we sit here and demonize the United States and these very people that are here today uh, uh, on the witness panel. The United States has led the world. We've reduced emissions more than the next 12 emissions-reducing countries combined. I'm going to paraphrase a quote of the executive director of the International uh, uh, Energy Administration who said, the United States' progress on reducing emissions associated with energy is the most historic in world history. Madam Chair, these people on the panel, these are the people that did that. Mr. Summers, could you tell me 
what primary source of energy resulted in this decrease in emissions? It was but, natural gas. Kind thank of you very much. So natural gas, the very thing that we're talking about banning here. Madam Chair, I would like to um, read you uh, a quote from a letter. Quote, today we call on you to use all your authority to take time, timely action to pressure OPEC and cooperating countries to increase world oil, su oil supplies. Okay? I'll say it again. Asking OPEC to increase world oil supplies. You know which awful Republican members of Congress or people ask for this? That would be Maria Cantwell, uh, Senator Menendez, Senator Schumer, and Senator Markey. Quote, May 18, 2018. Madam Chair, we, and I'd like to ask that this be included in the record. Madam Chair, Without more, objection. Re more recently, on August 12th of this year, a number of Democrat members of Congress effectively asked the same thing. And as I heard noted earlier today, um, uh, Jake Sullivan, as well as other White House officials, asked OPEC to increase oil production. If we, if we produce it most efficiently, what are we doing by stopping it? What, why? It, 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 it clearly, we're going to see a 60% increase in global demand for energy. A 60% increase. So, so the strategy right now, by throwing out all uh, conventional energy production, Okay, so we're going to move to solar. Guess who makes 90% of the solar panels? It's China. Guess who has 80% roughly of the rare earth and critical minerals in the world cornered? It's China. And by the way, they use slave and child labor to, to, to produce that. It simply doesn't make sense. These are the innovators. We've watched our own president, Madam Chair, shut down Keystone Pipeline, open up Nord Stream 2 Pipeline, shut down domestic energy production, ask Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, Nigeria, and others to produce more energy to address the growing demand in the United States and globally. I'm just asking our own president, treat the United States like you're treating other countries. Last, Madam Chair, U.S. natural gas as a result of the efficiency of these very people we have a 42 to 47 percent lower emissions profile, lower emissions profile than, than Russian gas being delivered to Europe or Asia. This is part of the solution as we move forward, meeting this growing energy demand with solar, with wind, with wave, with geothermal, with nuclear, with, other, uh, with oil and gas and other efficient energy streams. It's against our interest to shut these things down. We need to be focused on the innovation, carbon capture storage, carbon capture utilization, and other complementary strategies to meet this growing demand. When the Clinton administration stopped producing energy domestically, barrel for barrel, we imported more from Russia. It's a failed strategy that's not in the best interest of the United States. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Comer, do you yield back? Yield back. Okay. I now recognize Mr. Khanna, who is the Chairman of the Subcommittee on the Environment, for 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, let me thank the witnesses for appearing today uh, voluntar <coughs> voluntarily. I don't have any interest in being adversarial. I actually want to see if we can get some positive commitments. Let me start out uh, where I think we'll agree. Uh, Mr. Woods, what's impressive is that in 1977, Exxon had a report that said, quote, there is general scientific agreement that most likely, uh, the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate change is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. Mr. Woods, I assume you'd agree with that Exxon conclusion, yes? That our work was consistent with what the scientific community was saying at yes. the time, yes. And in your role as CEO, uh, as you told Representative Comer, you would never today endorse statements that blatantly contradict climate science, correct? Correct. And so if an organization, for example, today were to say they do not believe in the linkage between fossil fuels and warming, I, use, I assume you would say that's false, correct? I wouldn't support that statement. You would say it's false? Uh, and, I, I bet, and looking at the full context of the statement, I'd make a judgment on that, but that's... I mean, you would, you would say it's false that there's no linkage between fossil fuels and warming, correct? I mean... Com the combustion of fossil fuels leads to emissions, which is linked to climate change, yes. Okay. And I assume you know that your former Exxon CEO, Lee Raymond, made exactly that statement in 2002, uh, nearly 25 years after Exxon's report. He said, quote, uh, there, he does not believe, quote, that the science establishes the linkage between fossil fuels and warming. Now, I'm glad you admitted that that statement is false, and I really don't want to dwell on the past. But in sp the spirit of giving you the chance to turn the page for the company, 
I assume you would acknowledge that Mr. Raymond's statement was a mistake and the company regrets it, correct? I think Mr. Raymond's statement was consistent with the science at the I, time. I, I don't even want to argue that, Mr. Mr. Woods. I don't even want to argue that. We could go back and forth. I just, you, you said it's a false statement. You know, when I make a statement that's wrong, when most people make a statement that's wrong, they say, okay, it's a mistake, we regret it. I'm just asking you for that. You, I assume now that it's a false statement that the company regrets making it and would acknowledge that, right? I think the expectation would be that we'd, we'd look at that at the time it was said and years ago but, that was But forget, forget whether it was consistent or not. Can you just acknowledge that it was a mistake to make? If, if someone makes a mistake, just say it was a mistake and, and you regret that that statement was out there. Would you say that? If, I, I don't think it's fair to judge something 25 years ago with what we've learned since that well, time. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're not even willing to say that something is a mistake. Doesn't inspire a lot of confidence about you know, introspection and going forward. I'm surprised, actually. I thought you would just say it's a mistake. It's not asking you much to say, hey, it's a mistake that I, someone's put that out. Anyway, let me move on. The United Nations 2021 Production Gap Report says, to be consistent with a 1.5 degree pathway, uh, oil and gas production would have to decline annually by 4% and 3% respectively. The IEA's 2021 Net Zero Roadmap calls for no new oil and gas developments. Mr. Lawler, BP has said that it supports economy-wide net zero greenhouse gas emission targets by 2050. You made a strong commitment, actually, to reduce oil and gas production by 40% by 2030. I assume you're doing this because you think it is important and part of the solution to the climate crisis. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, uh, Mr. Kano. What, what uh, BP has aligned its strategy on is in accordance with the Paris, Paris Agreement. We have a new strategy just two years ago, just before COVID started, we put this new strategy into place. Right. I, I don't want to cut you off. I just, we have limited time. And so you believe that the oil and gas production must decline each year? Is that partly why you're doing this? We think that's the best decision for BP, right. and that's our and contribution. And Ms. Watkins, uh, Shell's energy transition strategy says we have set our net zero target, so it's fully consistent with this Paris Agreement. And you today actually announced uh, this new thing where you're going to be uh, having a, a 50 percent uh, reduction on uh, scope one and two. Uh, and you are also committed to a one to two percent year in total oil production decline. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh Great, and I assume you're doing the, that because you also believe under the Paris agreements that it's important and that we need to have uh, oil and gas production declining every year? Congressman, what we do believe is that um, hydrocarbon demand um, needs to reduce if we're going to get to net zero by 2050, which is why we're also providing more and more low and no carbon. Uh, right, but you're committed to this 1% to 2% reduction every year, right? I mean, that's your, your policy, correct? It, it is, and... And, and it, let me just turn down to Mr. Worth. Chevron announced, unlike BP and Shell, that earlier this year that you plan to increase by 3.5% on a compound basis your production. Is that correct, Mr. Worth? Congressman, our forward guidance uh, would uh, show that we will grow lower carbon production of... I, I'm just asking, are you going to be increasing your oil and gas production by 3.5% on an annual basis? Uh, Chairman, we will uh, increase our oil and gas production and reduce the carbon. Okay, so you're going to be increasing the production. Time. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Woods, you have said that you want to keep the oil and gas production flat. Is that correct? Or the plastic? We're focused on uh, meeting the needs of society and I, whatever that needs. I don't need the supply. American apple pie suite. Just, I just, it's a factual question. You're going to keep it flat, right? So I, I just get it. It's a 40% reduction BP, 1% to 2% annual shell. The Europeans, the American companies, Chevron's increasing, Exxon is increasing. Mr. Lawler, BP has said it's a... Will the gentleman the yield for question? Uh, no, uh, not right now. Mr. BP has said that it supports economy-wide net zero greenhouse gas emissions. BP, uh, clearly you're only one member, so I assume when you're saying economy-wide, you believe other companies need to follow your lead in decreasing production. Would, you, would that be fair, Mr. Lawler? Who's going next for us? Yes, sir. I think we would offer it up as just a, a suggestion. You know, there's many approaches to net zero, um, but, and we certainly wouldn't. But you would believe that other, other companies, I guess my question is this, Ms., Mr. Lawler, do you believe that the science says that other companies should go down every year? 
Well, I think what we would agree with is the IPC report, the scientific consensus that action needs to be taken to lower emissions is real, it's significant, and BP is in action on right. that. Let me just ask example, a yes or no question on this, Mr. Worth. Uh, are you embarrassed as an American company that your production is going up while the European counterparts are going down? Congressman, as we have already heard, uh, demand for energy is going up in the world. Okay, We're so you're not embarrassed. Producer. And do you commit to do anything? I'm just asking an open question. It's not, not a gotcha question. Do you commit to do anything to matching your European count counterparts to try to bring the de de actual demand of oil production down? Uh, Congressman, with all due respect, I'm very proud of our company and what we do. I'm proud of the companies in so, this industry. So, no, you won't, you won't reduce the solution. You won't. And Mr. Woods, would you commit? to matching your European counterparts to, to reducing uh, de, uh, the production of oil like both Shell and BP are doing? We're committing to lowering our emissions. No, are you committed to lowering the, the production, as Paris Accords say, or no? I, I, it's The issue, uh, Mr. It's Chairman. It's a yes or no. You could say, you could explain why you're not, but are you, are you committing, could you commit to lowering production or not? We're going to lower emissions, which is the okay, source I'll of the take that as a no. trying to address. Let me move to a new point. Uh, Ms. Watkins, you, you know, so far you seem like the, the star here. I mean, the, uh, do you agree that IEA, that the electric vehicles are vital to decarbonization? I, I assume you do because you said the rise of electric vehicles is vital to decarbonizing road transport? Yes, we believe that to be Great. the case. Great. Mr. Lawler, I assume you agree with this because you say energy use in road transport is uh, key. Uh, it, it needs to be dominated by electrification. Yes, sir. We believe that uh, EVs are Great. significant. Yes, both of your companies, along with Exxon and Shell, support the American Petroleum Institute. And Mr. Summers, you're here. You sit, you're the head of API, and you said, quote, uh, the government efforts to promote electric vehicles would leave everyday drivers high and dry, unfairly burden non-EV drivers, and be costly for taxpayers and consumers. In fact, you've been participating in, quote, state-by-state multimillion-dollar battles to squelch utilities plans to build charging stations across the country. Mr. Ms. Watkins, on this panel with you is Mr. Summers, the head of API. Will you take the opportunity today to tell him that his opposition to electric vehicles is wrong and that instead of opposing tax credits for electric vehicles, he should support them? Chairman Kano, we're a member of the API for a number of reasons. And, uh, I, yeah, uh, I know, and I respect that. Can you just tell him to stop the electric vehicle advertising? You, you'll, if you say that today, he'll stop. You give him $10 million a year. We have a number of conversations, of course, ongoing conversations. Could you just tell him that today? Just tell him, please stop the electric vehicle advertising. It'll, it'll help us in Congress. Just tell him to stop. So I, I'd like to speak on behalf of Shell. With, and here at Shell, we very much believe electric vehicles are part of the future, which is if, why we If you would tell him to stop, it would be really helpful. The other, you know, help the president. He's really trying to do what you're asking the president to do. The other thing is, I saw your positive statement today. I was really happy. You said you're for a well-crafted methane fee. You know who's been advertising against the methane fee? API. API, half a million dollars in the last three months of Facebook advertising alone against the president's agenda on the methane fee that you supported this morning in your great statement. You added it. Your staff crafted a statement. You said, no, we want to have well-crafted methane. Can you please, please tell API to stop the advertising on the methane fee, against the methane fee? There are several places where we are not fully aligned with the API. We've been Please just tell them to stop. Mr. Those. Lawler, anyone, will you tell them to stop? Mr. Lawler, will you, you tell them to stop the advertising? Yeah, Mr. Connor, we have been in active communications with uh, API now uh, from the time I joined. And He's sitting right next to you on the virtual screen. Just say stop. You know, just speaks plainly. Say stop the advertising against electric vehicles. Stop the advertising against uh, methane. Well, I speak for BP, Mr. Khanna, and, and we've been supportive of the, the, uh, the green climate let portions. Me, of let the... me ask you this. I, I assume, Mr. Woods, Mr. Worth, this is your chance to redeem yourself. Will you tell them to stop API if you're not doing the production stuff? Can you tell API to stop that advertising, either of you? Chairman Khanna, we engage in uh, discussions on many policy issues at API. There's a diverse set of members, as Mr. Summers said, over 600 members in this association. You, you won't tell them to stop? The members agree, don't always agree on everything. Let me ask you this. Total, as you know, they, they pulled their uh, commitment to, to API because they said they can't be part of an organization that is engaged in against the flight for climate change. Will each of you commit 
to leaving API if they continue to lobby against electric vehicles? Will any of you commit to leaving them if they're lobbying against electric vehicles? You know what, so here's what's so frustrating, because I actually think, I don't think, I really don't think you're as bad as the CEOs of the past. I don't. I, I, I think you, you have tough jobs, you got there, you got a horrible record on stuff, you're figuring out how you don't get into litigation trouble while really trying to tell the truth. It's a tough act. I mean, I don't envy you. And I don't believe you purposely want to be out there spreading climate disinformation. But you're funding these groups. And they're really having an impact. You know, they're, they're, they're spending millions of dollars in Congress to kill electric vehicles. And they're spending millions of dollars against the, 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 the methane gas. And you could do something here. You could tell them to knock it off for the sake of the planet. You could end it. You could end that lobbying. Would any of you take the opportunity to look at API and say, stop it? Any of you? Will you commit to, could you commit, any of you? Would, Ms. Watkins, come on. I mean, will you do something here? Will you, would you commit to saying you're not going to fund any group that's going to engage in climate disinformation, at least? Chairman Kana, what I'll commit to is continuing to be an active member of the API. And we discuss many issues in the API, some of which have to do with climate policy. And I'm really pleased that, the, let, that we've Let me we've ask moved. this. Uh, would okay. any of you commit to having an independent audit to verify that you're not funding, that none of your funds are going for climate denial? OK, let me ask this. All of you, raise your hand if you think the climate crisis is one of the most important crises that humanity faces. Just raise your hand. I think all of you do. It's important? Yes, it's right. And. You know, I understand you fund things for a lot of reasons. You're the CEOs. You can't track all the details. But if your money is going to organizations that are against the fundamental values that you claim you stand for, don't you think you have some obligation to monitor where the money is going and to make some commitment today to the American people? Right now, your position to the American people this is not gotcha. This is like actually trying to understand where you said. You're saying, we're just going to spend... We'll have conversation. If they want to do false advertising, fine. We, we, we'll, we'll talk to them behind the scenes. Are any of you today prepared to make any statement saying we're going to take accountability on something so important and stop funding groups that are actively engaged in any form of climate disinformation? I'll give all of you the last word, uh, so my time is up. Any form of commitment in any way, even with a bunch of weasel words, would be great. Please go. Everyone will have a chance to answer. Chairman Khanna, I'll start by saying that we have been issuing for the last several years trade association reports where we very clearly lay out with a great deal of transparency where we are aligned and where we are somewhat misaligned with trade associations. In fact, we left the trade association because we were so misaligned that we didn't see a way of getting back in alignment. We've been transparent about that, and I will commit to you today that we will continue to drive increased increased scrutiny on a number of areas around climate policy in that arena. Mr. Lawler? Uh, yes, sir. So BP has 7,000 charge master stations in the UK on their way to 70,000 charging stations by the end of the decade. We're very much for um, EV use. We advocate that with an API and other organizations, and we will continue to do that, sir. Mr. Ward? Madam Chair, it's time's I just, I just if they can ask if the two Mr. Worth and Mr. Woods could just answer, and I'm not going to ask anything more. They went over a couple minutes. Okay. Mr. Worth or Mr. Woods, do you have anything? Chairman Connor, we very quickly. Uh, we engage with a number of organizations, uh, and uh, we don't control and may not always agree with the positions taken or statements made by industry groups and other organizations. Uh, we engage in, uh, in constructive dialogue. What I can tell you is that our position is that climate change is real, the use of fossil fuels contributes to it, and we're committed to helping advance a lower carbon future. We, we make our positions very clear going into the trade associations, associations, and then we work with them to try to advance those positions uh, consistent with the broader view of the membership that uh, the, uh, each of the organizations serves. And I would point out the API has evolved the climate position and supports carbon tax along with another, a number of other uh, constructive climate policies. Okay. You're back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I now recognize for an equivalent 
amount of time. Mr. Norman, who is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Environment, uh, for an equivalent amount of time. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Maloney. Um, for my questions, uh, I'd like to yield to Jim Jordan. Oh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. The, the, the previous speaker t used the word frustrating. I'll tell you what's frustrating is a member of Congress telling American oil and gas companies to reduce production at the same time the President of the United States is begging OPEC to increase production. That may be the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but that's the scenario we're in. God bless Chevron saying they're going to increase production. What, what does the gentleman want? $8 gasoline? $10 gasoline for the very families that we all represent? That, this is craziness what they're talking about. I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you for yielding me 30 seconds. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Summers, did you realize back uh, several months ago at an oversight hearing, I asked Ms. Greta Thurn Thurnberg, who is a spokesman, um, you know, for the, for the Green New Deal and, and, and other issues the Democrats have, she has 17.9 7 million followers. I asked her, um, with China and India, how are we going to get them to cut their emissions when, that, when, when, when they're the leaders in the world and America has come down on, on emissions? Do uh, you realize she said they were going to ask them to? Is this a proper response, in your opinion? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Um, as you know, the United States accounts for about 12.6 percent of world emissions. And our emissions continue to go down year on year. China's emissions account for about 32.6, 32.6% of world emissions, and their emissions continue to go up. The key point is that yes, climate change is real, and that we need to step up to the plate and do what we can to address the climate challenge. But at the same time, this is a global challenge. This isn't a challenge that can be taken on just by one company by, or by one country. We need a global solution to the climate challenge. But this industry has not waited for uh, others to step up to the plate to deal with that challenge. In fact, earlier this year, the American Petroleum Institute put forward a very forward-looking position on climate change in API's climate action framework. And the interesting thing about that framework, Congressman, is that it's not just about what we're asking the government to do, but what the industry is committing to do to reduce climate change over time. And we're proud of that forward-looking agenda. But as you point out, this is a global challenge, and the world's going to continue to demand oil and gas for the future. The question I think lawmakers have to answer is whether the world's going to get that oil and gas from the United States, where it is produced cleaner, better, and safer, or whether they're going to get that oil and gas from countries that are hostile to American interests. I think the answer is clear from our perspective. And this administration is content to get, get our, our, our natural gas and oil, as Mr. Jordan said, and, and paying ungodly amounts in the future if we can get gas from countries that don't like us. Does that make sense to you? Congressman, thank you again for your question. Just, just I mean, does that make sense? No, sir. No, and nor does Greta Thurn Thurnberg's answer, which is, was a Pollyannish answer, saying, yes, we will ask them to be nice, uh, it does not make sense. Uh, Mr. Summers, isn't it true that most of the raw materials and manufacturing capacity for renewables necessary to execute uh, Biden's zero emissions goal comes from China? That is the case, Congressman. And does China's ability to manufacture renewables ch cheaply have anything to do with the fact that their factories are powered by oil and gas, or that their economy runs on 84 percent fossil fuels? Congressman, uh, the Chinese economy continues to expand not just uh, uh, oil and gas infrastructure, but in fact, based on the data that we've seen, China is adding a coal plant a week. Uh, their emissions continue to go up while American emissions continue to go down, mainly because the United States has made a fuel switch from coal as the primary source of power to natural gas. And that is because natural gas prices have gone, gotten lower as a consequence of the technological and innovative revolution that occurred in this country over the course of the last decade. We're able to find more of this energy here at home 
And as a consequence of that, we've been actually able to reduce emissions while even while our production is going up. In fact, no country, no country uh, in the world has reduced emissions more than the United States. And it's because of the American oil and gas industry. And China is not being held to the same uh, emission standards that we are. Yet the Biden administration and the questions you've had don't even address this. They are content to buy from countries that don't like us and let Americans suffer as they pay for not just gas, but every other uh, commodity that they're trying to buy now. Um, I now yield to uh, Congressman Fox, Congresswoman Fox. Uh, thank you very much um, for yielding. Uh, the title of this hearing suggests that, quote, big oil, end quote, is running a disinformation campaign designed to prevent action on the climate. However, it's clear that this hearing is part of a Democrat-led disinformation campaign to distract from the Biden administration's failed policies that are hurting average Americans. The Biden administration has injected instability into the energy sector by canceling the Keystone XL pipeline and discouraging domestic exploration and new development. Then once gas prices predictably started rising, President Biden even turned to our competitors, as, uh, as already been noted, at OPEC and asked them to bail him out. As of this morning, $3.39 per gallon gas is the average price of gas in America, which is the highest since the Obama-Biden administration. Do we see a pattern here? This hurts families in my district and across the nation who now have to decide which items on their grocery list they cannot buy and what trips they can no longer afford to take. Today's hearing is meant to distract from this harsh reality facing families and shift blame from the Biden administration's failed policies to the private sector. And since the Democrats aren't interested in asking about this, I want to take a moment to ask um, Mr. Woods, Ms. Watkins, Mr. Worth, Mr. Lawler, um, to tell us what your companies are doing to transition to lower carbon energy. Well, thank you for the, the question, Congresswoman. It's an important one, and one that we've been focused on for quite some time is striking the balance of continuing to meet the growing demand for energy while reducing emissions. Uh, natural gas has been pointed out as one step towards re replacing higher emission fuel systems. We are also working on reducing our own emissions at our plant. And from 2016 to 2020, as I've mentioned, uh, we've reduced by 11% and have plans for more aggressive uh, reductions going okay. forward. On the other witnesses, on I'm going to have to ask you to cut it real short because I only have about two minutes left. So the others, can you give me real short answers? Congresswoman, thank you for the question. Um, at Shell, we believe climate change is a, is a real challenge that's facing the world. Um, we plan to continue to play a role in that, um, both by continuing to produce uh, low, low greenhouse gas um, hydrocarbons here in the U.S., but over time, those will go down and uh, increasing, hopefully, okay. the demand from our customers um, in collaboration with governments for low and no carbon fuels like um, electricity uh, generated by solar or wind or like hydrogen. Um, and so we're very much in action on um, both setting targets for ourselves, but also working with our customers, working with society in order okay. to accelerate. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Congressman, our strategy is simple. Uh, be a leader in low carbon production of traditional energy that the world needs today while growing lower carbon businesses. And we're doing this in three ways. First, we're taking steps toward net zero by 2050 for upstream scope one and two emissions. Second, we're taking steps to address scope three emissions by growing lower carbon business lines and establishing a new metric for the full value chain of our business. And third, we've committed to invest more than $10 billion on lower carbon and carbon reduction projects. Thank you. Unfortunately, Mr. Lawler, I have run out of, almost run out of time, and I need to uh, ask a question to Mr. Summers. So I wonder if you could submit your answer in writing. Mr. Yeah, Summers, please. despite some of the rhetoric from your critics, it's clear from the things you've said and others have said that meaningful steps to reduce emissions from operations have already been done. Could you describe any other effort in about 30 seconds that are underway in some of the planned industry initiatives that haven't been mentioned. Congresswoman, thank you, uh, and great to be with you today. First of all, the API Climate Action Framework, which can be found at api.gov 
org slash climate uh, is our forward leaning agenda to address the challenge of, of climate change. In addition to that, since 2017, the American Petroleum Institute has had a program called the Environmental Partnership which is all about how we reduce methane emissions within our own operations. This program has had measurable success and we're continuing to reduce methane operations uh, within the oil and gas industry. We're Thank proud of all of that work uh, and we, we look forward to expanding that work over time. Thank you, Mr. Summers. I yield back uh, to the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fox. I now yield five minutes to Congressman Heiss. I appreciate the gentleman um, for yielding, and I want to thank Chairwoman Maloney for giving this committee yet another opportunity, another platform to highlight the horrible, miserable, failed policies of the Biden administration and the Democratic Party as a whole, and for also allowing this time yet again to exhibit the dereliction of duty of this committee to perform real oversight on pressing issues like the southern border, like global supply chain issues, <clears throat> and like the horrible withdrawal in Afghanistan. And yet to this day, the hundreds of Americans who right now are left in Afghanistan while we're having hearings like this to supposedly investigate a misinformation campaign by the oil and gas companies. But let's talk about real misinformation. As it relates to climate change, Democrats and their friends in the media have morphed what is considered a worst-case climate scenario into what today is considered a most likely and sure to happen tomorrow kind of scenario. And it's all about the purposes of justifying an array of liberal socialist wish, wish list priorities such as the Green New Deal. Unfortunately, de Democrats have shamelessly scared and frightened an entire generation of children into fearing that the entire end of the world is just upon us. One of our colleagues said we only have 11 years left to save the planet. Are you kidding me? shamelessly creating fear in society and a, a whole new generation. And yet the Green New Deal, which the, uh, our a colleague from New York, her own chief of staff admitted that the Green New Deal was not even about the environment. That it was more of a how do you change the entire economy kind of thing. It promises family sustainable wages. It promises medical and family leave, paid vacation, retirement security. It says nothing about the environment as a whole. Democrats have become masters of accusing others of the very thing they themselves are guilty of. And in this case, misinformation. It's misinformation meant to scare the public and ignore realities, realities like the truth that the United States has been reducing carbon emissions while China's emissions have been going through the roof. China now produces twice the carbon emissions as the United States and a quarter of all of greenhouse gas emissions globally. China, here's a country who detests freedom, detests democracy, detests human rights. They would love nothing more than for the United States to be crippled in our economy through these rosy-sounding, nevertheless horrible policies being presented and crammed down the throats of the American people by the Democratic Party. And what has the Biden administration done about it all? Well, ask Mr. Crabtree today and 11,000 others who have lost their jobs because of the horrible policy decisions of this administration. And by the way, union jobs, good paying union jobs, which our Democrats love to crow about, and yet now these individuals have lost their jobs. The Biden administration had no problem killing the Keystone Pipeline, but at the same time, no problem willing to establish Nord Stream 2. So here we go. Let's give Putin and the Russians everything they need, including economic and political leverage over Europe. What kind of Russian collusion was involved in that kind of deal, I wonder? Yet the Biden administration cannot escape the fact that the U.S. economy still relies on oil and gas for basic necessities 
And yet their plan is, let's decrease our own energy independence while increasing reliance upon some of the world's most unstable countries. And yet now these companies that we're talking to today who are being villainized are at the same time being begged by the Biden administration to help uh, the reducing energy prices. The hypocrisy is insane. My time has expired, and with that, I'll yield back to the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you. Our time's expired. Uh, Mr. Mr. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Maloney, Chairwoman Maloney, for this important hearing uh, with fossil fuel companies. There's ample, ample evidence that the fossil fuel industry <coughs> has worked to deceive the public and sow doubt about climate science, and that's been going on for decades. But the tactics they are employing are not new. They are a mirror image of tactics used by tobacco companies decades ago. In 2019, Sharon Eubanks, a former Justice Department prosecutor, testified before this committee's Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Subcommittee that similar to big tobacco, oil companies have quoted, here I'm quoting, denied that there was a consensus, and at the same time, their internal documents show they knew there was a consensus. Mr. Woods, are you familiar with, the, with a scientist by the name of Frederick Seitz, yes or no? No. All right, Dr. Seitz was a prominent scientist, even heading the National Academy of Science in the 1960s, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists in the 1990s and 2000s, Dr. Seitz advised a number of Exxon Mobil funded groups on scientific research. At the same time, he published several articles questioning science, uh, climate science, including a 1995 Wall Street Journal piece arguing against a report issued by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1998, he led, he led a petition calling for the United States to leave the Kyoto Protocol. Dr. Seitz claimed in a letter with the petition that, and here again I'm quoting, increased atmospheric carbon dioxide is environmentally helpful. Dr. Uh, Mr. Woods, were you aware that before he began publicly <coughs> questioning climate giants, Dr. Seitz had a role advising tobacco companies <coughs> on their medical research? No, I'm not familiar with Dr. Seitz, so I'm, I'm not, I don't have any of that context. In the 1970s and 80s, Dr. Seitz advised the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, helping oversee millions of dollars in research funding. He later explained that the tobacco companies, quote, didn't want us looking at the health effects of climate smoke, of cigarette smoking. Big oil tries to distinguish itself from big tobacco, but the fact is the disinformation campaign used for decades by the fossil fuel industry mirrors big tobacco itself in its playbook. In inject uncertainty into the public discourse, undermine the science, all while continuing to rake in economic benefits. Ultimately, the tobacco industry was held accountable for its deception, but big oil has so far escaped accountability for its longstanding climate denial. And I hope that tide will begin to turn today just as it did with big tobacco executives. I thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, is recognized for five minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And first of all, to, to the witnesses, the, the leaders of, of Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, I know that the climate activists in Twitter world, which Dave Chappelle says doesn't exist, and he's right because it's just people who have nothing better to do but type on their keyboards, and we do it too here in Congress. But let's be very clear, I, you need an apology because what I witnessed today um, was just rank intimidation by the chair of this committee. F trying to get you to pledge on what you're going to spend your money on is a gross violation of the First Amendment. And just because we're members of Congress and we got microphones and we pass laws does not mean that we also have the, the ability to infringe on your ability to, what, to organize, whether it's API or anybody else, or what you choose to spend your money on. It is disgusting. It is absolutely disgusting. Somebody needs to go call Merrick Garland, tell him to get in here and watch the intimidation that came from this very panel today. Because this is not about defending big oil or defending big anything. It's about defending the ability of people in our country to be free, say what they want, think what they want, spend their money how they choose. And if we're not going to be any better than the Chinese, how do we ever expect to beat them on the world stage when we're cutting our neck when it comes to energy production, while they are burning more coal, they are burning more oil, they're increasing their emissions, and they're not showing up in Scotland. You know why they're not showing up in Scotland? Because they're interested in building an economy. They're interested in becoming the dominant economic player across the globe. They're interested in becoming the dominant military player across the globe. And while we joke around and mess around intimidating you guys who frankly heat our homes, you cool our fridges, you keep our cars going, this is insane. So I'm sorry for you. And I'm sorry for the people in our country who have to witness shenanigans like this and witness circuses like this. That's why they call that one show on HBO, whatever it is, The Circus, because that's exactly what this is. Madam Chair, I'm requesting that a letter be entered into the record. This is a letter written by Ranking Member Comer and the other ranking members on this committee that actually speaks to the chilling effect that has come from you, Madam Chair, asking you to stop intimidating companies, requesting information that is their First Amendment right to have that information. I ask that that be admitted into the record under unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Mr. Summers, now that we're done with that. Mr. Summers, it was asked, it was asked earlier um, by a lot of the executives if they believe in electronic vehicles. Um, and it's a noble goal to have. But Mr. Summers, where does energy, the energy that, where does electricity production actually come from? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, before I address that question, I do want to clear one thing up, that a difference of views on electric vehicles is not climate disinformation. We as an organization support all forms of energy. We support the rapid uh, uh, advancement of electronic vehicles as well. But at the same time, what we don't agree with is that the federal government should be the ones that are funding that build out of infrastructure. The concern is, is that as we built out service stations across the country, those service stations have been developed not by the federal government, but by private industry. And members on this panel themselves are investing in building out that infrastructure as is appropriate for the private sector. So real quick, Second of all, I think your question is very, very important, which is where does that energy come from? Most of the energy in the United States comes from natural gas. It has replaced coal as the primary source of energy in this country. Let me ask you this question as a follow-up. So if we don't have natural gas, and obviously the Democrats are against coal, where would we actually get the electricity to power all of these electric cars? Where would it come from? Well, Congressman, for most countries and for certainly the United States, the energy, there would, there would be likely a fuel switch back from natural gas to coal. Uh, and so because, real quick, Mr. Summers, and I don't mean to cut you off because you make a great point, but I got 30 seconds. It is important for the American people to understand that if you follow the idiocy that's in the bipartisan infrastructure agreement, which is gonna make natural gas harder to procure, we're actually not gonna have lower emissions, we're gonna have higher, because you're gonna to have to switch back to coal fire plants. And just for the record, let's also say, the world will always demand energy. If you're not getting it from us, 
where we actually do it more safely and more cleanly. You'll get it from Russia. You will get it from China. And they don't care what the climate activists have to say on Twitter. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, is now recognized. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the witnesses for being here today. I think the question before us is how do we transition the world to a zero carbon economy as cheaply and as easily as possible? And most all the witnesses seem to be in favor of market-based solutions to this problem, uh, including a price on carbon. So I'd like each of the witnesses to answer uh, what is the right price of carbon Mr. Lawler, Mr. Woods, Mr. Worth. Uh, yes, sir. So, you know, BP has been a, an advocate of economy-wide, market-based uh, price on carbon for many, many yeah. years. I'd like the that? specific number, please, and I don't have much time. So please tell me the price for carbon that you would yes, support. Sir. So, so I, I don't have a specific price today to answer your question, but we do think it's the most efficient way Mr. to Mr. Woods. Mr. Congressman, it's a very important question. Depends on the uh, where you're trying to decarbonize at. We have proposed a very large scale carbon reduction uh, project in the Houston uh, ship yes. channel. That would require $100 a ton. And depending on where you're at, how close you are to different sequestration, that price will change. Mr. Woods or Mr. Mr. Worth? Congressman, there are different circumstances in uh, economies around the world. There are different carbon prices in economies around the world. In the U.S. A, a broad-based uh, and transparent uh, price is very important. And then a price that gradually uh, moves the price? into the economy. What price? Congressman, there's, there, there are different opinions on the number. I'm talking about the price. I want your opinion. Or, Congressman, the uh, cost of, of mitigating emissions is very different in different sectors of our economy. And Ms. eventually, Watkins, to, get to, to get to the kinds of reductions that we aspire to, it will be a very high Ms. price Watkins, over time. The price of carbon, what should it be? Yes, I, I, we can't say a specific price right now. We would need okay. to put, put this in place. It's a, it's a market-based carbon price. It would need to be a very even playing field. And depending on, on what we're trying to decarbonize, it's, the price will float with the market. Well, the sooner we can reach a fair price on carbon, and I know it would fluctuate, uh, the sooner we can achieve that market-based reform that you say that you're for. Another part of market-based reforms are whether you're truly a market-based entity or not. And I was wondering if we could agree on the amount of government subsidies that you receive every year. I think at the low uh, estimate, it's about $20 billion a year. But the IMF estimates that U.S. oil companies receive some $650 billion in direct and in, indirect subsidies every year. So can the four key oil executives agree on the amount by which they are subsidized, uh, at least in the United States, by the U.S. taxpayer? Is it $20 billion or is it $650 billion? Crickets. None of you have any idea how much you're being subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer? Congressman, uh, our products are taxed, not subsidized. And I can tell you that a number of the policies that get described as subsidies are very similar to those available to other industries uh, and other companies. And they're important for American energy security, American energy investment, and American energy supply. Well, when the tobacco companies were on the hot seat years ago, the first step that Congress took was to remove the subsidies for tobacco growing. That was the first step. And I think it's very important that we arrive at the degree of subsidies that are involved. I know that you are taxed, but you also have special provisions that only apply to oil and gas companies and don't apply to other firms. In aggregate, how much are those subsidies? Because those, by definition, would not be market-based. Those are government policies that benefit your companies instead of other types of activities. How much are those subsidies? Crickets. Congressman, I can't uh, answer your question directly, but I would I would offer, though, that uh, a healthy oil and gas industry is very important to the transition. I agree. 
And I agree. So, I'm, I'm wanting to find answers to market-based solutions, which you say that you're for. Final point, uh, shareholder activism. These upstart hedge funds, the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, has advocates of Shell being broken up because apparently they believe that more money could be made for investors by having a better run company. And that uh, shareholder activists have taken seats on ExxonMobil's board. I think that could be the market reform that might be faster than congressional action. I see that my time has expired. I thank the chair. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentle lady from New Mexico, Ms. Harrell, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me start off by saying that one, I'm here. I'm so glad to have this hearing because I don't think you can truly understand the hypocrisy that happens in this Capitol and in this in this building unless you're watching it like we are today or hearing it or participating in it. And the saddest thing of all is we have a president who's tweeted about the million jobs he's going to create or the four million jobs he's going to create. You know what's sad? He is creating jobs overseas because the very people that heat our homes, that put us to work every day, that has a profound effect on our entire country in terms of national security and job creation is under attack. And while this committee may not like you because you're executives, because your companies have been successful, I just want to apologize for the decorum because thank you for what you've done. Thank you, every one of you, for creating the jobs and for bringing it home, for teaching us that we can be energy independent and that we can also have a very reliable and long-standing relationship with each and every one of you and the communities and the people that rely on you and who we don't talk about you know, are the seniors or the lower middle-class income people that cannot afford to heat their homes or will have to make decisions this year whether to buy food or to heat their homes or to buy gas. And this is just the tip of the iceberg because later today or sometime this week or maybe this year, we're going to pass the most ridiculous bill in American history, the Infrastructure Reconciliation Bill that does nothing for the American people. So while you're getting beat down today, there are people here that believe in what you're doing and we thank you for all of the innovation. But what I want to do is ask a couple of questions to Mr. Somers. And this is really a no-brainer, but I'm thinking if you get to answer the question, maybe somebody will actually listen to you. What would happen to global emissions if, the, if my Democrat colleagues got their way and the United States stopped completely producing oil and glass, gas? Congresswoman, thank you for your question. And you represent one of the most prolific oil and gas districts in the country, uh, representing the New Mexico side of the prolific Permian Basin. And as you know, uh, oil and gas has led to a significant increase in jobs in your congressional district. Uh, and because of that, we've been able to reduce emissions because we've been able to find that oil and gas in more environmentally responsible ways. Uh, and for that matter, the state of New Mexico receives about 40% of its budget from the oil and gas industry. To answer your specific question, if the United States stopped using oil and gas, it is likely that the switch would go, would, there would be a reverse switch from the use of natural gas in our electricity generation to the use of coal. You know, in this industry, we need to remember what we at API called the energy tri trilemma. The energy trilemma is that the, for every energy source, it needs to be provided affordably, reliably, and cleaner. And so every source has to meet that same challenge. We're, within the oil and gas industry, we're working towards meeting that challenge every single day. There is a reason why U.S. emissions have continued to go down. 65% of the decline in emission uh, in the last decade is a consequence of that fuel switch from coal to natural gas. We do not want to reverse that progress. Right, but we're doing everything we can in this committee and on Capitol Hill to do just that, which I don't think people understand. This isn't about just starting the car every day. This is about so many of our day-to-day -day projects touched by petroleum. In fact, I would just uh, submit to saying anybody who's gotten a vaccination or is going to get one, thank you to the oil and gas industry because I would bet that almost every single one of the syringes has been touched by a petroleum product. But we don't want to give a hands up or a pat on the back to the industry because we'd rather set you down in here and tear you down and make the public think that you're all bad, you're rich, and you don't care about anybody. We know better than that. And this is truly personal for me 
because you just said it. You know, 40% of my state budget comes from this industry. Communities in my state, in my district, are completely made up of the men and women that serve, whether directly or indirectly, in jobs related to the industry. And while we sit here and think that we've got a better way, if it's all green and it's all good, then why are we subsidizing green new everything? Why are we pushing out the only, in, the only industry that is reliable, affordable, and that we desperately need in our nation to remain a global, a global standing when it comes to energy dominance, when it comes to national security. I just want to thank all of you for being here today. I hope that what you're saying will resonate, and I hope you'll get a chance to finish your sentences because it's been hard listening to you try to get your point made when you're being cut off. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The lady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Krishnamoorthy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Wirth, you believe that, quote, climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our time, correct, sir? Uh, Congressman, I uh, tried to be very clear on that earlier. We do believe that climate change is real. We accept the consensus. Yes, sir. And, and, and on page three of your witness statement, you said, you support the, quote, global net zero ambitions of the Paris Agreement, correct? That is uh, in, on page three of my statement, Congressman. In fact, on your October 11th press release, Chevron announced that it's targeted 2050 for having net zero emissions associated with the upstream operations of the company, correct? We have uh, announced a net zero uh, aspiration for scope one and scope two emissions for our uh, equity upstream production worldwide. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, you mentioned a couple concepts in, that, uh, in your documents. You talk about scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, as well as something called portfolio carbon intensity. And emissions are the total or absolute amount of carbon or greenhouse gases created by Chevron, while carbon intensity has to do with the amount of carbon released per unit of oil and gas that you're drilling for. And I was looking at pages two through four of your sustainability report, sir, and you call them scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Those are the overall or absolute emissions associated uh, with your operations, right? Congressman, there is a uh, taxonomy for how emissions are classified. Uh, that we apply, uh, as do companies across the economy. And scope one emissions are defined as those directly associated with the operations of a company. Scope two emissions are those associated with purchased electricity or uh, steam. And scope three, there are actually 15 different categories of scope three emissions. Uh, in uh, the case of our company and our industry, uh, type 11 of scope 3 has to do with the use of, of products. Use and of products, correct. Now, Mr. Worth, according to page 42 of Chevron's proxy statement, you received $29 million in compensation for 2020, correct? Uh, that uh, is uh, what is reported. And it proxy. appears that you received $33 million in compensation in 2019 as well. I'm looking at your compensation calculation on page 49 of the proxy statement, and it talks about how your comp relied on oil, glass f oil gas flaring and methane intensity reductions, but none of your compensation whatsoever relied on a reduction in scope one, scope two, or scope three emissions, correct? Uh, it's not uh, there. It's I, nowhere on that page. Congressman, it is in the uh, fourth category, which relates to uh, health, safety, and environment, and there is uh, a line in there that relates to achieving our greenhouse gas targets. No, it, the, there's something called greenhouse gas management, but it's t in, it is related to intensity. I have the page right here. And so the main point that is the case is that you could have high overall or absolute emissions associated with your operations or low or no overall emissions associated, associated with your operations but you'd be receiving the same tens of millions of dollars as you do now. And that's a fundamental problem with your compensation system at Chevron, that you're not incentivized to reduce your carbon footprint. And that is a big reason why Chevron's pollutions continue to go up. Now let's contrast that with Royal Dutch Shell, which made an important announce announcement today. Uh, Ms. Watkins. Uh, you announced today a 
a reduction of absolute emissions by 50% by 2030, correct? That's correct. And you also, uh, interestingly, announced that those emissions would apply to scope one, scope two, and scope three. So total emissions of the company, right? So our 2030 target we announced today is for scope one and two. Um, our net zero emissions uh, by 2050 include scope three. So by, by 2050, net zero across all three scopes, whereas as we know with Chevron, it's only scope one and scope two, so not all the emissions. Now, Ms. Watkins, in a time of rising energy demand, why is it that you would say you're going to decline your oil production? Why would you give up the opportunity to supply that ad additional demand? We believe that there's an opportunity. It's part of our powering progress strategy to accelerate the demand for clean energy, um, which is why we're working very closely with our customers. And in fact, we're working with industrial segments, um, sectors like the aviation industry, like heavy transport, like the marine industry, in order to accelerate the demand for, for clean energy products, because this isn't something we can do on our own. This is gonna take a full collaborative effort between us, between society, and between the government. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, Thank you, is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Crabtree, when did, <clears throat> excuse me, when did you lose your job? Uh, Thank you, Congressman. Uh, about three hours after uh, the presidential inauguration this year. January 20th, 2021, you lost your job. That's right? Yes, sir. What, what has happened? Do you, you know what's happened to the price of gasoline since that day? Uh, I think everybody knows the answer to that question, Congressman. It's uh, going nowhere but up, just like we tried to warn. It's increased dramatically, hasn't it? Over a dollar a gallon. Yes, sir. You know what's happened to the company that was overseeing the Russian Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, do you know what happened to them? Uh, I believe they were allowed to, to uh, finish construction. I know that for a fact. Yeah, they were, the sanctions against them were waived. They were allowed to complete construction of that pipeline at the same time yours was closed down and you lost your job. You know what's happened <clears throat> to American Energy Independence since the day you were fired? Uh, well, the words OPEC seem to be coming back in the media more these days, and I didn't hear that for a lot of years, so uh, uh, we've lost it. Yeah. That's Mr. what's happened. Mr. Summers, are, are CO2 emissions in the United States lower today than they were 20 years ago? They are, Congressman. Significantly lower, is that right? They are significantly lower. In fact, uh, uh, CO2 emissions from the power sector in particular at, are at the lowest level since 1978. And that's because, you know, things like cap and trade passed and regulations from the government caused you to lower them. Isn't that true? Congressman, actually, that is because of the innovation that has occurred exactly. in the American oil and gas industry. Exactly. Cap and trade didn't pass. It's not because of regulations from government. You guys did that on your own because it's just the right thing to do and it's good business, right? That's right, Congressman. As I mentioned before, every energy source has to meet that energy trilemma affordable, reliable, and cleaner. And that's what this industry has delivered. 10 months ago, was the United States of America energy independent, Mr. Summers? What I would say, Congressman, is that the United States was North American in energy independent uh, and well on our way to American energy independence. We were exporting a lot too, weren't we? We were. Uh, unfortunately, over the course of the last few months, we we're actually importing uh, uh, oil into the United States. Uh, for the first time in a while. Yeah, that was my next question. So we, in 10 months' time, we went from being energy independent to now we're importing oil, and we had the spectacle of the President of the United States begging OPEC to increase production. Is that accurate? Well, Congressman, in, in, uh, the U.S. was a net petroleum exporter for the first time since 1958 in the year uh, 2020. Uh, and, you know, we were very proud of being the world's largest producer of oil and natural gas uh, as a consequence of, of the innovation and the technological revolution that has occurred in the American oil and gas industry. Yeah, this, this I mean, I can't say it better than our colleague from Florida who spoke a few minutes ago, but in 10 months' time, we have literally went from energy independence to the President of the United States begging OPEC to increase production to now we're having to import some of our energy needs. We've went from $2 gas to three, four, five dollars. I was in California a week and a half ago, $5 gas, I saw it there, to, which, which cost families 
hundreds of dollars a month in transportation costs. I mean, I, I think Mr. Mr. Crabtree, I think in his testimony, said he still hasn't found a job. So not only did he lose his job because of the crazy energy policies of this government, he's now paying all kinds of more. His family's paying more for their transportation costs and other energy needs. And what do Democrats do today? They come in and badger companies, tell them to further reduce, in some cases, production of oil and gas, which is only going to exacerbate the problem. I mean, it, it's, it's literally maybe the craziest thing I've ever heard. But that's where they're at. Um, I don't think the American people are with them, though, and that's the good news. So I want to I thank those companies who are actually increasing production. Uh, Mr. Summers, I want to thank you for your, your testimony today. Mr. Crabtree, you deserve better. And hopefully, hopefully with some changes that I think are coming, because I don't think the American people are going to tolerate this, hopefully you'll be, you'll be employed real soon, and uh, we'll get these energy prices back where the families of this great country deserve to have them. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Donald Trump's party of denialism is engaged in campaigns of propaganda and disinformation about climate change, which he said was a Chinese hoax, COVID-19, which he said would disappear by Easter of last year, the 2020 presidential election, which he continues to claim that he won despite the fact that Joe Biden beat him by more than 7 million votes, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, and of course the violent January 6th insurrection, which he says really took place on November 3rd. And uh, adding for good measure that uh, the pro-Trump rioters greeted our police officers with hugs and kisses, which is presumably how more than 140 of them ended up injured with broken noses, necks, vertebrae, arms, legs, and so on. Trump's party has turned the denial of facts, science, and history into standard operating procedure. And we see the ideological machinery of lies, working overtime today. But as astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson has observed, the great thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. So they don't believe in science facts or the U.S. Constitution. They don't believe in our elections anymore. They've positioned themselves outside of the constitutional order, attacking our constitutional order. But we believe in science and facts and the Constitution. Now, the Lancet report on the health effects of climate change told us the last week that this is a civilizational emergency right now, not in the future, today. Rising temperatures, says the Washington Post, have led to higher rates of heat illness, causing farm workers to collapse in the fields and elderly people to die in their apartments. Insects carrying tropical diseases have multiplied and spread towards the poles. The amount of plant pollen in the air is increasing, worsening asthma and other respiratory conditions, and on and on. Record drought, record flooding, record forest fires, record hurricanes of increasing frequency and velocity. We cannot afford any more propaganda campaigns by corporations subsidized by the government against public policies designed to save humanity. The First Amendment does not protect fraudulent commercial speech, despite everything you heard today. You can go back and check out McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission, stating clearly that the government may and does punish fraud directly. Check out the Central Hudson case, declaring that if commercial speech is fraudulent, it is no longer protected by the First Amendment and it may be regulated by the government. Mr. Lawler, do you accept that the First Amendment does not accept fraudulent commercial speech? Sir, I, I just wouldn't say that I'm an expert on that particular topic. Mr. Worth, do you accept that the First Amendment does not protect fraudulent commercial speech? Uh, Congressman, uh, I uh, am not a constitutional scholar, and uh, I would uh, trust uh, those who are. Ms. Watkins, do you accept that the First Amendment does not protect fraudulent commercial speech? Congressman, I'm not an expert on, uh, on, on the legal aspects of this. I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Woods, uh, your company has filed several briefs about this, trying to use the First Amendment as a sword in litigation against uh, Massachusetts Attorney General Healy. Do you accept that the First Amendment does not 
protect fraudulent speech? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, sir. Um, are, are you aware of the litigation that uh, Exxon brought against Healy in federal district court in Texas? I'm aware that we've had several suits filed against us, and we've hired lawyers to defend our rights. Well, look, use your common sense, and I appreciate the fact you're not a lawyer, but using your common sense, do you think that a company has the right to lie, for example, about climate change and then use the First Amendment as a camouflage and a shield against litigation? I don't believe companies should lie, and I would tell you that we do not do that. But, but leaving that aside, because there might be a factual dispute on that particular contention, but do you believe if a company were to lie in commercial speech about something like climate change, it should not be protected by the First Amendment? I don't believe companies should lie. Okay. And what if a company were to lie? Is that protected by the First Amendment? I think the legal system and our court systems are designed to deal with those types of issues. Well, yes, indeed. In fact, you filed a brief uh, in San Francisco uh, versus Exxon, uh, filed in Texas District Court. Um, and I'd like to submit for the record the opinion by New York District Court Judge Valeria Caproni dismissing Exxon's First Amendment claims. I would hope as we Madam move Judge. forward, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, I would hope as we move forward, uh, every person in America and every person on earth has an interest in us defeating this climate nightmare. And I would hope that the corporations, which have received a lot of beneficence, a lot of bounty from the U.S. taxpayers, at the very least, would not lie about climate change and would not try to drape themselves in the First Amendment in order to protect their lies. I yield back to you, Madam Chair. The gentleman's time expires at the request of our, our panelists. Well, first, we're going to hear from the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grossman. He's recognized for five minutes. And following that, we'll have a 10-minute break at the request of our of our panelists today. Thank you. That was kind of a scary last couple minutes there. Um, uh, well, that's Mr. Summers. You know, you, you when you Google this stuff, um, at least I remember, you know, being a child growing up in the Milwaukee area, and it seems to me both the water and even more the air are just so much cleaner today than they were at the time. Could you give us some general comments about the amount of pollutants from cars, the amount of pollutants from energy plants, even coal plant replaced with coal plant, uh, as far as the cleanliness of the air today compared to maybe 50 uh, years ago. Congressman Grossman, uh, thank you for your question, and it's great to be with you here today. You know, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that the United States leads the world in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And again, that is because of what this industry has done to produce more here in the United States. As I also said, the United States uh, accounts for about 12.6% of world emissions, and that number continues to go down, while China's number is 32.5% of world emissions, and that number continues to go up, which is one of the reasons why we need global solutions as it relates to, to climate change. Uh, Additionally, uh, the emissions that have come from the electricity sector are at their lowest level since 1978. And that is because of the fuel switch that has gone on from coal to natural gas. Holy cow! Just a second here. You mean, despite the fact the population of this country has gone through the roof and the amount of economic activity has gone through the roof, we have less pollutants coming from the energy sector than 40 plus years ago? Congressman, in fact, the, obviously the United States population has continued to increase and world population is expected to grow significantly over the next many years. And even the International Energy Agency expects that if every country were to meet its Paris climate goals, the world would still get is 46% of its energy from oil and gas. So we need to make sure that we're making proper investments in the United States uh, for that oil and gas, because I believe, and I think most Americans believe, that it's important that we're getting our energy here at home rather than being dependent on foreign sources of energy we're not, where they are not produced nearly in the, most, in the way, in the environmentally, way, environmentally responsible way that it, they are produced here in the United States. 
Okay, we got. I'm sure we got a bunch of world travelers up there today. I'm looking here uh, uh, on my phone. It shows that Los Angeles, which I just thought was, you know, kind of a polluting city, has just a fraction of the amount of pollutants that we find in Shanghai, for example. Um, as you guys get around the world, we can start with you, uh, Mr. Summers, but other people. Uh, do you notice that pollution is more or less as you get around the globe compared to the United States? Well, Congressman, as you know, uh, we live uh, in an environment where uh, what happens in China affects the United States. In fact, the air in China today will be in California two days from now, which is why it's important that we address this issue from a global perspective. Uh, while focusing on what we can do as a country to lower our emissions over time. Okay. Are there, I'm told in other cities, China, maybe even Mexico City, uh, India, uh, pollutants as you are in their major metropolitan areas are a lot higher than the United States. Is that true? That is the case, Congressman. Uh, mainly because they have not been afforded the same fuel switch that has occurred in the United States from coal to natural gas. Somebody, told me, to the hundred, somebody told me they're building over 100 coal plants in China right now. Is that true? Uh, that is my understanding as well, Congressman. Uh, what, but what we want to do here in the United States is we have abundant supplies of natural gas, and we want to make sure that we're exporting American environmental progress to the rest of the world. Uh, we can do that through liquefied natural gas. Uh, we have the resources. We want to share that environmental progress with the rest of the world. Well, some people like to slow down economic progress here and kind of push that economic progress to other countries. Is that going to result in worldwide pollutants going up or down as we kind of push manufacturing to other countries? Congressman, as you know, for most of the world, the choice is not between uh, uh, coal and renewables. It is a choice between coal and natural gas, which is why we think it's important that the United St States continues to produce. Okay. So that Just we one can more thing for our panelists. Across the you, world. you guys all have a good story to tell. Don't be afraid to tell people how much cleaner things are than the past. It doesn't do you any good to get all woke on us. Thanks. The gentleman yields back. At, at the request of our witnesses, we will take a brief 10-minute uh, break. The committee stands in recess for 10 minutes.
The committee will come to order. The gentleman from Illinois, Representative Quigley, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Quigley? Give me another one. We are going to hold for a few seconds for the witnesses to return. When the witnesses return, we will recognize Mr. Quigley. All the witnesses have returned. The gentleman from Illinois, Representative Quigley, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for those who are uh, involved today. I guess at this point, uh, perhaps it's helpful to put some of this in perspective and uh, to ask a question uh, on the overall issue of safety. Uh, I serve on the House Select Committee on Intelligence, and we're often briefed on climate change as a, as a threat to our national security. Uh, the Pentagon refers to climate change as a, quote, threat multiplier. In recent reports from the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community, the National Security Council, and the armed services outline the emerging threat of climate change and its ability to wreak havoc, economic havoc, and destabilization in regions, and initiate and, and fuel conflicts, and help format violence. Uh, the hearing today has helped document a long-standing and concerted effort to muddy the scientific waters on the threat of climate change and pointed work to prevent any substantive action to prevent it, uh, not the least of which was Exxon's internal reports confirmed human global caused warming. Publicly, it took the opposite view in a 2017 study of Exxon's communications concluding that the company systematically misled nine scientific audiences about climate change. But I think the person who put that all best, Dr. Rod Schoonover, he served a, a decade for the U.S. intelligence community as senior analyst and senior scientist in the Bureau of Intelligence and research at the U.S. Department of State as a director of environment and natural resources. He said, and I quote, if climate change poses a risk to national security, as the Pentagon and intelligence community again reminded us last week, shouldn't we view climate disinformation through the same lens as well? I think those before us today have to ask themselves, and as this investigation goes forward, we need to put it under that prism. Let me make the second point, and that is to remind ourselves of the risk and danger in, involved in these operations. I guess I'd be remiss not talking about a location <clears throat> uh, literally in my backyard in Whiting, Indiana, the Whiting Refinery, that is, one of the largest refineries in the U.S. and its operator, BP. Uh, in 1991, the residents of East Chicago noticed oil oozing into their basements. A subterranean spill of 400,000 barrels of oil was discovered in the water table soon thereafter. In 2012, BP had to pay an $8 million penalty and spend $400 million on pollution controls due to the emissions from the Whiting BP. In 2014, Whiting discharged a slug of crude oil into Lake Michigan, close to where children swim and wildlife live. This occurred nearly three weeks after BP announced it would double its processing of crude at the Whiting facility. Earlier this year, District Court judge ruled that BP repeatedly violated limits on emissions, specifically particulate air emission, 
between 2015 and 18, they conducted nine emission tests and failed all nine, demonstrating that whiting was spewing soot into the Chicagoland area. Mr. Lawler, what are BP's plans for addressing the health effects of its presence in communities like where the whiting refinery is located? Uh, thank you for the, the question, Congressman. So, you know, I'm aware of the, the incidents that have, have occurred at Whiting over time. And what I can share with you is that we take the safety of the community and the safety of our employees very important. And that includes uh, the safety of the water and the air that, that's in the area. What I can say is that we are dedicating resources to correct any deficiencies at the Whiting refinery that we find. Um, as you know, the industry is, is focused on this. We're focused on it, and it is one of our largest refineries uh, in the United States. And the commitment that we have um, is to lower emissions at the refinery over time and to protect all the individuals that work in and around the refinery. You know, I think given the limited time we have, what makes sense is if you could submit to the uh, committee the, uh, the improvements that you deem necessary uh, where you are in the timeline to make those improvements and when you expect those to, to be completed, if you would, commit to that, please. Yes, we will follow up with, with the actions that we're taking. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Before uh, my five minutes, I ask unanimous consent to uh, submit a few articles for the record. Without objection. Uh, these articles, with a pin stroke, President Joe Biden cancels the Keystone XL pipeline project. Biden lifts U.S. sanctions on major Russian pipeline. While Western nations kill energy, China builds coal plants by the dozen. China is planning to build 43 new coal-fired power plants. Russia projects oil output near post-Soviet highs in 2022. Europe has become a hostage to Russia over energy, analysts warn. Europe warns its gas prices surge will drive up food costs. Biden asks OPEC to up oil production while limiting U.S. energy production. Qatar Petroleum signs a 15-year LNG supply deal with China. Qatar Petroleum boosts LNG production. Qatar places a $760 million order with China for liquid gas ships. Energy costs are stoking inflation. Just look at U.S. gas prices. Home heating sticker shock. The cost of natural gas is up by 180%. Food prices poised to surge with fertilizer prices at the highest in years. Thank you. Uh, it's been said, of course, many times in this committee, in a number of hearings, that we are facing a national climate emergency. And I think it's important to put this conversation in context because, of course, any discussion on any climate solution must be a global one. We know the environment doesn't stop at our borders, and we have to be thoughtful in that when we are enacting policies and certainly discussing potential solutions. I think it's also important that we be able to have this conversation without the hysteria from the extreme left. Um, often there's a sad effort to get Americans to be fearful in order to get Americans to buy into increased government control in their lives in virtually every sim single aspect. And I would submit one more article, climate-related deaths have plunged 99.9% .9 since 1932. Uh, the world is not going to end in 10 years. People are not dying in record numbers because of climate change. Yes, we do want clean air and water, and yes, we should continue to make technological improvements to, to meet those goals. But uh, Mr. Crabtree, you are not a policy wonk and therefore not breathing the D.C. air, and so I think you can give us kind of just the, the boots on the ground of an American perspective. We have a number of crises right now. We can talk about inflation, the price of food, the price of gas. We can talk about supply chain breakdown. We can talk about the crime epidemic in our communities uh, as a result of the defund the police movement and open borders. We can talk about China's nuclear-capable hypersonic missile. Um, these things are also threats to the nation. Uh, you mentioned you're concerned about 
pricing, uh, being able to, to meet the, the mortgage payment next month. Uh, where I imagine, like most Americans, and you can tell me if this is true or not, you rate uh, climate change probably somewhere in between the new national emergency appearance at school board meetings and somewhere uh, with uh, being able to meet your mortgage. Is that correct? Uh, well, be able to meet my mortgage and take care of my family is my number one priority. Uh, I do have concerns about the climate, but uh, I think it's important that we realize uh, we were talking about the negative effect of fossil fuels, but we've got to realize the benefits they've provided uh, this country over the years. Uh, if you look at yes, sir. life expectancy in this country and the I, use I of fossil fuels, I only have a couple more minutes, so hand in hand. I, only have, I appreciate that thought. I only have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to continue if I can. A uh, U.S. National Intelligence Council report said this. Uh, it was put out in 2005. It said, in terms of size, speed, and directional flow, the transfer of global wealth and economic power is now underway, roughly from west to east. It's without precedent in modern history, and the shift derives from two sources. First, increases in oil and commodity prices have generated windfall profits for Gulf states and Russia. Second, lower costs combined with government policies have shifted the locus of manufacturing and service industries overseas. And so basically it said that there's a massive shift going from the American people to nations overseas, and it, it was because of two reasons. One was oil and gas profits going overseas, and two, manufacturing over, going overseas. That report actually went on to say that this transfer was inevitable, it could not be stopped, yet the last administration, the Trump administration, showed us indeed that those two things could actually be reversed and, and, and give a great w windfall for the American people. Now, the world's demand on energy is growing. That's a good thing. That's people coming out of poverty. That's people finding mobility. Uh, that's people having fuel to heat their homes many times for the first time. Mr. Summers, generally speaking, does the U.S. produce energy cleaner or more responsibly than, let's say, here's some of the other nations uh, that produce top producers of energy, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Qatar, China. Where does the U.S. rank among those as far as producing energy responsibly? The, the gentleman's time has expired, uh, but the gentleman Chair, may answer the question. The first two question. minutes was uh, submitting reports. Articles for record. That, that's still your time. The gentleman may. Uh, I believe the, the rules. gentleman may answer your question. Let him answer your question. Uh, Madam Chair, that's not supposed to count against my time. Yes, it Madam is. Chair, point of order. I didn't think that uh, submitting letters for the record counted against your questioning time. It does, <laughs> but I'll, I'll grant the guy, the the gentleman, a little more time. The gentleman may answer your question. Uh, where, where does the U.S. rank among some of the world's leaders in, in producing energy responsibly and sustainably? Congressman, thank you for your question. Uh, based on the data that we have seen, the United States continues to produce these products in a way that is safer, better, and more responsibly produced uh, from an environmental perspective than any other country on Earth. Real quick, has the U.S. reduction in oil and gas production and exports led to a surge in other nations, say in the Middle East or Asia, adopting green technologies? Congressman, uh, as, as an organization, we, of course, are focused on, on continuing to produce in an environmentally safe way these products that are demanded by world consumers. Right. But I think what we see in some of the articles that I mentioned before, what we see is as we reduce production, actually the world finds other sources that are less clean than United States production to, to meet the demand. Uh, I would suggest that the greater the demand that U.S. production is on the world market, that the better it is for our, our green objectives. Um, one more question, and, and Ms. Clark, if you could answer this. Uh, any discussion about- Very quickly. <laughs> any, any discussion about green energy solutions, it's very important that we recognize that they also require natural resources, and that is rare earth minerals. Could you speak to the U.S.'s, uh, how, rel how reliant is the U.S. on other nations for rare earth minerals, and what nation controls most of the rare earth minerals? I think it's 80 to 90 percent. Thank you, Congressman. I know I don't have much time. Uh, I, I believe that China controls too much of the supply of these critical minerals, and it's why we have to balance national security, economic security, while we're combating climate change together. And the U.S. is what percent reliant on okay. rare earth minerals for other the, nations? The gentleman's time has expired. You may ask your question. She may answer it, but you're three minutes over right it, now. It's 100 percent. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, is recognized for five minutes. 
Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. The fossil fuel executives that are appearing before us today claim that their companies support reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement, a watershed international environmental treaty, as we know. But the committee looked into the lobbying disclosures filed by your companies and found that your rhetoric of support for the Paris Agreement doesn't match reality when it comes to your lobbying. Uh, we know what it looks like when your industry really cares about a federal initiative and your companies want to see it succeed. So let me, let me start with you, Mr. Worth. Your company claims that the Paris Agreement is among your highest priorities. The first sentence of Chevron's climate policy page says, quote, Chevron supports the Paris Agreement, end quote. I noticed that you also touted Chevron's support for the Paris Agreement in your written testimony to this committee. Since the start of negotiations on the Paris Agreement in 2015, Chevron has reported 986 total instances of federal lobbying. Mr. Worth, do you know how many times Chevron reported lobbying on the Paris Agreement? Uh, Congressman, uh, that is uh, information that I don't have uh, in front of me, but it's- uh, Okay, well, let me tell you what it is. Not once, not a single time, not one of those 986 instances of lobbying mentions the Paris Agreement. Now I wanna compare that to an issue that we know your company really cares about, corporate tax breaks. Mr. Worth, do you know how many lobbying reports your company filed that included lobbying on tax issues? Congressman, I don't have that in information in front of me. 100, 144, that's the answer. You didn't lobby once on the 28 bills and resolutions introduced on the Paris Agreement. When former President Trump was debating withdrawing from the agreement in 2017, you never lobbied the White House. Chevron has spent more than $54 million on lobbying on a lot of other things since 2015. So clearly when your company cares about an issue, you lobby on it and we can see that in the reports. Let me move on to Mr. Lawler. BP's 2020 shareholder report pledged to, and I quote, advocate for fundamental and rapid progress towards the Paris climate goals. Since 2015, the company has reported 488 total instances of legislative lobbying. Mr. Lawler, how many of those reports mentioned BP lobbying on the Paris Agreement? I, I don't have that specific number, but what- The answer, I... the, the answer is one. That amounts to 0.2% of your federal lobbying during that time. By comparison, you lobbied 21 times on the 2017 tax cut bill. And I'm running out of time, so I just, I just want to list for the record some information about the other organizations represented here today. Since 2015, API has filed 153 lobbying reports aimed at cutting taxes for oil and gas companies, but just one lobbying report on the Paris Agreement. Exxon has spent $67 million on lobbying since 2015. These are astronomical sums, by the way, just as an aside. Of the 1,543 instances of legislative lobbying that Exxon reported, only one mentioned the Paris Agreement. But Exxon lobbied on tax legislation 344 times. So once, on the Paris Agreement, which you claim is a priority and something you're focused on as a company, 344 times on tax legislation. And Shell, responsible for 470 instances of legislative lobbying, addressed the Paris Agreement only five times. I Man, it's better than the rest of the crowd, but that's not, that's not so great um, in itself. But on the tax cut pill, uh, Shell lobbied 31 uh, times. So there's no strong public record reflected here in terms of support for the Paris Agreement, regardless of the claims you make and regardless of the rhetoric that we hear day in and day out. We know that we follow the money to determine what your priorities are and they're headed uh, in a different direction. It's time we start judging these companies, your companies, by your actions, not by the rhetoric. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. 
Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gibbs, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it's been shameful how the other side wants to demonize this oil and gas industry. I'm very proud of our oil and gas industry. The innovators, they drop new technologies, they provide a higher standard of living and lots of jobs and economic activity throughout our country. Um, I want to go back a little bit in history just for a quick review you know, how this all started. We go back to the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution, and we had Andrew Carnegie, Steele, we had John D. Rockefeller, uh, kerosene, the, the refinery, we had J.P. Morgan, with Thomas Edison, electricity, and that began the Industrial Revolution, and their in, in, innovation and their entrepreneurship put us on a path to become a global power in this country, in this world that's made us the ability to do lots of good things. We, we stopped tyranny in the 1940s. Uh, we've helped countries around the world improve their standard of living and quality of life. And just recently, we brought the world of COVID vac vaccines. So this is an exceptional country. And a part of it has played a big pl play in that is our great companies. And I'll just revert back to John D. Rockefeller. He started with kerosene. And one of the byproducts was interesting is gasoline and the, the invention of the internal combustion engine, they figured out what they could do. And they, Henry Ford and all, all that took off. But then they had to break up those monopolies and that probably was a good thing. And the companies that are represented here today, Madam Chair, are a spinoff of the Standard Oil Company, which began in my great state of Ohio. So I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of all the stuff that they've done to help us and what they're gonna do in, the, in this century to help us transition uh, environmentally friendly, but supply affordable uh, energy at, available to our, our, our consumers and, and, and provide the power to, to uh, move our country forward uh, in, into new technologies, maybe hydrogen, renewables, or technologies we don't even know about yet. Um, I do, uh, uh, I think it's amazing, the chair of the subcommittee, uh, trying to hold these CEOs to account, essentially make a pledge to lower production. And I'm glad to see at least one of them, uh, Mr. Woods from Exxon Mobil, said, we're gonna increase production because the demand's out there. We have a President of the United States out there asking OPEC to increase production, the biggest hypocrisy probably in this century. And, but he did say they're gonna work to lower emissions. And, and, and uh, I'm just disappointed that the chair uh, failed to recognize that and tried to uh, uh, demonize uh, them on that. Uh, a couple other things here. I always hear, and it came up earlier in the hearing today, about how the oil, oil and gas industry gets tax subsidies. It's just not fair. I, I looked into this a little bit ago, and I, I, I can't really find it. I, I, the answer was they get anything that it, all other businesses get. And I'll give you an example. I know some of the uh, uh, anti-oil and gas people out there are saying that it, it, if you go out and drill a, a, a hole, you know, drill, drill a well, and, and uh, those legitimate expenses for the drilling costs and to pay the employees shouldn't be tax deductible. They call that a subsidy. I don't think that's any different than when I go out in my businesses and do things and I have business expenses, you expense that. And I believe uh, that is the, the, the case and that there's no real subsidies that go into the oil and gas industry. At least nobody's told me a real legitimate one. Uh, Mr. Uh, Summers, uh, like I just said, the uh, oil and gas industry, uh, uh, you know, we've gone from $60 oil to just uh, last year to $85 oil, and you see the price of gas. What's the status right now with our oil rigs, our exploration in this, in this country? What's happened in the last uh, 10 months? Mr. Summers. Congressman, thank you very much for your question. And as you know, uh, the state of Ohio, our home state, uh, is, has a very robust oil and natural gas industry. Uh, and a, an incredible history of development. And in fact, it is because of the, that development in your state uh, that we've be, got to the point where we're producing natural gas that we can share with the rest of the world to meet environmental challenges, not just here at home, but in the rest of the world. Um, U.S. petroleum demand in the United States uh, reached a record high in the month of September. Um, unfortunately, supply has not been able to keep pace. Um, domestic oil production in September was down by 1.9 uh, million barrels a day from its level uh, for the same month of the pre-pandemic year of, of 2019. Okay, I'm almost out of time. Is that, is that because there's been uh, uh, more pressure put on and, and, and our, our, our innovators aren't going out and doing what they were doing a year ago because uh, uh, the fear of more uh, burdensome regulations, the canceling of federal permits on lands and waters? 
Congressman, thank you for your question. There are a number of different reasons for that, uh, including the you know, worker shortage that uh, is occurring in the United States. But of course, federal regulations and announcements have played a significant role as well. When the first announcement out of the administration was canceling the Keystone XL pipeline, and the second announcement was canceling development on uh, federal lands and uh, leases uh, on those federal lands and permitting on those federal lands, I do think it sent a chilling effect across the industry about where this administration was headed in terms of the development of resources here in the United States. And so I'm out of time, but I guess this, just to close, we're, what the future looks for higher prices, demand's increasing, and the supply's not, so we're going to be more dependent on OPEC and Russia and everybody else, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, the gentlelady from Michigan. Ms. Tlaib is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Dr. Wo uh, Mr. Woods, did Exxon help fund One Alaska? Yes or no? I'm not familiar with that. Well, One Alaska was a front group created specifically to oppose Alaska's ballot initiative that would require oil companies to pay their fair share. It actually received ne nearly $21 million in contributions. 94% of One Alaska's contributions came from five oil, oil and gas companies, including Exxon and BP. So I, I'm, I would like to submit for the record, Madam Chair, uh, an article, Oil Companies Spend big to, big to Try to Defeat Alaska's Tax Proposal. Without objection. Same thing in Colorado in 2018, where a measure, this is resident-led measure, ballot, ballot measure, to ban oil and gas extraction within a half a mile of homes, schools, and waterways on the ballot. That front group was called Colorado Rising. And that one, again, resident-led, that one, Mr. Ruth, Mike Ruth, I'm not even going to bother to ask if you're familiar with, because I know the answer. Many of you, all of you, helped fund some of these. I guess Chevron specifically funded $33 million uh, behind its subsidiary, Noble Energy, contributed to that front group. Mr. Summers, are you familiar with Energy Citizens? I am familiar with Energy Citizens, Congresswoman. I'm I'm glad you are. It's a front group to American Petroleum Institute, uses it to flood Facebook with hundreds of ads opposing climate provisions in the Build Back Better Act. There, you all spent about, what, nearly half a million dollars in misleading ads since August. Of course, when you look at these ads, y'all, the public, when you look at these ads, they don't say the name Exxon, BP, Chevron, anywhere. Y'all hide and you deceive the public. So oil and gas companies can go claiming that they are pro-environment while opposing sensible pro-environment measures in secret. Lies, plain and simple. Madam Chair, in Michigan, and I'd like to submit for the record as well, uh, Michigan utility, Utilities front groups begin misleading in cam campaigns ahead of a vote on energy legislation for Without the record. Without objection. There, uh, DTE Energy and Consumers Energy used a front group called Alliance for Michigan Power and Citizens for Energizing Michigan's Economy, respectively, to target my residents and their amazing work, amazing work. They're the ones fundraising for this, Madam Chair to support increased rooftop solar energy. That's how they were wanted to cut the energy cost so they can make a living, so they can provide a quality life for their families by reducing their, their reliance on, on, on um, corporate polluters. Um, Mike, Mike Worth, when are you going to cut the check? Congresswoman, I, I'm not trying to understand the context of your question. That's okay, okay. So for me. Could I? Excuse me, I, I'd like to correct something that, you, that you've sure. been provided with some inaccurate information. Mm -hmm. uh, Noble Energy was not a subsidiary of Chevron in, in 2000. Okay, you can submit it for the record, sir. So Chevron, you can submit it to the committee. Chevron has about 70 serious cases of environmental and community abuses in 31 countries worldwide, owing over 50 billion in judgments and settlements. Checks, literally, settlement debts that you all have. So Mike, when are you gonna cut the check? Congressman, I'm not familiar with the number you- When you are you gonna cut the $50 billion check that you owe? It went through the courts. You owe $50 billion to communities in 31 countries. Congressman, I'd be happy to take a look at the source for your information on this sure. and, uh, and get back to you on it because I have no understanding of what- Well, I have a message for you as Chevron CEO. I mean, you made what, $29 million last year in poisoning the planet. Um, Mr. Worth, you, you can't arrest us all. You can't arrest the truth. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Congresswoman, I, I am uh, not exactly 
following. So, so you're targeting in actions against the human rights lawyer Dotsinger. I mean, what you did there, your company, maybe through subsidiaries, I don't know. I just want to remind you, there are more of us than there are of you. You can poison the planet to make money, but we're going to defend the planet so we can live. And we will win. So, uh, you know, I need Chevron to cut the check. You owe $50 billion to indigenous communities and people that you harmed for profit. This is not about vilifying these companies. This is about accountability. You all know we're all paying the cost from our public health to our environment, the actions that you take, and you're hiding behind subsidiaries, and it's wrong. These are residents putting ballot initiatives on their local ballot to make a difference to save our planet. Get out of the way so they can do the work for the people in the community they live in. Thank you, and I yield. Gentlelady yields back. The Ma gentleman Madam, from Louisiana, Madam Chair, Mr. Higgins, is recognized for five order. minutes. Point of order. Point of order. order. What is your point of I order? just wanted to uh, state a point, uh, a fact, with uh, what Representative Tlaib said about Colorado Proposition 112. Uh, opposition to that measure was, was deep, which included uh, uh, John Hickenlooper, the senator, and as well as our former colleague, Governor Jared Paulus. Madam Chair, point of order point, objection. That is not a, not a point of order. Me. Submit to the this record. Not a valid point of order. Okay. Now, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, is now recognized for five minutes. My, my, my. Good Lord, help us to be protected from this threat from within. American patriots are so done with career politicians and Democrat Party socialist insanity. We are nauseated by the continuous attacks on working Americans and American industry. This entire debacle of a hearing today has been reflective of the exact reasons why my colleagues across the aisle will lose their majority status very soon. We have a smashed economy. We've witnessed a disgraceful retreat from Taliban terrorists overseas, abandoning Americans. We have a disintegrated southern border. We have unbelievable inflation. We have medical oppression. We have parents, American parents, being threatened by our own DOJ for having the audacity to exercise their First Amendment rights to assemble and redress grievance. We have the companies brought before us today, American men and women for a public beating by the Democrats on this committee. They've done incredible work to actually lower emissions. These companies have worked with scientists and engineers, not politicians, to reduce methane by 70% between 2011 and 2019. They've used innovation to clean up their industry on their own their facilities and plants are incredibly clean and safe. It's abhorrent that my colleagues across the aisle have called a so-called hearing today to demonize American industry whose products make modern life possible. Petroleum products are in everything, the clothes on our back, the wiring in our computers, our computers, our cells, our phones, all the equipment used by our military, all medical supplies and equipment, paint, curtains, fabrics and appliances in our homes, fishing rods, lures, tents used by sportsmen, everything, all sports products. It's insane what my colleagues across the aisle are putting these good American men and women through and attacking American workers as our country dissolves around us. You, you push patriots too far. You've gone a bridge too far. We won't take it anymore. Mr. Woods, Ms. Watkins, Mr. Worth, and Mr. Lawler, I'm about to ask you about a pledge. My, uh, our, our chairwoman asked you for a pledge. I think it was an absurd request, but I'm gonna ask you about a pledge. Mr. Woods, do you pledge today to endeavor to continue leading the world in emissions reductions and providing abundant, affordable energy through innovations? i say again so you can think about it. Do you pledge today to endeavor to continue leading the world in emissions reductions and providing abundant, affordable energy through innovations? We try to do that today, and we will continue to try to do that going into Thank the Thank you, Mr. Woods. Ms. Watkins, same question. Do you pledge today 
for Shell to endeavor to continue leading the world in emissions reductions and providing abundant, affordable energy through innovations. Congressman, yes, and I would add clean energy to that. Statement. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Worth, for Chevron, do you pledge today to continue to endeavor leading the world in emissions reductions through providing abundant, affordable energy and with innovation? Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lawler, for BP America, do you pledge today to endeavor to continue leading the world in emissions reductions and providing abundant, affordable energy for the world through innovations? Thank you, Congressman. We will continue, and I pledge to lower emissions over time. We're trying to help the world reach net zero, and we'll provide, continue to provide uh, the energy that the world needs, and increasingly green, and we have a number of projects in motion today that will support those objectives. Thank you, good sir, for your answer. Madam Chair, I happily yield the balance of my time so that we can get through this uh, horrendous display of partisan attack upon American workers and American industry. I yield. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Porter, Ms. Katie Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've heard a lot about future plans for investment in renewable energy today. Ms. Watkins, Shell's 2020 annual report called for between 19 and $22 billion in near-term spending. I'm representing that with this container of M&Ms. Each M&M represents about $50 million in spending. Ms. Watkins, how much has Shell said it will spend in the near term on oil, gas, and chemical operations? I, I think you just said we're going to be spending between 18 and $20 billion uh, this year. That's near term on total spending. How much on oil, gas, and chemical operations? We're going to be spending... Well, according to your annual report, you said you're going to spend 16 to $17 billion for oil, gas, and chemical with another $3 billion for marketing. How much is Shell spending to spend on renewable energy? This year we'll be spending between two and $3 billion. Two and $3 billion on renewables and energy solutions. In your testimony, you said, quote, meeting the demand for reliable energy while simultaneously addressing climate change is a huge undertaking and one of the defining challenges of our time. Shell has made these promises before. Shell pledged to spend $6 billion between 2017 and 2020 on renewable energy. How much of that did Shell actually spend? The answer is about half. Ms. Watkins, does this look like a huge undertaking to you? Congresswoman, what I can tell you is that um, there needs to be both a demand and a supply of clean energy, which is why we're working very closely with our customers so that that demand increases over time and we are Ms. ready Watkins, to fly. To me, this does not look like an adequate response to one of the defining challenges of our time. This is greenwashing. Shell is trying to fool people into thinking that it's addressing the climate crisis when what it's actually doing is to continue to put money into fossil fuels. Mr. Summers, do you recognize the following statement? Banning federal leasing and development on federal lands and waters would derail decades of U.S. energy progress. I do, Congresswoman. That's your statement. How many of the Department of Interior's approved and ready to drill permits are currently unused? Congresswoman, it takes a long time to develop these leases that uh, I appreciate oil and that, gas Mr. Companies Summers. I'm just asking how many permits are unused? Congresswoman, uh, I, th I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding as to how these Reclaiming acres... my time, Mr. Summers, there are 7,700 permits unused. How many acres of public land are already leased by fossil fuel companies and not even used yet? Just available or drilling whenever you decide. Congresswoman, again, I, I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding as to how this process works and the time and resources. Reclaiming my time, is. reclaiming my time. The answer is 13.9 million acres. To visualize how much land that is, if each grain of rice were one acre, that would be 479 
pounds of rice. The American Petroleum Institute even opposed pausing more leasing on our lands. They even sued to stop it because apparently this acreage wasn't enough. Mr. Worth, you serve on the American Petroleum Institute's executive committee. Do you support a pause on new oil and gas leases on federal land? Congresswoman, access to uh, resource in this country is essential to ensure the energy security of our country and uh, reclaiming my time. Mr. Lawler, do you support a pause? The administration and and it's, our, it's our hope that the that the uh, pause in soon. We think it's important to go for my time. Thank you for your answer. The answer there is no. Mr. Woods, do you support a pause on new federal and gas leases? No. Ms. Watkins, do you support a pause on new federal and gas leases? No, I do not, because I think it's important. You already have 13.9 million acres. This is equivalent to Maryland and New Jersey combined. How much more do you need? How much more acreage? You have two of our 50 states at a price that makes the Louisiana Purchase look like a ripoff, and you're not even using it. What more do you need? Iowa, Colorado, Virginia? Our public land belongs to the American people, not to big oil. When you lobby and you sue so that you could take more of our public land, you're saying too much is never enough. The American people are tired of this charade. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and I uh, apologize to uh, our witnesses that were called and asked to take part in this today. Uh, as chairman of the Rules Committee for six years, I never witnessed nor would have allowed this kind of, of intimidation that has taken place on people who we invited to come and provide open answers. On top of that, they raised their hand to tell the truth, and they were repeatedly stopped rather than allowing them to offer their explanations of things they do. I apologize to our witnesses and want to thank them as energy company executives to make sure that America has a sound supply of energy that is available and reliable to where we can avoid the things that happened under President Jimmy Carter, where that same attack took place. We had long lines of people in the middle of the winter attempting to get what they needed. Each of you represent an industry that helps to provide a solid, cost-effective supply. Republicans have had issues with energy. And that's why just a few years ago, we opened up the American market. We opened up the American market to the world. And I believe that this helped not just consumers, but I believe it helped other people in the world. Mr. Summers, have you ever heard of a term called lie heap? Yes, sir. I have heard of lie heap. Do you know what lie heap is and what it is used for as a federal program. I do. Uh, LIHEAP is a well-established program that helps low-income individuals uh, afford heat uh, in their homes uh, during the winter. And it's primarily used in the Northeast. That is correct. Can you tell me what the product is that is dumped in to ensure this energy would be available in the Northeast? Well, uh, Congressman, um, as you know, most of the you know, power in this country, particularly for heat and air conditioning, uh, you know, come, or 40 percent of it now, comes from natural gas. And lie heap? Is that natural gas in the Northeast? Congressman, uh, home heating uh, in the United States uh, is, uh, in, in the Northeast in particular, uh, home heating is, fr uh, a lot of it is from actually oil. Diesel. Is that correct, or what kind of home heating fuel is it? It is a heat, home heating oil. Home heating oil. So what has the rest of the country done that would be of benefit and responsibility for heating their homes? 
Well, Congressman, uh, as uh, an industry, we have worked hard to develop these resources here at home so that we don't have to get them from volatile regimes overseas. And that includes, of course, uh, the home heating oil uh, that is used to heat homes uh, in the Northeast. Primarily what I'm looking for, you're the one giving the answer, is natural gas is an abundant supply in the United States. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, in fact, it is 40% of, uh, of the uh, heat and air conditioning and power that Americans get in their homes comes from natural gas. And uh, there, there has been a significant fuel switch that has occurred over the course of the last many years as a consequence of the natural gas and oil revolution here in the United States, where we've been able to produce more here uh, in the United States, and we have not had to import those products from overseas. Using the term clean energy, how clean is natural gas compared to home heating fuel? Uh, natural gas is, well, 50 percent more clean than what it has replaced, coal. Uh, and that has been, you know, a, a real boon to the American environment uh, and has allowed us to cut emissions over time uh, to generational lows. Mr. Summers, have you ever heard of this committee or another committee holding a hearing about lye heap and how dirty that is as compared to natural, clean, natural gas? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with such a hearing, sir. You would think that that would be part of the agenda is to make their own territory cleaner in the winter. Madam Chairman, I've used my time. I think I made my point. I'd like to yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Desaulnier, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, my comments I put in the context of it's been my privilege for 32 years to serve in public office in a region in Northern California that's home to five oil refineries a significant part of our economy, significant part of our revenue stream for state and local uh, government, um, for our school districts. Uh, Mr. Worth, I don't know if you're a constituent, but I know you, some of your predecessors have been. Your headquarters is in the county I represent. I put that um, in the context, I've also served in the Bay Area Quality Management District and was appointed by Pete Wilson, a Republican to the California Air Resources Board and served under three governors um, two Republicans and one Democrat. So I remind uh, folks that uh, it was a California Republican who signed the uh, Clean Air Act, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan uh, amended it, another Republican, and uh, George Magee, a conservative Republican governor of California, um, started the ZEV program, the Zero Emission Vehicles program, which I have been intimately involved with. Uh, with uh, auto manufacturers and uh, also to a degree with, under other regulations with the heavy duty manufacturers. Um, I've been to funerals of constituents of mine who have died while working in these refineries. I don't know if any of you have ever been one of those. Um, five of them um, died. One of them died because the company, not yours, um, but somebody who's still some a company that competes with you, um, was uh, appealing a citation from Cal OSHA to replace walkie-talkies that cost less than $1,000. Michael Glansman, who was trying to use that to, Camel, to tell the, uh, the folks back in the command unit that they should shut down the hydrocracker, they couldn't hear him in time, so he was eviscerated. So that's a long way of saying I've got a long history in this field. Um, I, I, you provide value but it's time to change. And we don't have time um, from an economic standpoint or an environmental standpoint to haggle over this. But we've got to remember history and we've got to rebuild trust. Uh, Mr. Summers, the, the, the viewpoint that all of this innovation and our reductions have happened because of private industry is just misleading at best. Mr. Jordan's comments, Mr. Grothen's comments, uh, our regulations at CARB and the California waiver has propelled this innovation uh, environmentally and from a worker safety standpoint. And it's been my pleasure in very 
difficult negotiations um, to be able to work with the private sector to get those. So I wish we could really focus on what's in front of us, uh, an energy industry that's important to us, but whose time is passing. Mr. Grothman's comments and, and the idea that we're going back to toll coal uh, in China, I just remind folks that China is adding 100,000 charging stations and hydrogen fuel stations a month and is going up exponentially. The future is, in, is not in fossil fuels, in climate, carbon intense industries, it's in renewables and alternatives. And even if we didn't have the ex existential threat to the climate, that would be an economic reality, it's more efficient. Mr. Woods, uh, I would like to read a quote and I'd like to ask unanimous to consent to um, enter these into the records, uh, a series of articles from the LA Times, uh, Climate Action News and correspondence that myself and uh, Congressman Liu and uh, Mr. Welsh have all been part of with ExxonMobil. Um, Without ex exception. Mm -hmm. Thank you, we'll provide that information. So the quote from the LA Times article dated October 23rd, 2015, the headline is, how Exxon went from leader to skeptic on climate change research. Throughout much of the 1980s, quote, Exxon earned a public reputation as a pioneer in climate change research. It sponsored workshops, funded academic research, and conducted its own high-tech experiments, exploring the science behind global warming. But by 1990, the company in public took a different posture, Mr. Woods. While still funding select research, it poured millions into a campaign that questioned climate change over the next 15 years. It took out prominent ads in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, contending that climate change science was murky and uncertain, and it argued regulations aimed at curb it, curbing climate, global warming were ill-considered and premature. How did one of the world's largest oil companies, a leader in climate research, become one of its biggest skeptics? One of your employees, the manager of science and technology department, actually told the board in, the, in 1989 of the consequences of denial. Mr. Woods, would you work? In 2015, Mr. Welch, Mr. Liu, and I met in Mr. Liu's office with your representative, and we asked for a timeline and a response from you on these allegations. It's now 2021. Uh, we have asked repeatedly for this information from you to hear your side of the story while the litigation has gone on. We haven't gotten a response. Would you commit to me personally today to follow through and give us what your representative promised us six years ago? The gentleman's uh, time has expired, but the gentleman may answer the question. Congressman, I'm not aware of the request that you referenced, but we will uh, follow up with you. I'll, I'll commit to follow up with you. Well, it's a real comment that you're unaware of. It. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman yells back. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you to the many witnesses for being here today. Uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration published the Winter Fuels Outlook for the upcoming months and their forecast is grim. Half of Americans use natural gas to heat their homes, and they are projected to pay about 30% higher energy prices this winter compared to last. Depending on weather and demand, Americans could be paying almost, some estimates, 55 to 60% more to heat their homes and businesses than they were last year. Those that will be most affected by these outrageous energy prices will be low income wage earners and those on fixed incomes like our senior citizens. I would ask unanimous consent to include uh, the report into the record. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Crabtree, as a welder, what was your experience uh, when uh, you learned and when the Keystone pipeline was shut down and uh, do you know how many of your fellow uh, uh, em employees, uh, workers, lost their jobs? Well, at the time when the pipeline was shut down, it was in the early stages of construction, so it, it wasn't a lot. It's the fact that there were being 11,000 uh, union members working had that project been completed. But I know since uh, the new administration has uh, taken uh, about 80% of our members were without work during peak construction season this year. 
Well, how does that make you feel that the president of the United States said that you can't build a pipeline here in America, but allows the Russians to operate their Nord Stream Team 2 pipeline? Uh, well, it was definitely frustrating, to say the least. That's, that's about yeah, all I, I can say I, about that right now. I, I can't imagine. Um, and, and, you know, you, you've worked on pipelines and, and you know, you're, you're, you're welding and so forth. Um, you know, looking at the Nord Stream Team 2 pipeline, uh, do you believe that those foreign pipelines like that are better protecting our environment or better constructed than ones that we would build here in America, like the Keystone XL? No, no, absolutely not. You know, I'm a member of a union and we take the utmost pride in the construction and uh, the, the quality of work we put out. There's uh, there's plenty of projects here in the United States that could have been providing that same natural gas and uh, putting Americans to work. But instead, uh, we're letting uh, Russia take that. And I, I would think that you and, and our fellow Americans with the skills that you have can instruct a much safer and a much better pipeline than anybody else in the world. Uh, that's the absolute truth. Like I said, we take a lot of pride in the work we do. Absolutely. Uh, uh, there's no question that vital conservation efforts should be an American priority. It should also not be controversial to say that in all of the above domestic energy approach is good for our country. We cannot turn a blind eye to the realities of energy demand and the inability of renewables alone to heat our homes or fuel our vehicles and power our lives. The United States is already producing energy more cleanly and more efficiently than nations like Russia or China. Uh, would any of the witnesses like to speak on the ways in which American-made energy is already innovating without far-fetched government mandates? Congressman, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, you know, one of the greatest breakthroughs in technology in the last two decades in energy has been the ability to marry up two technologies which the industry had already used, which is directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing, which has allowed this country to become the leader in oil and gas production in the world once again after decades of decline. Uh, and so that's what's enabled the reductions in emissions uh, that have been cited earlier today, greater than a dozen countries combined around the world. It's what's reduced um, criteria pollutants in, in our economy and in our cities. And, um, and it's just one of many examples uh, of the innovation that goes on by the incredibly talented women and men in this industry across all the companies represented here today and many, many others who are uh, also part of a great American treasure, which is our energy economy. Th thank you, I appreciate that. Uh the, the other thing I, I would like to say is uh, no, knowing that, uh, and, and you know, uh, looking at what our great workers do in America and, and uh, so on, uh, China has pledged to achieve net zero emissions by 2060. I mean, do we really believe, is there anybody here that really believes that's a serious proposal? I mean, they're building more coal-fired plants now as we speak. You know, they're, they're increasing energy in in coal and so on. I, I just think I would I would really think that it, if we think that's a serious proposal, we take a second look at it. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Ocasio Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And you know, it's not lost on me that we are having a hearing today surrounding fossil fuel misinformation and disinformation campaigns on the same day that we are scheduled to vote on legislation that has been deeply influenced by the lobbying efforts of the fossil fuel industry. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to be speaking with the CEOs of BP, Chevron, Exxon Shell, and the American Petroleum Institute. Um, speaking of which, Mr. Sommers, as the president of the American Petroleum Institute, Part of your job is to help lobby and advocate and champion the fossil fuel industry. And that includes particularly in legislation before the United States Congress. You told CNN on television, quote, we are leaving everything on the field here in terms of our opposition to reconciliation. We are using every tool at our disposal to work against these energy proposals. And frankly, Mr. Somers, I appreciate your candor because most lobbying uh, organization heads aren't as forthright and transparent about their efforts to manipulate U.S. legislation. Um, 
So what does that all-out approach look like? Am I correct, Mr. Summers, that the oil and gas industry overall, including the companies that you represent and members you represent today, has spent about $55.6 million in lobbying in the, within the last 10 months this year alone. That, that figure sounds right to you, correct? Congresswoman, thank you for your question. But let me clarify something, first of all, about who the American Petroleum Institute is. Our mission, first of all, is that we're a standard-setting organization for the global oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. We maintain over 700 standards in the areas of health, environment, and safety. In addition to that, we advocate for the oil and Mr. gas Sommers, industry. Mr. Somers, is that figure 55.6 million in lobbying funds correct or not? I have limited time. Congresswoman, I don't have those numbers at okay. my disposal. Well, according to our disclosures, that seems to be the figure, but I, I will move on. Um, I would like to turn my attention to Mr. And I apologize, we just simply don't have much time allocated here. Uh, Mr. Woods, um, as a CEO of ExxonMobil, are you familiar with an individual by the name of Keith McCoy? I am. He was uh, one of your top lobbyists, correct? He was a senior advisor in our Washington office. I see. Now, earlier this year, McCoy was recorded in a private session as saying, quote, I liken lobbying to fishing. You have to bait. You throw that bait out there just to kind of reel members of Congress in because they are a captive audience. They know that they need you and I need them. And he also alluded to having weekly calls with certain members of Congress as debates around reconciliation were being formed. Uh, are you aware of these calls? I'm not aware of the calls. You are not aware of the calls. Have you participated in any calls with members of Congress throughout this process of uh, reconciliation and uh, infrastructure? I have. You have. Are political donations ever discussed during your calls with members of Congress? No, they're not. They are not. Does your compensation package increase as a result, the value of your compensation increase as a result of increased production from Exxon's refineries? No, volumes from our refineries are not part of my compensation. Is, Exxon stock, is your compensation tied to Exxon stock price? Yes, it is. It is. And so I would assume with increased value in Exxon stock price and oil production, that would have a boost in the value of your compensation, correct? My compensation is based on a number of metrics and parameters from environmental safety and value creation, technology development. It is a portfolio of responsibilities that the compensation committee judges me on. Thank you very much. You know, I think one thing that often gets lost in these conversations is that some of us have to actually live the future that you all are setting on fire for us. By 2028, crop yields are, be, are already projected to begin to fail, with famine beginning to hit the world's most vulnerable populations. By 2038, current US drought, fire, and extreme heat trends make, will, could potentially make whole regions of the United States unlivable if we continue the trends that lobbyists are trying to, to pers have us pursue. And we have a tipping point by 2036. We do not have the privilege or the luxury of lobbyist spin. And it is incredibly important that we don't reach net zero or in, in some imaginary future, but that we actually cut through to carbon emissions reductions here in the United States and globally. I, uh, I submit back to the chair. Back. Um, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Fallon. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> can you hear me? Um, we can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Being a child in the late 70s and early 80s, and I was fascinated with global and geopolitical events. And there was a, there was a dream back then that someday 
the United States could achieve energy independence. But see, at the time, there was, there were long gas lines, there was an oil embargo. And I remember people were worried and they were concerned and they were scared. But this dream that seemed more like a pipe dream, we're on the cusp of achieving it now, of American energy independence. And it, it, it's remarkable to me that this administration and our friends across the aisle seem to be intent on us fumbling that ball. And unfortunately and unwittingly, their efforts are emboldening our enemies by hamstringing our own energy industry. Canceling the Keystone Pipeline was a horrible idea. And the fact of the matter is, since 2000, the United States has been not only a leader in energy production in the world, but also in reducing CO2 emissions. And these are both remarkable achievements. And we should do everything in our power to continue to facilitate this kind of success. And the energy industry, let us not forget, is responsible for 10 million high paying jobs in this country. And it's also a national security issue. We had a few months back, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in um, Washington. And he talked to us about how he felt empowered as America's top diplomat on the world stage with foreign leaders because they wanted to engage with the United States. One of the primary and specific reasons was because of our abundance of fossil fuels. But some of the folks in Congress seem to be intent on us letting Venezuela and Iran and China and Russia, countries that aren't as committed to the safety, they don't have the, the protocols and the precautions and the procedures and the commitment to safety that we do in this country. That's why we should be exploring offshore and drilling Alaska and Keystone and the Keystone Pipeline because this country, when we produce energy, it's safer for the environment. It's better for everyone on the planet. And there is a definite moral case to be made for the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuels as a whole. In 1900, the life expectancy in this country was under 50 years of age, about 46. Now, before COVID, it was 79 years. That's 72% increase. And that's for all, all races and creeds are living longer today, primarily because of this industry. And our goal for everyone should be that human beings on this, not only in our country, but on the planet are allowed to live productive and meaningful lives. And if we want cleaner energy, we should unleash the expertise of the energy industry because they have shown and they've proven themselves to be innovators. And we had a committee hearing uh, demonizing the oil industry a few months back. And one of the witnesses then were saying about, we're gonna be judged in history. In fact, one of our colleagues just said that uh, made some very rather hyperbolic comments about how the future is being set on fire. But of course, you know, crying that the sky is gonna fall by 2028, these dire predictions won't come true. And in 2038, they won't come true, just like so many have in 2000 that said that Florida would be underwater by 2020. They're not. But we will be judged by our actions today, and we will be judged in history, just like so many of our folks in the Democratic majority that are going on wild, multi-trillion dollar deficit spending binges that they're saddling our future generations, our children, my children, my sons, with a crushing debt and forcing them into an, 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 an inevitable and untenable financial crisis. So if we want more abundant and inexpensive and cleaner energy, which we all should do, these witnesses here should be the ones that we are supporting and applauding and not demonizing. Madam Chair, thank you and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. You know, the issue here uh, is credibility. The oil companies, when they began producing oil, uh, discovering oil, uh, did not know about climate change. Uh, but they were the first to learn about it. And then learning about it concealed it uh, and denied it. Mr. Wood, uh, on June 6th of 1978, one of your excellent scientists, James Black, 
in the product research division, uh, circulated a presentation he had given to the management committee on the greenhouse effect. There is general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. That's a quote. In your leadership of Exxon, are you aware of what action was taken by the board after that report to it about the greenhouse effect was presented? My understanding, uh, Congressman, is that that report summarized the work of the broader scientific community uh, and uh, the full reading of that report is consistent with, with the broader community. And well, let me go on. There's research. others here. I, 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 as you know, I don't have that much time. In December 18 of 1980, Exxon employee Henry Shaw sent an internal memo saying, quote, an increase in the global average temperature of three degrees centigrade and uneven global distribution of increased rainfall in addition to some particularly dramatic questions that might cause series of global problems, such as melting of ice caps. Did Exxon, uh, to your knowledge, share that information, really crucial information, with the public at that time? Uh, I wasn't uh, working for the company at that time. And so you're not, aware, you're not aware my, that that information was made available? My understanding In November is we had 12th, no knowledge. Uh, we had no unique knowledge. We were basically Well, it, let, let me just go through this, because these are records from your own company, all right? Uh, these are not fake news. This is internal documents. Uh, Exxon's, on, on November 12th, 1982, MB Glazer Management of Environmental Affairs Program sent a memo to the Exxon management on the CO2 greenhouse effect saying CO2 release is the most likely source of inadvertent climate modification. And the prevailing opinion attributes CO2 increase to fossil fuel combustion. And finally, it said that mitigation of the greenhouse effect would require major reductions in fossil fuel combustion. Uh, did you disclose that to your shareholders? something that would be relevant to the value of your uh, strand, your assets? My understanding of those reports were a synthesis of publicly available information. No, I didn't ask that. I asked, did you disclose that to your shareholders in your report? That's my question. My understanding is it was summarized, it's a summarized. No, no, seriously. Version. I'm not asking what it is. I'm asking whether that information was disclosed in your shareholder reports. I'm yep. not familiar with my reports back at that All right. three, three in, years ago. In February 22, 1989, Dwayne Levine presented a report to the Board of Directors. He stated, quote, data confirm that greenhouse gases are increasing in the atmosphere and fossil fuels contribute most of the CO2. To your knowledge, did Exxon disclose that to its shareholders? We made all of our uh, research publicly available, Congressman. Was my that okay? I, I don't mean to be difficult because it's a simple question. Did you disclose it to shareholders? Yes, no, or I don't know. We made that research publicly available. Well, uh, consistent with the broader in, understanding. In, in May 6 of 1996, no nearly 20 years. Policy. Let me go on, please. Uh, Exxon's Lee Raymond stated in a speech to the Economic Club of Detroit, the scientific evidence is inconclusive as to whether human activities are having a significant effect on the global climate. Do you agree with that? At the, Congressman, our position taken at that, back in that time, as my understanding, was consistent with the general state of the scientific discussion. So you don't agree with Mr. Tillerson? And finally, well, on June 30th, 2021, Keith McCoy, who uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez asked you about, uh, acknowledged that Exxon has, quote, aggressively fought climate science, that they have joined, quote, shadow groups to work against some of the early efforts, and that Exxon's support of a carbon tax is purely, quote, a talking point. He said that Exxon's looking out for its investments. How is this knowledge that ExxonMobil had about the dramatic impact of fossil fuels and climate change any different than big tobacco knowing about smoking causing cancer but denying it and continued to peddling its product? Explain to me the difference. Well, as I said at the time, Mr. McCoy's statement did not represent our policy. 
or our approach with respect to uh, our positions in this space. And the distinction between what the Exxon knew and what Big Tobacco knew uh, but didn't reveal all, all of the our difference work was is pu made publicly available. Our research was pu publicly available, and it was consistent and relied uh, largely on outside uh, work. We were part of the broader scientific community uh, working in this space, and we had no unique views. Well, uh, thank you. My time is up, and I yield back. The, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Clyde, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I've noticed a trend going on here of holding hearings on legislation that has already passed the House, such as uh, you did with H.R. 3755, the Abortion on Demand Bill, and the Equal Rights Amendment. As with that trend, I've begun to pick up on another trend that we're setting, and unfortunately, this one is more disturbing. The new trend is that this committee continues to use, or rather, should I say, continues to abuse its power to conduct oversight into the private activities of private citizens and private companies, which ultimately results in nothing more than one big public shaming campaign. In my 10 months here in this committee, I have been made aware that my Democrat colleagues have leveraged both letters and subpoena threats to either compel private entities to appear before the committee or to hand over privileged and, mind you, protected materials for the committee's staff to ransack. In this congressional session alone, we've seen this committee engage in this manner with Cyber Ninjas, the National Football League, the Sackler family, and now we're seeing them do it to the companies before us today. This committee used to be called the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. It is now just called the Committee on Oversight and Reform. The day the majority choose to remove government from this committee's title was a big red flag to all. That House Democrats might truly believe their authorities go beyond the four corners of the United States Constitution. This committee should focus its oversight activities and investigation on government operations, not inject itself into private operations. To our witnesses, I want all of you to know that I support an all-in approach to ensure our nation is energy independent. History is no stranger to the energy crisis we're experiencing today, as once thriving towns and cities shuddered when the main driving force of the economy, the coal mines, closed. We are now seeing this chilling effect, particularly in the oil and gas realm, happen on a macro scale ever since President Biden enacted by executive fiat his green policies. Such is evident when President Biden chose to shut down the Keystone XL pipeline on his first day in office a decision that resulted in hundreds of people losing out on good paying jobs and that seriously undercut our nation's ability to be energy independent and a net energy exporter. And to add salt to an open wound, President Biden immediately greenlighted Russia's Nord Stream 2 pipeline when he chose to withdraw sanctions in May. The president's energy policy simply does not make sense. He demands we decrease domestic production, yet he pleads for OPEC to increase their production. OPEC refused, and this disparity in supply became the cause of skyrocketing gas prices Americans are seeing at the pump. Hardworking people and families are paying the price for these terrible energy policies, and seniors and families on fixed incomes especially are at risk of losing their homes and are being forced to choose between heating their homes or putting food on the table. And that's even before President Biden's proposed heating tax found in his absurd big government socialism spending bill called budget reconciliation. It's shameful, but again, you all have not been called here today to help us conduct oversight of the Biden administration's policies. No, you've been called here so my colleagues on the other side of the aisle can drag you through the mud. My first question is for Mr. Summers of the Petroleum Institute. Given the energy crisis, Mr. Summers, um, of countries in the EU and Asia, what they are currently experiencing, that many, many may argue that that is a direct result of pressures to prematurely divest from reliable fossil fuel development. How can the United States avoid a similar fate as the EU and Asia is experiencing, sir? Congressman, thank you for your question. I do think that the, there is a flashing warning sign in uh, Europe right now, as energy prices continue to go up, it is mainly a consequence of a lack of supply. And uh, they're going to continue to need more energy as their economy grows. 
Another major concern that Europe should have is that one of the reasons why natural gas prices in particular have gone up is because Russia has decided not to export natural gas to the EU during this critical time. It is, I think, a real warning for American consumers in the world that if you don't create your own supply at home, you're dependent on supplies from regimes that aren't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily have your interests at heart. And I think the Europeans and other parts of the world are finding out the importance of creating supply to ensure that we have access to affordable and reliable energy for decades and decades to come here in this country. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I will note that uh, our adversaries are very capable of using energy as a weapon, Russia. And, and we have done nothing but help them when we have green-lighted the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you for being here today. Your companies all claim to have net zero ambitions. And since you all claim to support the Paris Agreement, then you should have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. But the record seems to suggest that the companies represented here have a long way to go to get there. Ms. Watkins, in its February 2021 energy transition strategy, Shell said, and I quote, aligned with the more ambitious goals of the Paris Agreement to limit the average global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Is that correct? That is the ambition of the Paris Agreement. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Shell said it aims to become a net zero energy business by 2050 and has set goals to cut the carbon content of its products by 20% by 2030 to phase out carbon emissions by 2050. Is that correct? Net zero by 2050 is correct. Yeah, and we just announced today uh, a goal to cut our scope one and two um, emissions of, by half by 2030. And why does the independent analysis find that Shell's net zero pledge fails to meet the Paris Agreement goals? I'm sorry, Congresswoman, I'm not familiar with the independent analysis that you're talking about. But what I can say is that the company I work for is absolutely committed to these goals that we've put out there. Um, my compensation is directly uh, linked to that. Um, and we look forward to continuing to, to accelerate the energy transition in collaboration with folks like yourself, uh, the government, with our customers, with segments of the industry. Um, this is something that we can't do alone as one company. Uh, it really needs to be done in collaboration with society and with with the government. Okay. Yeah, I, from what I was reading, uh, it says Shell's strategy only decreases oil production by 1% to 2% annually through 2030, while it increases gas production 4% over the same time period. And according to the 2021 United Nations Production Gap Report, the world must decrease oil production by 4% and gas production by 3% annually uh, between 2020 and 2030 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And over a 10-year period, this would equate to a 50% increase in gas production for Shell compared to the nearly 30% decline we need to reach the goals scientists say are necessary to limit the most dangerous impacts of climate change. And then earlier this year, Shell appealed an order by a Dutch court to cut emissions by 45% by 2030. And so can you tell me, um, does Shell plan to comply with the court order to cut emissions by 45% by 2030? You can just say yes or no. Congresswoman, one of the reasons we put out the goal we put out today is because we see an opportunity to accelerate our powering progress strategy. And so cutting our scope one and two emissions by half by 2030 um, is a new target. I'm very proud of my company for, for being um, so, aggressive. So is that a yes or no? We are I'm, just, in the I'm, I'm just asking you yes and no, because I don't have a lot of time, that's all. We are in the process of appealing the Dutch court order. And so uh, while we are in action to get to net zero by 2050, and we have many targets between now and then to hit, uh, we are appealing the court order because we don't think the courts is the right place to decide this. So it sounds like uh, even though Shell's transition strategy calls for cutting emissions by 2030, the company is resisting efforts to get there. 
And is that because Shell's transition strategy to reduce the intensity of its carbon output from oil production relies in part on Shell increasing its gas productions? Is that correct? Congresswoman, I would say that I have a different way of putting that. We are not resisting. In fact, we are embracing the opportunity to transition faster, which is why we're working to increase the demand for low and no carbon fuels. So that, that's actually how I would characterize it as uh, embracing the energy transition. So you can't characterize it as a yes or no then, um, because experts warn this plan will backslide further to mere operational efficiency rather than reducing the overall climate burden of your products. So again, yes or no, will Shell commit to reducing gas production as part of its emissions reduction plans, uh, Ms. Watkins? Congresswoman, we've committed to a number of things and we believe natural gas plays a key role as a transition fuel um, in order to continue to lower emissions for the, uh, for the country. Um, and so we are committed to providing that that clean burning, um, cleaner burning fuel um, for the world. Um, so we're committed to natural gas over time, but we're also very much committed to continuing to work with our customers to look at no carbon fuels, such as wind and solar. Uh, we're building wind turbines off the coast of New Jersey and Massachusetts, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to do that, but the demand needs to be there. That's good to hear that you're looking, uh, but a lot of things you're saying are not supported by evidence. So. It shows that it's time for Congress to act, and we can begin by passing the Build Back Better Act to combat climate change and spur the development of renewables. And I yield back. I know my time's up. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, is recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Madam Chair. I've uh, been in and out of this hearing, but I heard the opening statements uh, and listened to a good deal of the questioning of this morning. And I will tell you that. Um, uh, if there's one thing that I hope those leading these, uh, uh, these very important energy companies and the Petroleum Institute understand is that uh, you've, you've kind of got yourself here, you've seen the attitude, you've heard the attitude from the folks on the left in this committee. It's because of your appeasement. That's what it is. So when, when you get asked this morning about aren't you embarrassed that's, a, that's really kind of an irrational question to ask CEOs about their company policy. To ask and to vilify you and basically say, will you repudiate your membership in an, uh, uh, a manufacturing institute to then say and repeatedly ask the question and to badger you? That's because you have been appeasing. I'm not saying that you shouldn't um, do your best to reduce uh, carbon emissions and, and run a clean uh, company. I'm saying that you've been brought here so they could beat the crap out of you. That's what this, this is all about. And they're doing it for a political reason. And that's the shame of it all. This is a hearing where the Democrats attack American workers and the private sector. The President and his allies in Congress have consistently advocated for policies that have led to higher energy prices and increased inflation. In fact, in fact though, uh, you've got Ron Klain retweeting this, he's the chief of staff at the White House saying, most of the economic problems we're facing, inflation, et cetera, are high class problems. Well, even the New York Times has said, this year's Thanksgiving feast will wallop the wallet. And that's a result of Biden's policies. And part of those policies are to put the screws on the energy industry. Some of the inflation is systemic, but some of it is driven by scarcity, just economic market driven principles. So I hope you get the lesson, because if nothing else I say matters, I think you need to know something. These folks would regulate you right out of business tomorrow if they could. Don't pretend otherwise. No matter how good a corporate citizen you are, or how sincere you are in trying to reduce carbon emissions, that's the purpose of this hearing today, to lay the foundation to get rid of you. And at the same time, you see the hypocrisy or inconsistency of this administration. Here's one dated today, this very morning. You've got, you've got Amos Hochstein, the U.S. State Department Senior Advisor for Energy Security, saying energy producers, particularly OPEC, should be increasing its output. Here's one from two weeks ago. U.S. worried energy supply is not meeting demand. That is where we're headed in the future. 
what you do is important. Never forget it's important. At the same time, you got the Biden administration stopping, issuing new oil and gas leases for drilling on federal land, canceling the Keystone Pipeline within hours of taking office, and then removing sanctions on Russia's Nord Stream 2 pipeline, increasing Europe's dependence on Russian oil. We hear this from Mikhail I. Kruchikin, an energy analyst at the consultancy Russ Energy, saying, quote, we decided... We'll let them freeze a good bit this winter, and then they'll become more talkative and won't insist on quickly abandoning gas. The stakes are very high. This is a high-stakes game. The Russians get it. You get it. My colleagues across the aisle don't get it. Congressional Democrats' proposals for fixing the problem they caused are worse than President Biden's. Their tax and spend budget reconciliation bill will increase energy prices and cripple the American economy. With gas prices at a seven-year high, Democrats in Congress are considering enacting a carbon tax to pay for their socialist policies. They love, they love to support, to tout their support of the Green New Deal, claiming that it is the only way to fight climate change. However, it excludes nuclear energy. Despite the fact that nuclear energy is carbon-free, low-cost, and is a reliable energy source. A Democrat member's former chief of staff, Saikit Chakrabarty, stated, quote, the interesting thing about the Green New Deal is it wasn't originally a climate change thing at all because we really think of it as a how do you change the entire economy thing, close quote. He told the truth. Occasionally you're going to get that out. I urge you, continue being good corporate citizens, but understand appeasement will lead to the demise of your industry and your company, which will result in thousands and hundreds of thousands of people losing work and living in a poverty, in an impoverished state. And Madam Chair, I have a number of, of articles I would like to submit for the record. Without objection. Um, I have uh, one called Oil Eases with U.S. Urging Producers to Ramp Up Supplies, dated today's date. Um, I have one uh, dated from Reuters, dated October 7th, U.S. Worried Energy Supply Not Meeting Demand, Top Biden Advisor Says. Then I have uh, additional ones. Let's see here. We got. As Europe faces a cold winter, Putin, Putin seizes on the leverage from Russia's gas habit from the New York Times dated yesterday. The, the gentleman's time has expired. We will submit all the articles you would like into the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for holding this hearing. And let me thank all of our witnesses for being here and being with us today. Uh, Mr. Woods, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your company's position on carbon pricing. Exxon's lobbying website states, and I quote, without exception, the company's lobbying efforts are aligned with its publicly available positions. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, your, this reflects and refers to carbon pricing on carbon taxes. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? It, it relates to carbon pricing or carbon taxes. Is that correct? We, we do advocate for a, a carbon tax or a, car, a price on carbon, yes. So is it fair to say that Exxon has taken a public position in support of a price on carbon? Yes. I ask because committee staff reviewed Exxon's lobbying reports along with those of other companies. And the committee's analysis found that since 2011, Exxon and its lobbyists have filed 344 reports involving lobbying on tax legislation or tax policy. Does this figure sound about right to you? I'm not, a, I don't have those numbers available to me. All right. Well, according to your company's filing, these lobbying efforts focused on a variety of legislative and policy issues including protecting oil and gas tax breaks and preserving the corporate tax benefits 
in President Trump's signature tax spending bill. Since 2011, 46 bills have been introduced in the House and the Senate to deal with carbon pricing. Mr. Woods, would you take a guess at the number of Exxon's lobbying reports during this time that referenced a tax or price on carbon? I haven't seen the report, so I, I, I don't know what, what that number would be. Well, thank you. Our information says that 12, and that Exxon reported only 12 instances of lobbying on federal legislation that would tax our price carbon. Um, Mr. Woods, your company's lack of action on an issue it says it supports sends a rather interesting signal. And this goes for all the organizations represented here today. Over the last decade, decade Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, API, and their outside lobbyists filed nearly 6,000 lobbying reports. The committee identified only 34 times that these companies and API reported lobbying on any of the bills that address carbon pricing. Meanwhile, they lobbied 77 times just on President Trump's tax cuts. If you do the math, it pretty much means that Exxon, Chevron, BP, Shell, and API reported lobbying 150 times more frequently to carve out corporate giveaways in President Trump's tax cuts and job action than on all carbon pricing legislation. So if it wasn't for the analysis that the committee released today, none of us sitting here would know what their pledges and that their pledges don't hold up under scrutiny. So I thank you for your answers and, and appreciate your being here. And Madam Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Laterna, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Climate change is an issue that we need to be serious about addressing properly. The concern of this committee today, however, is climate misinformation. As it turns out, there's a lot of misinformation surrounding the energy crisis facing our nation. The truth is, Americans are experiencing the highest gas prices since the Obama administration. Record high inflation and spiking natural gas prices as we approach the coldest months of the year. It's no secret that as energy prices skyrocket, the cost to ship goods and keep the lights on for manufacturers goes up. And that increased cost is then passed down to the consumer. According to the Wall Street Journal's Market Watch, the latest monthly numbers indicate a 5.3% increase in the consumer price index. In my home state of Kansas, farmers have to pay, pay, have to pay for this administration's short-sighted and counterproductive policies in the form of record high fertilizer prices, which have surpassed even the previous peaks of the 2008 global financial crisis. Instead, of combating this crisis, the White House has doubled down on progressive policies that created this perfect storm of inflation in the first place and forced hardworking Americans to dig deeper into their pockets to pick up the tab. It's misinformation to suggest that these rising prices and taxes are a necessary evil in achieving our long-term environmental goals, especially when the U.S. is forced to outsource our crude oil and raw materials from countries with less stringent emission standards than us. This, the administration's policies also undermine our energy independence. The White House could have made it easier for American companies to increase domestic production and hire more U.S. workers. But instead, the President begged OPEC and Russia to increase global output to combat the spiking fuel prices. Dependence on Russia and China to fuel our country's base load and power our electric grid is a national security threat and does nothing to mitigate carbon emissions globally. 
Some of my colleagues seem to think it's impossible to have both affordable, bountiful, and innovative energy while also having clean air and water. That is simply not true. Oil and gas produced here in America is among the cleanest and safest in the world. The United States has been a world leader in reducing carbon emissions over the past two decades without socialist policies or complete reliance on inconsistent sources like wind and solar. The data proves that the private sector is tackling climate change without burdensome federal regulation, and Congress should continue to allow them to do so. Mr. Summers, can you describe some of the ways that the Green New Deal policies, particularly included in the reconciliation proposal, would affect your industry? Congressman, thank you for your question. We as an industry uh, have taken on the climate challenge. And in fact, API released earlier this year our Climate Action Framework, which is a five-step plan to address the climate challenge as an industry. That includes three of those actions are actually things that we're going to do even if Congress doesn't act on climate change in this Congress or in the future. Because we know it is a challenge, and we know it has to be addressed, and we know that this industry has the technological know-how and the engineers uh, in place and the scientists and geologists in place who can tackle this challenge from the private sector. Notwithstanding that, we do believe that Congress should also act on climate change. And because we disagree with some of the provisions in the reconcilia reconciliation package, doesn't mean that we don't take climate change seriously. We do have some concerns about what is currently in the package, and we've worked to educate lawmakers on those concerns. One of the concerns that we have is the proposal of a natural gas tax that would potentially increase costs on consumers during a time when energy prices are already spiking. One of the original proposals also included a clean energy performance pl payment plan that did not include natural gas. As we've talked about earlier in this hearing, one of the real reasons that we've been able to cut emissions over time is because of natural gas. We need to continue to incentivize that fuel switch from coal to natural gas so that we can continue on that road to progress of cutting U.S. emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we all know, Congress and President Biden are hard at work to pass the Build Back Better Act to take bold, aggressive, and long overdue action on climate change. But many of the witnesses today vigorously oppose key climate provisions in the Build Back Better Act. I find that offensive being from ground zero in the state of Florida where climate change and its impact is not a someday thing, it's a right now thing. Um, and according to Influence Map, for example, BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, and Chevron collectively spend more than $150 million every year on lobbying and policy influence activities. And, but they do this to protect their trillions of dollars in revenues. Ms. Clark, my, my first question is for you. How much has the Chamber of Commerce spent to defeat the Build Back Better Act? Sorry, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Well, give me a ballpark. I really, I really couldn't. You have no idea how much the Chamber of Commerce has spent on lobbying targeted at the Build Back Better Act? No, I don't. Um, you're not doing your job very well if you don't know that answer, but I'll just give you an idea. Just in September, the Chamber launched a six-figure ad campaign just to pressure House Democrats to try to vote down the, recon the, the reconciliation package. And, you know, for a while, the Chamber actually participated in House GOP leadership strategy calls to defeat the reconciliation package. Perhaps you weren't aware of that either, um, but that's that's something that that actually happened. Um, you really, the, the Chamber released a statement earlier this month that said that the Chamber is continuing and expanding its efforts to defeat the reconciliation bill and opposes efforts to link the infrastructure bill to the reconciliation bill. That's just grossly irresponsible and 
what you should be doing is working towards trying to find compromise, not just spending millions of dollars to defeat something and work against our progress on climate change, uh, on addressing the climate, climate change issue. Mr. Summers, what about the American Petroleum Institute? What did API spend to defeat the Build Back Better Act? Congresswoman, we've worked to influence the process, particularly on issues that would right. affect and, and oil I, and gas. Right, and I'm my time. My question is, to the tune of how much money? Congresswoman, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips. Yeah, I, I, I assumed you would answer that, you, you would answer that way. Um, but let me just illuminate things for uh, folks listening to this. API used its front group, Energy Citizens, to flood Facebook with hundreds of ads in 140 congressional districts aimed at in opposition to the reconciliation package. Here's a bewildering example of hypocrisy. The Build Back Better Act contains provisions to tackle, for example, methane pollution from oil and natural gas production, which API claims to support the reduction of methane emissions. Yet API and its front group, Energy Citizens, have carried out a seven-figure TV and internet ad campaign to defeat the Build Back Better methane emissions fee. Mr. Summers, how do you reconcile your group's claims to support reducing methane emissions with your opposition to build back better provisions that address methane emissions? Thank you for your question, Congresswoman. In fact, the American Petroleum Institute supports the federal regulation of methane for both new and existing sources. We expect the new regulation to come out soon uh, from the Biden administration, and we've been working with them on making sure that that regulation makes sense. Uh, and that it's reducing methane emissions over time. Reclaiming my time. This industry. I'm sorry. Reclaiming my time. Um, except you're opposing the reduction policies on methane emissions in the Build Back Better Act, which is the proposal of the Biden administration. So you're either lying about your support for reducing methane emissions, or you're working against yourself. Which, which makes no sense and certainly isn't money well spent by your institution. Um, Respectfully, Summers, Congresswoman. Uh, no, the, the time is mine. Thank you. Um, Mr. Woods, your, your company is a member of API, for example, and API actively lobbies to crush good clim climate policies, as I've just illuminated. Uh, your, your own former senior director of federal relations admitted use use groups like API to take the tough questions and be a, quote, whipping boy during congressional hearings. How can you tell us with a straight face that you're part of the solution to climate change when you're part of the lobbying effort to stifle policies to fight climate change? Well, as, as I said shortly after that interview was released that uh, that characterization offered up was incorrect and did not reflect the position that our company's taken or the philosophy that we take. Yeah, Mr. Woods, you can say what you want about climate change, but words matter, uh, actions matter more. And this hearing illustrates the problems we face. Industry players talk out of both sides of their mouths. Big, bo big oil may talk about climate change and emission reductions and put shiny, polished, green-colored ads on TV, telling Americans they're part of the solution. But when President Biden and congressional Democrats try to advance solutions to actually fight the climate crisis, the fossil fuel industry reaches into its deep pockets to kill these common sense solutions. You're no better than big tobacco in the 90s. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Johnson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Woods, ExxonMobil Corporation now publicly acknowledges the climate crisis while privately funding organizations that promote climate denial or misinformation. Isn't it true that between 1998 and, two, and 2017, ExxonMobil Corporation spent $36 million with think tanks promoting climate denial? I can't comment on uh, the figure that you've offered up, but I would tell you that our position that we've taken- Well, you, you, would, you, would not, you would not disagree with that amount, would you? I don't have the number, so I can't confirm or deny the amount. What I would tell you is the position that we take with the groups we work with is consistent with the position that we take publicly. We Which don't have to be deny climate to change is being connected with CO2 commissions, emissions, correct? Pardon? I'm sorry, I missed your question. Yeah, you, you, you spent a lot of money to get across the false point that CO2 emissions, emissions do not 
impact climate. No, I, I don't agree with that characterization. We do not spend money. We have long acknowledged the linkage between CO2 emissions and the risk of climate change. Well, let me we ask have, you this question. Uh, back in 1979, Exxon Mobil commissioned a groundbreaking study that discovered that fossil fuels released carbon emissions that would, quote, endanger humanity, end quote. However, isn't it true, Mr. Woods, that no operational changes were made to respond to the horrifying findings that the company's business operations and products were endangering humanity? Congressman, I, we did, I'm not aware of any unique understanding that we had in the science. We engaged with the broader community uh, and worked with them to advance our own understanding. And as time passed and scientific understanding evolved, so did our position in the approach that we took to addressing uh, emissions. Well, let me ask you this question, sir. The American Petroleum Institute has known since as early as 1957 that carbon emissions were dangerously warming the atmosphere. And multiple studies published by ExxonMobil and BP found similar results in subsequent years only to be publicized for the first time in 2015 and 2018, respectively. Uh, Mr. Uh, Woods, when did you first learn that CO2 emissions cause climate change? Our company from uh, the very early days have worked with the outside uh, scientific group and our understanding our, and our public position has been consistent with that understanding. Well, let me, well, let me ask, ask Mr. Lawler the question. Mr. Lawler, when did you first learn that uh, CO2 emissions cause climate change? Thank you for the question. So uh, BP was aware uh, early on, very early on, it that was there was... Before 20, was it before 20... Uh, I would say before, before even in the 90s and 80s, we were aware of reports uh, that were out there. There was a lot of science. There was a lot of debate that was published during that time period. But I would say that BP focused on the, the landmark IPCC uh, study in 1996. And in 1997, our then CEO, John Brown, acknowledged that the, the scientific community uh, well, uh, well, I, I, I want to break in right here. Research shows that between 2010 and 2018, only 2.3 percent of your investments per capita, per capital expenditures, went to low carbon energies. Is that true? Yes, sir. It's true. But what I would say is and that, and isn't it also true, Mr. Lawler, that BP earned 183.5 billion dollars in 2020? Um, I'd have to check that figure. I know in uh, well, that means 20... you could not tell me how much of that one hundred and eighty three point five billion dollars was reinvested in clean energy production. Well, are, are you speaking to revenue or or profit? Um, th that number seems how we we. Well, you uh, would know better than I. Well, we we you, had a you four... actually profited one hundred and eighty three point five billion dollars in twenty twenty. Well, we had uh, something called a. Rec replacement cost profit uh, of around four to five billion in 2020. Well, my question is how much of that was reinvested in clean energy production? So in the last two years, we've spent $2 billion on clean energy projects. Two billion out of one, uh, out of 183.5 billion. For the, for the people suffering from the impacts of wildfires, floods and hurricanes right now, 30 years is too long to wait for your company to change. How do you square the reality of facts on the ground with your 2050 date to decrease carbon emissions? Congressman, I have a project that I can share with you right now that's amazing. We've installed a 300 megawatt solar facility that's powering the only steel mill in the world with green energy. We are in action. We spent 1.1 billion to join an offshore wind farm just offshore New York. We'll spend billions behind that. And we are in action. We have very clear targets. And again, we have stepped forward that we would be reducing our overall production, our absolute production on a worldwide basis by 40% by the year 2030. So we are and in we action. Can't wait. The, the can't gentleman's wait. time has expired. And uh, the gentleman may continue answering the question, but his time has expired. 
Uh, I would just add, Congressman, that we do have near-term targets uh, that are significant to cut methane, to cut emissions. 15% of our executive compensation pay is linked to sustainable emissions reductions. And I can just assure you that we're sincere, we're in motion, and we're, we're taking action on a number of projects. And again, by 2025, we'll be spending three to four billion dollars, five billion in 2030. So we are sincere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank okay. You. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Maloney. We must treat this climate crisis like lives de depend on it because they quite literally do. In my district, the Massachusetts Seventh, the sea level rise caused by an increase in global temperatures, which is a direct result of the continued operations of the oil and gas. Uh, companies before this committee will destabilize families and sink entire communities. From Cambridge and Chelsea to the Fenway and East Boston, my constituents are living in regions that will be completely underwater if we do not take bold action to transition to 100% renewable zero emission energy sources as outlined in the Green New Deal. And as I fight for the livelihoods of my neighbors, I'm clear eyed that my opposition is the massive lobbying campaign by the billion dollar corporations appearing before this committee today. Your companies invest hundreds of millions of dollars in lobbying efforts each year, some of which is disclosed and reported. But the truth is, these amounts represent only a fraction of what is actually spent against our efforts to save lives and our planet. We know a key part of Big Oil's disinformation campaign is funding and backing so-called shadow groups to fight against our climate justice efforts. Shadow groups are think tanks, pressure organizations, and other groups who receive funding from industry to engage in advocacy the industry doesn't want its fingerprints on. Mr. Woods, after your former lobbyist admitted joining shadow groups to undermine efforts on climate, Exxon stated that his comments were, quote, entirely inconsistent, unquote, with your company's work. Mr. Woods, do you stand by that statement, yes or no? Yes, I do. Mr. Woods, is it your testimony that Exxon has not at any point funded any think tanks, advocacy organizations, or other shadow groups against climate change efforts, yes or no? The position we take is transparent and we publish the groups that we support on our website. Well, 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 whatever your statements are now, I think, you know, the truth is, uh, is clear here that for years, Exxon has funded dozens of these shadow groups, like the Heartland Institute, for example, a leading climate science denial group, which has stated that global warming is actually good for the planet. Mr. Woods, do you commit right here to stop funding organizations that reject the science of climate change, yes or no? We do not support the Heartland group, so... Yes or no? Do you commit right here to not fund organizations that reject the science of climate change? We do not support climate denial. We do not ask people to uh, lobby anything different than our publicly supported position or uh, expressed position. With millions of dollars that are going to lobby as super PACs and shadow groups, these corporations refuse to invest in their own workers to ensure they have a future in a renewable energy economy. A just transition from pollution-based profits to healthy green living means that no worker will be left behind. Mr. Woods, what percentage of ExxonMobil's annual revenue is being used to train your workers for jobs in renewable energy sectors? What percentage? We are focused on making sure that our workforce is capable of uh, operating our current operations, and we are investing uh, uh, time and, and resources I'm, I'm in sorry, developing new time. solutions. I'm, I'm going to reclaim my time since you weren't providing um, a percentage. So uh, will you commit to providing this committee with the documentation to this answer? We'll work with you to give you what you need. All right. Mr. Worth, what percentage of Chevron annual revenue is being used to train your workers for jobs in renewable energy sectors? Congressman, I don't have uh, a number on that. I can tell you we're committed to uh, meeting the needs of the world today and the future. And our, and our workforce is prepared I'm, to do that. I'm sorry, I'm going to run out of time. Will you commit to providing this committee with the documentation on this answer? We will work with the committee to provide responses. All right. Ms. Watkins, what percentage of Shell's annual revenue is being used to train your workers for jobs in renewable energy sectors? 
Congresswoman, I don't have a number, but I will be happy to work with you to, to get one. What I can say is that what we're finding is that we have engineers that have built offshore oil and gas platforms in the Gulf. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're now able to I'm going to run out of time, but thank you for that commitment to work with the committee. Uh, Mr. Lawler, what percentage of BP America's annual revenue is being used to train your workers for jobs in renewable energy sectors? I'll need to review what that number is, but what I can say, we're creating entire business units for the renewable sector, entire business units, spending up to $5 billion a year by 2030. Will you work with the committee to provide us with those actual percentages? Yes, we will. Okay. So I think the point here is that putting profits before people like those in my district and the workers in their very own companies is the reason this crisis is so dire. One climate scientist said, quote, what we do in the next 10 years will matter for 10,000 years, unquote. I believe that what we do in the next 10 days on infrastructure investments will be the true predictor of our planet's future. The Build Back Better Act is a climate justice bill and a workers justice bill. We can and we must act with urgency. Thank you and I yield back. Okay. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Summers, what do you predict the global demand for oil will be as the United States and the world recover from the coronavirus pandemic? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. What we're already starting to see, as I mentioned in a previous answer, is that world oil demand uh, has already ri risen significantly. Uh, Pre-pandemic, so in 2019, the world was consuming 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Uh, during the worst part of the pandemic in April of 2020, the world consumed about 81 million barrels of oil every single day. Uh, we are close back now to the 100 million uh, barrel of oil use uh, every single day. So, uh, and as the economy continues to grow, we expect that to expand as well. So if, if the industry does, as some of my Democrat colleagues have suggested and, and uh, asked you to pledge to cut production, what would that do to the price of oil for everyday working Americans well, if, the, if the demand is going up? Congressman, we're already starting to see that, um, you know, because of worker shortages, because of uh, concerns about future and current government uh, regulations. Because of the Biden uh, policies, because of the Biden energy policy is why we're seeing energy prices go up. And what my colleagues on the left are proposing is only going to make it make it worse. Uh, sir, despite some of the rhetoric from your critics, the oil and gas industry has taken meaningful steps to reduce emissions from operations. Can you describe briefly some of the efforts underway and some of the planned industry initiatives to address this challenge head on? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. The American Petroleum Institute since 2017 has uh, uh, had a program called the Environmental Partnership. This is a, a program that uh, is all about how do you reduce methane emissions within our own operations. This program has seen tremendous success. Uh, it is a program that primarily works with uh, our member companies and non-member API companies to replace uh, uh, products within the oil and gas industry that are leading to methane emissions. And as a consequence of this, we have big operators and small operators working together uh, to ensure that our me methane emissions continue to go down. In fact, uh, as a consequence of this program and other programs like it, we've been able to reduce methane emissions by 70% in, in five of the largest uh, oil and gas producing regions mm -hmm. like the Permian Basin. Yeah. Uh, we're proud of the work that we have done, and we know that we have to continue that work to respond to uh, consumers that want to make sure that their uh, uh, energy continues to come affordably, reliably, but also cleaner. Absolutely. And, and that gets lost in translation. The industry's made significant investment already. You plan on making significant investments in the future. Uh, we're seeing uh, a reduction in emissions. And uh, I think that that has been lost in translation with the rhetoric on the other side. Now, in a briefly, uh, I'm going to shift gears. Mr. Crabtree, you, you are a member of the union, right? Uh, yes, Congressman. So when, when uh, you know, a few years ago when I started out in the Kentucky State House of Representatives, the union was, was pretty Democrat, but I've seen in Kentucky the, uh, 
the union, especially the United Mine Workers, and, and so many other unions that have been just devastated and put out of work by Democrat policy starting with the Obama administration. And now we see uh, your union put out of work uh, because of the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, what, what's the what's the general thinking now with uh, with the policy from the Democrat Party with respect to energy production in the United States? Well, I mean, it's always been in my opinion that I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, I'm going to vote for who's going to put me to work. And right now, uh, uh, the president has decided to put us out of work. So, of course, I, I'm not going to support him. I was. Uh, I wish that President Trump could have won re-election. Uh, that's an honest statement. Well, I think a lot of people share that, uh, share your sentiment. But my, my last question to you, sir, if the United States went totally green tomorrow, as some of my colleagues on the left uh, dream about, and eliminated all oil and gas jobs, would Americans be able to power their homes or get their families to work or school? I, I think you know the answer to that question, Congressman. I, I know I it, but I don't think, think my friends on the left here know it, so maybe live. you I mean, can answer so that for them. There's so many things that we use that are made from petroleum products. It's just I can't conceive living in a world where we're going to be carbon neutral or free. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Bush, is recognized for five minutes. And Lewis and I thank you, Chairs Maloney and Tana, for convening this timely hearing. Thanks in large part to those testifying today and the corporations they represent. St. Louis has 11 more 90 degree days per year than when I was born. Mr. Lawler, are the overwhelming majority of fossil fuel CEOs black or white? You no, I don't. I don't have the the exact numbers, but I would assume they're white. Yes, Ms. Watkins, is an oil refinery more likely to be situated in a black community or a white community? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that, honestly. Um, we've got oil refineries um, along the U.S. Gulf Coast, and we're very proud to be community members there. Well, it's black. Yeah, it's, it's black. Mr. Wirt, are the impacts of climate change more likely to hit a black neighborhood or a white neighborhood first? Congresswoman, I uh, have not seen studies that would allow me to give you a... a... The, an the answer is black. Um, the facts are clear. A 2017 NAACP and Clean Air Tax Force uh, report found that Black Americans are 75% more likely to live next to company, industrial, and service facilities that directly harm us. For years, you all have continued to promote fossil fuels despite knowing that promoting them means promoting environmental racism and violence in Black and brown communities. You all are still promoting and selling fossil fuels that are killing millions of people. This is a striking example of white supremacy. Your profit-driven choices threaten my life, the lives of my family, my neighbors, and our communities every single day. I sit before you as a Black congresswoman with asthma caused by fossil fuels and the tear gas you fund. I have a lot of questions, let me say. Mr. Woods, as CEO, are you responsible for what Exxon does, yes or no? It's just a yes or no. For what Exxon Mobil does, yes, I am. The an Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, it's not a coincidence that toxic waste is frequently dumped in Black communities like mine. When toxic waste combines with fossil fuel flooding, the impact is unspeakable. My old basement in St. Louis County in a predominantly Black neighborhood used to regularly fill with potential, uh, potentially radio radioactive waste next to my son's bedroom due to floods made more frequent and intense by your production and burning of fossil fuels. Public school playgrounds in St. Louis regularly flood with radioactive water. Mr. Woods, would you send your children to one of these schools? Yes or no? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Would you send your, you, would you send your children to one of the schools where radioactive waste, where we have um, this flooding? Um, no, this? Thank you. I would not. Thank you, thank you. I, and I don't want to either, neither does my community. Um, it's not a coincidence that our communities are more likely to flood. You have known this flooding was coming for years. Ms. Watkins has too. Ms. Watkins, in the 1988 Shell Report on page 26, it says large, low-lying areas like Bangladesh may need to be abandoned. 
Ms. Watkins, does that bother you that your company deemed a country of 98 million brown people expendable in, ex in, in exchange for storing profits? Yes or no? It's just a yes or no. Actually, Congresswoman, it, I'm, I'm glad my company's been involved in the science research and involved in these discussions for decades. And, and we have been open and engaging with communities. And I, I feel what you're saying. And we are very active in the communities in which we operate and, and looking to make ourselves very uh, much members of the community and invest in communities, especially where there is risk um, of, of climate change uh, hitting harder than in other places. Thank you very much, because it bothers me. Let me just say that. You didn't say it, but I'll say it. It bothers me. It bothers me, too. I bo you. What you. bothers me, what bothers me is that... Uh, that was, that's the end of my question, but I have to keep moving. Um, but uh, I have another question for you. Was Shell aware that Black and Indigenous communities in the U.S. would flood and burn first? Yes or no? Black and Indigenous communities. I'm sorry, Congresswoman, I'm not, not familiar with what you're referencing. Um... Let me ask you this. Are black communities like mine in St. Louis expendable to you? Of course not. Communities are not expendable. We work every day hand in hand with our communities. And in fact, climate change is such a pressing issue that we have to, as, as companies, we have to work with our communities and with societies and with the government if we're going to be able to get to net zero by 2050. Thank you. Um, and, you know, your companies for decades uh, have been misrepresenting inf information and redirecting attention to solutions you know to be false, and that's continuing even in this hearing. But I thank you for speaking up and saying what you said. We appreciate that. But we're at a tipping point. Developing fossil fuels now, given the escalation of the climate crisis and its harm on black and brown communities, is unconscionable. Given each of your roles and these attacks on our humanity, you all should resign. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California, the vice chair, Gomez, is recognized for five minutes. And after his questioning, there will be a five-minute quick break at the request of the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Thank Gomez. You, Madam chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to just continue a little bit on um, Ms. Bush's uh, line of questioning. Um, I was in the California State Legislature for um, about four and a half years. And during that time, we were able to pass um, SB, uh, S, uh, the reduction, greenhouse gas reduction uh, goals. We were able to pass cap and trade, and we were able to pass a lot of the bills that oil opposed. And um, you opposed it, opposed it every step of the way. You believe that you're going uh, to upend and get us to um, stop, and, and we were able to win those fights. And I get it. You guys have a you're in your own business model. You, that's what you're protecting. But we're we're fighting across the board for um, communities in, in California, but also in the country, um, especially when the fact that climate the climate crisis disproportionately impacts communities of color. Those are the ones that are most likely to not get the jobs in the oil fields. They're the most likely the ones not to um, see the the direct benefits, but also get the the dirtier air, the dirtier water. They're the ones that are always in, in, in the path of the dis, destruction from the oil, oil uh, industry. So one of the things I want to really kind of focus in is, is like I said, um, Corey Bush's um, questioning. Let's start with Mr. Worth. Um, do you agree the impacts of climate change are worse for vulnerable communities or um, communities of color and um, low-income communities? Well, Congressman, this is a very important issue, I think, for society. So I appreciate you. Um, is there, I just to continue the conversation. So yes, yes or no? I mean, do you like do you agree that climate change is worse for low income and uh, communities of color? Congressman, there, there are many different uh, studies, opinions, and assertions on where and how climate change will manifest itself. I know. I mean, literally, liter Mr. Worth. I mean, listen. Um, I know people that work for you, and I respect them very. Uh, well, just simple. This was a fight that we fought in, in California. Um, yes or no? If you can't answer that, then there's no really reason to ask you the other question. Do you believe climate change is worse for communities of color and low-income communities? Yes or no? Congressman, I don't have uh, the ability to answer that. I think the uh, manifestation <laughs> of climate change... Yeah, so, uh, I, so I I'll take that as uh, your a no. Okay, Mr. Worth, uh, Chevron's business code of conduct includes the following principle, quote, protect people and the environment. 
So when Chevron states that the company has an ethical obligation to protect communities, does that include communities of color? Yes or no? Congressman, absolutely. Chevron strives to be a force for good in the communities in which we operate, and we're committed to continually improving our environmental and social performance, especially you, Mr. in Thank communities you, Mr. that are most vulnerable. Um, do you, Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you see that. Low-income communities and communities of colors are, are on the front lines of coping with climate change and the legacy of fossil fuels. Ms. Ward, do you believe Chevron has a moral obligation to prevent the negative health conditions and impacts and deaths caused by the, your products and the use of your products? Congressman, I think we have an obligation for doing our part to respond to this great challenge that we've spent all day talking about. Can We're you answer yes or no on that question? Yes I'm or no? Sorry? Just yes or no, if you see that it also, you have a moral obligation to prevent the negative health conditions and impacts caused on, peop uh, on, on uh, people by the use of your products. Congressman, we have an obligation to support people in their livelihoods with affordable, reliable energy, with good jobs, and doing our part Thank to reduce the carbon intensity of the energy system. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Worth. Um, Ms. Watkins, um, I want to kind of go over to you. Um, Shell has said that they, they have a goal of um, offsetting uh, 120 million tons of CO2 by 2030. Is that correct? We have a goal that we just announced today of reducing our scope one and two um, emissions that we control by 2030. Okay, if if she, I understand, if Shell is committed to reducing its environmental impact, then why does your plan plan to appeal a recent court ruling in the Netherlands mandating Shell to reduce its emissions by 45% by 2030? Yes, we're appealing that court ruling because we feel that um, that is not something that should be decided in the courts. And we are actively looking at accelerating, we are not even looking at, we are accelerating our powering progress strategy as evidenced by the new target that we put out today. And we look forward to continuing to work with governments like yourself, with society, you. uh, in order to accelerate the demand for cleaner- Let me, re let me redirect the, the question. You mentioned scope one and two, but you leave out scope three. And scope three emissions are 90% of your, of your um, emissions. So how do you plan on reducing it by 120 million tons by, uh, by 2030 if you're not targeting the 90% of your emissions? The gentleman's time has expired, but the gentleman may answer his question. Yes, so our scope one and two emissions by half by 2030 um, I don't know the exact tonnage of that. That's not that number is not familiar to me. But what I can say around scope three, and you're right, it is the vast majority um, of the the emissions is created from the the products, the the use of the products that we sell. We will be net zero, including scope three, by 2050 in step with society. That is our target for 2050. It includes scope three. Okay, your um, press release says 100. The, the, the gentleman's time has oh, thank expired. You. And uh, I now um, am calling for a quick uh, five-minute recess. It is a request from the witnesses. We stand in recess.
The meeting will come to order. Without objection, Mr. Kasten is authorized to participate in today's hearing. Mr. Kasten, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all our witnesses. For I know it has been a long day. Um, I want to just start by saying, as a as a chemical engineer by training, who spent a while as an engineer and then running some energy companies, I love chemical engineering. It's it's a lot of fun. I'm sure you have a lot of fun with it. I always thought it was cool that you can look at the temperature and a heat exchanger on one side and predict with amazing accuracy how the yield is going to change on the other side of your refinery or slight change in inputs changes the temperature. And um, it's, I think it's no surprise that, you know, it's organizations like yours who employ a lot of smart people like that. Um, they're actually pretty good at understanding how changes in chemistry affect temperature. Um, and in fact, James Black back in 1978, as you of course know, did this presentation to Exxon where he said that the, he predicted that we'd have a doubling in CO2 based on current growth rates around 2025, and that, that would lead to a one to three degree increase in temperature, which is basically exactly where we are. So Mr. Woods, um, kudos. You hire exceptionally talented people. You retrain them. Um, that's one of the talents of a CEO. I, I, I uh, commend you. We know that in the light of that information, um, you denied, you funded the Global Climate Coalition, you funded Willie Soon's research that was and you can try in climate science. And I don't want to go into that. You've had those conversations already. But I do want to talk about something that's in the news this week, which is that we've got all this information coming up that Facebook is phenomenally good at sowing disinformation. Not only can they not stop it, but they're actually really good at inflaming it. Um, they can convince people to that vaccines are bad. They can convince people to take horse medicine for goods. They can even convince people that it's patriotic to attack the United States Capitol. Good people. Um, so in light of that, in light of this amazing information, amazing tool to spread disinformation, in light of the fact that you guys have actively worked to spread that disinformation, it is intriguing to me that in 2021, according to Influence Map, Exxon has spent $4 million on Facebook ads. 75% of that money has been since June. And in fact, your digital advertising spend was running $50,000 a week in March and got up to $600,000 a week in October. Um, Mr. Mr. Woods, do you dispute those numbers about your advertising spend? I don't. I don't have those numbers available to me. So you I sound, you sound about sound about right, though. I I don't have a good uh, view of those numbers today. Could you could you speculate on what might have been going on in the last month that would cause you to rapidly increase your spending on a platform that's designed to amplify disinformation? Well, Congressman, I would uh, first make the point that I think differences of opinion are not but, information. But the, we have, uh, we, respectfully, sir, the laws of thermodynamics are not negotiable. We're not going there. I just want to know, do you know why you are amping up your spending on Facebook in the last few weeks by a factor of 12? I, I don't know what our spending in Facebook is, so it's hard for me to comment on what's changed. Okay, well, um, there is this Build Back Better Act going on that seems to be getting a lot of attention. It certainly seems dispositive. Um, Mr. Summers, that same analysis analyzed 25,000, a little over 25,000 ads from the fossil fuel industry. They found that 20% of those were from American Petroleum Institute that were promoting natural gas as a climate solution. Um, now, again, I go back to my friends in the chemical engineering sector. Methane is about 84 times as potent a greenhouse gas chemical as carbon dioxide. When it's initially released, it lasts a little over a decade in the atmosphere and then breaks down. Over 100 years, it's about 30 times as impactful over 20 years, which is kind of the time we have to get to zero, 84, which means that somewhere between 1% to 3% leakage rate in the system, and methane is actually worse than coal. And you all are out there promoting this as a part of the climate solution. Let's call it 2%, just to be um, even. Mr. Summers, um, do you dispute that methane is, a, is a 80, 80 times more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Congressman, thank you for your question. Uh, natural gas has led uh, so to- So just asking for a yes or no, do you dispute that it's 84 times as potent? Congressman, this industry has done everything that we can do to so, limit separate, methane I'll, I'll get, emissions I'll over time. I'll get to time. the leaks. Do, do you dispute the science is my only question. Congressman, we trust the climate science. Okay, but do, do you believe that the natural gas system today has less than 2% leaks from wellhead to burner tip? Congressman, we don't dispute the science in this space. I'm asking about the, leaking, leak, about the leakage rates. Do you, I, I get that we don't want to have leaks, but do you, do, is it your position that there's less than 2% leaks from wellhead to burner tip? 
Congressman, we have programs at the American Petroleum Institute to work to limit, limit methane uh, emissions. Okay, but the, you're ducking the question, sir. If you don't have that, you've got to ask why you're calling something a climate solution that as we sit today is warming up the planet. I will leave you both with an observation. A former board member of mine who's an idol of mine used to tell us when we got in board disputes that the only thing that matters in this life is whether our grandchildren are proud of us. The West is on fire. Floods are coming. So ice is melting because of analysis you had in 1978. My question for all of you, which you can submit for the record, is are your grandchildren proud of you? I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, Mr. Jones is authorized to participate in today's hearing. Mr. Jones, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, if you listen to our witnesses today or, or read their company's climate plans, you might conclude that carbon capture is nothing short of a miracle, a technology solution so impactful that it will save us from the catastrophic effects of climate change. Exxon, for example, is promoting a proposed carbon capture and storage hub in Texas designed to capture emissions from industrial facilities and power plants. Uh, a way, at least according to Exxon's own ads and marketing materials, to have the best of both worlds. Uh, continue to burn fossil fuels with reckless abandon, but pay none of the climate price. Mr. Woods, at an investor meeting earlier this year, you were quoted as saying, carbon capture and storage is going to be needed to reduce emissions. And your written testimony reflects that sentiment as well. Uh, today, there are 13 active commercial carbon capture and storage sites in the US, according to the Global CCS Institute's 2020 report. One of those sites belongs to Exxon, correct? A simple yes or no will do. I'm not familiar with that report, but we do have a facility in the U.S., yes. In Shoot Creek, uh, yeah. Wyoming. Yes. Uh, in 12 of those sites, including the one Exxon owns, the captured carbon is used for what is called enhanced oil recovery, a, a method to pump out hard-to-reach oil by injecting pressurized CO2. Uh, is that correct? Again, a, a simple yes or no will do, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, 95% of the carbon being captured at these U.S. sites is used for extracting more oil. To be clear, Exxon and others are using captured CO2 to extract more oil and calling this a climate mitigation strategy. Uh, Mr. Woods, yes or no, when Exxon promotes carbon capture as a climate solution, does this include carbon capture used for enhanced oil recovery? Uh, Congressman, I would suggest that you're confusing the technology with its uses. Carbon capture is a proven technology to concentrate CO2. And then the question is what you do with that concentration, we can store it. Our Houston hub is to capture that CO2 and then store it in aquifers offshore. It would not be used for enhanced oil recovery. So there's a difference between the technology and then what you use the technology for. So, so, Mr. so Mr. Woods, I'm sorry, I, I, I do want to, I do have other questions. I just, just want to get a yes or no answer. Um, when Exxon promotes carbon capture as a climate solution, does this include carbon capture that's used for, for enhanced oil recovery? Or Our, is yes or no? Our focus has been to capture CO2 and sequester it, not for EOR. Okay, uh, so even though the overwhelming majority of existing carbon capture technology deployed is, is ultimately used to extract even more fossil fuel, uh, Exxon plans to increase investment in carbon capture as a way to quote, be consistent with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, but the truth is carbon capture might help the fossil fuel companies extract more oil, but it won't do anything to prevent us all from paying the catastrophic costs of the climate crisis. Uh, to make enhanced oil recovery work from a climate perspective, Exxon, and to be fair, the rest of the fossil fuel industry as well, would need to capture and store an ever-increasing amount of carbon for which there is neither the technological capacity or infrastructure at scale to meet our 2030 or even 2050 obligations under the Paris Climate Agreement. The U.S., as you know, is committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. But Exxon's carbon capture facility has only been able to capture and bury less than 20% of the carbon produced by the single plant 
on which it operates. Uh, Mr. Woods, how do you expect to capture enough of Exxon's future emissions from extraction, transportation, and other company operations to remain consistent with the country's net zero obligation? Congressman, uh, that's the big challenge we all face moving from one energy uh, source to another, and it has been widely recognized in order for society to be successful by the IPCC and the IEA that carbon capture will play an important role in that, and the policy to support implementation of carbon capture will be important to achieve society's objectives. So no matter what solution we go to, there's going to be uh, extensive need for additional investment in infrastructure, as well as the technology to replace today's uh, energy system. So it's not a question of spending more money, it's where you spend that money. And I would I would make the point that a, a number of solutions are required and a number of large investments in those solutions are required across our economy and across the world as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Uh, I understand that to mean that you don't know yet how you can capture enough of Exxon's future emissions from extraction, transportation, and other company operations to remain consistent with our country's net zero obligation. And with that, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, Mr. Levin is off authorized to participate in today's hearing. Mr. Levin, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and Thank thanks you. to all the witnesses. Um, I want to shift our focus to the oil refinery workers your companies employ. Mr. Woods, I'm going to ask you a few yes or no questions and then get into one issue in more detail. Does ExxonMobil educate workers on possible job loss from climate change? And have you advised workers that you believe addressing the climate crisis may cause some of them to lose their job? What we've talked about with our organization is the opportunity to address the risk of climate change through investments and technologies and so right, but I'm, I'm asking about people's sorry. jobs, sir. Uh, yeah, and I'll get to that. Too. So, well, I don't have a lot of time. So do you talk to them about that they may lose their jobs? Yes or no? We, we believe jobs. that the transition will involve capabilities and skill sets that are consistent with our existing businesses. So there's an opportunity to evolve those jobs into uh, different uh, applications so, like carbon capture, like, hydrogen, it. like so, biofuel. So do you have specific programs in place to retain and protect the workers that you currently employ? Is that what you're kind of saying? No, what I'm saying is as the, as the world transitions and as the solutions that are going to be required, like hydrogen and biofuel and carbon captures, those investments will require workers to operate those facilities. And those the skills of those workers are very okay. good. I understand. So, so do you, would you say that, that uh, from your perspective, the company considers the well-being of your workers when you're making new business decisions? We believe that it, the, it's a our, simple workers, question, sir. our workers are fundamental to the value proposition of our company, so they're very important to the equation. Okay, well, I, I, I want to, I really have to question um, a lot of what you consider uh, as your workers are making, the, the, how much you really consider them when you're making these decisions, given reports coming out of the Beaumont refinery. Can you confirm that on May 1st, your company escorted 650 oil refiners in Beaumont, Texas, in the refinery there off the job, replacing experienced members of United Steelworkers Local 13243 with temporary workers in an effort to force a vote on your latest contract, propo contract proposal? At Beaumont, we've had contract negotiations ongoing for quite some time. We failed. You locked the workers out, sir, and replaced the reach, temporary workers. We failed to reach an agreement, and as part of that process and the strike notice, we had a lockout. That's correct. Well, Madam Chairwoman, ExxonMobil states in its guiding principles for employees, quote, we're committed to maintaining safe work environment, enriched by diversity and characterized by open communication, trust, and fair treatment. I failed to see how that is true based on today's hearing. ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel companies have sold this untrue narrative that they're acting out of concern for their workers while simultaneously undermining them, as in the case with the lockout in Beaumont, Texas. We have evidence that their workers aren't their primary concern in their business decisions regarding climate change. As many have referenced earlier, former ExxonMobil senior advisor Keith McCoy was caught on camera defending ExxonMobil's early efforts to fight cl uh, against climate science 
at stating that there's nothing legal about doing that. And we're just looking out for our investments. We're looking out for our shareholders. He didn't mention the workers. And now when these companies can no longer hide from their climate denialism and disinformation, they work behind the scenes to shift climate liability away from profit margins and onto the backs of their workers by refusing to give them a seat at the table or to be clear about the long-term impacts that climate change has on their livelihoods. I am tired of oil industry-backed groups opposing efforts to address climate change in the name of protecting good jobs and workers. Let us remember, it was not the CEOs and big bosses of these companies that made oil refinery jobs good jobs. It was unions and workers who fought for decades and are still fighting for these benefits. We can save life on earth as we know it and support our workers to have good jobs. I implore all the witnesses testifying today to give oil refinery workers a seat at the table and I remain steadfast in my commitment to ensuring that workers are held harmless and supported in this transition while corporate polluters pay for the climate disinformation they have peddled for decades. With that, Madam Chairwoman, with 10, minute, 10 seconds to spare, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back without objection. Ms. Omar is authorized to participate in today's hearing. Ms. Omar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I am glad to join uh, this, this discussion. I know there has been a lot of uh, conversations around the coordinated um, efforts uh, that the fossil fuel companies um, have put uh, together um, to create and spread this information about climate change. Um, as we heard earlier in 1998, the American Petroleum Institute, or API, assembled a global climate science communication team, compromised the fossil fuel companies and front groups working to coordinate a misinformation campaign surrounding climate uh, change. Mr. Wright, uh, the action plan says, quote, Sharon Nice of Chevron was uh, a member of the global climate science communication team, correct? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, I appreciate the question. I'm. It's, it's just yes or no, sir. I'm not familiar with the uh, instance you're referring to, so I don't have any knowledge of that. All right. Um, Mr. Woods, the action plan also says, quote, Randy Rondall of Exxon was a member of the team. Do you agree? Uh, I don't know uh, about that. That's, that was several decades ago. And, uh, okay. So on page two of the April 3, 1998 action plan says that these employees were listed um, as members uh, who contributed to the development of the plan. In 1998, the Global Climate Science Communication Team produced, quote, action plan, outlining a strategy to conduct a coordinated misinformation campaign on climate change. Mr. Woods, an Exxon employee was involved in developing this plan, this action plan, right? As I said, I'm not familiar with that activity. It was 20 years ago. So okay, I and Mr. Wright, is that the same for you? Do you know if that these employees were involved in creating this action plan? I don't have information about the instance that you are making reference to, Congressman. Okay. Again, on page two of that action plan lists these employees. The plan explained that, quote, victory, end quote, would be achieved when, quote, average citizens understand uncertainties in climate science, end quote. And recognition of that uncertainty, quote, becomes part of the conventional wisdom. We've heard today that Exxon executives were warned about the reality of the climate change as early as the 1970s. As we know, API shared information within the industry about the dangers of climate change. Yet both of your organizations contributed to a plan to inject doubt and uncertainty into the climate debate. Mr. Simmons, yes or no, did the global climate science communication 
the cheap victory as it laid out as it was laid out in that action plan. Congresswoman, I'm not familiar with what you're referring to. In 1998, I was 23 years old. Uh, I came to API in 2018 and focused I, I am, on the climate I, as, challenge. As I study the, the history of the institution I participate in, I am sure you do as well. But it seems very clear that they did. The fossil fuel industry worked collectively to prevent action on climate change. They coordinated their campaigns with groups like the Global Climate Science Communication Team. Their efforts at, mis at disinformation were conscious and deliberate. Over the past three decades, the fossil fuel industry has continued their efforts by making $780 million in political donations, with 80% of those donations going to Republicans. In 2020 alone, the industry made $139 million in donations to candidates and committees, of which 84% went to Republicans and mostly climate deniers. It is yet another reason we need to get the fossil fuel money out of our politics. Fossil fuel companies have polluted our air, land, and water for profit, despite knowing the devastating impact it has on our companies. It seems like you all have achieved that victory of leading the public um, with this information. And as one of my colleagues said earlier, I hope that you are ashamed of the future that you contributed for your children and for ours, and I ask all of you to resign. With that, I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. The gentlelady yields back. I am prepared to close now. All of our witnesses have had their time to ask their quest questions, and the witnesses have responded, and I thank them for their time and their testimonies. But before we close, I want to offer the ranking member an opportunity to offer any closing remarks he may have. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I honestly, sincerely think this was one of the better hearings that we've had today. Uh, the one thing that I think most Americans who've watched this hearing would take from it is that the Biden energy policies have already had a dramatic impact on the inflationary prices that we've seen of gas and what we're going to see this winter with, uh, with natural gas. So uh, I think that was an important thing for the American people to see. Uh, this was a timely hearing because gas prices have risen 27 days in a row, 27 days in a row with no end in sight. You know, we've had uh, a lot of interesting antics from my friends on the other side of the aisle. We've had uh, a request to make a pledge to, of all things, cut production. When we're seeing gas prices soaring right now, the last thing in the world we need to do is, is cut production. Uh, we've seen them uh, make a, try to get the CEOs to make a pledge to cut production. At the same time, Joe Biden is pleading with OPEC to increase production. It makes no sense. And we've had questions about how much lobbying the energy industry spent to lobby on behalf of the Paris Climate Accords. Of course, they spent little to none on uh, lobbying for that. The only countries that would have spent money lobbying for the Paris Climate Accords would have been companies in, energy companies in China or Ukraine. Uh, perhaps when we become the majority and we subpoena Hunter Biden, we can ask Hunter Biden about that question. And then, you know, as our colleague, Representative Omar, just said, that attacking the oil and gas industry for donating 80% of their contributions to Republicans, the first thing that, that crossed my mind, Madam Chair, is I, I guess they feel like fools for donating 20% to the Democrats. I mean, this is crazy, this policy that's only going to make energy prices higher, only gonna make us more dependent on foreign countries for our energy, and it's gonna do nothing to reduce carbon emissions. And finally, we've seen stunts, like with Katie Porter. Uh, you know, it looked like she was in California 
Madam Chair, I hope she doesn't get fined by Gavin Newsom for polluting or whatever she was doing there in the back of her car in, in, in California. But, you know, the, the, the most predictable thing that we've seen today was what we've seen, a, a trend with the Democrats attacking private sector companies for making a profit. And what always confuses me is, is why my friends on the left continue to attack companies for making a profit while at the same time wanting to increase the corporate tax. If corporations don't make a profit, it doesn't matter what the corporate tax rate is. So I think there's a lot of differing opinions that uh, the American people have seen today from this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses who came here today. I want to thank the investment that you've made uh, in creating good paying jobs, in doing your best to see that we are less dependent on foreign oil. I want to also thank you for your investment to reduce carbon emissions. The climate's very important to Republicans as well. We just want to uh, work with the private sector to reduce our carbon footprint while at the same time reduce our dependence on foreign countries for energy and at the same time create and maintain good paying jobs. So that's a hallmark of the Republican policy. We care about the climate, but we also want to work with the private sector to reduce carbon emissions and continue to create good paying jobs. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman uh, yields back. I want to thank all of the witnesses for appearing today and thank all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their participation in this important hearing. I've been listening carefully to today's testimony. As I said earlier, I had hoped to thank all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their participation in this important hearing. I've been listening carefully to today's testimony. As I said earlier, I had hoped today would be a turning point for the oil industry. I was grateful to hear the top fossil fuel CEOs finally admit that climate change is real, that burning fossil fuels is causing it, and that we must act urgently to fix it. But I was disappointed that we also heard much of the same denial and deflection we have heard before. Today's witnesses refused to take responsibility for Big Oil's decades-long disinformation campaign. And even after agreeing that we are, in fact, in, quote, code red, end quote, crisis, they refused to stop funding groups like the American Petroleum Institute that are still blocking reforms like expanding the use of electric vehicles. So I see no choice but to continue our committee's investigation until we see the truth. We requested documents from each of these companies six weeks ago, which were due on September 30th. We followed up before the due date to identify categories of doc documents that were of particular importance to be produced quickly. After they missed the deadline, we sent warning letters to all six companies urging them to complete their productions by October 25th or face further action. Unfortunately, none of the six entities have produced a substantial portion of the key documents the committee requested. Instead, they produced reams of other documents, many of which were publicly available. One entity sent in 1,500 pages printed from their own website, available publicly, along with 4,000 pages of newsletters filled with industry press releases. Others sent us thousands of pages of publicly available annual reports and the company's postings on Facebook and LinkedIn. Now, let me tell you what the, what the fossil fuel companies 
have not produced. These organizations have not produced the detailed funding information that we requested and that we need to understand their payments to shadow groups and to over 150 public relations companies and advertisements on social media, payments that today's witnesses seem intent on continuing. Nearly all the companies have failed to turn over uh, board materials the committee needs to examine corporate strategies on climate change. And with only a few limited exceptions, the fossil fuel companies have not produced any internal documents or internal communications from senior executives about their company's role in climate change. I have tried very hard to obtain this information voluntarily, but the oil companies employ the same tactics they use for decades on climate policy, delay and obstruction. Well, that ends today. I am formally notifying the ranking member and members of the committee that I intend to issue subpoenas to the fossil fuel entities represented here today. I have draft subpoenas here. Please know that I do not take this step lightly. When Republican Dan Burton was chairman of this committee, he issued more than 1,000 subpoenas without a single complaint from my Republican colleagues. I have been much more selective, but we are at code red for climate, and I am committed to doing everything I can to help rescue this planet and save it for our children. We need to get to the bottom of the oil industry's disinformation campaign, and with these subpoenas, we will. Madam Chair, point of order, point of order. What is the gentleman's point of order? Just want to publicly say I object to the issuance of subpoenas. The oil and gas executives here today have provided over 100,000 pages of documents, and we feel like that's an infringement upon their First Amendment rights. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, they produced documents, but they were not the documents that we requested. Um, most of it was like this, completely publicly available on their website, uh, their annual reports, and as you know, Chairman Khanna and I wrote you a letter yesterday highlighting our serious concerns that the fossil fuel organizations were not fully complying with our request and were obstructing and delaying our investigation. I also noted that we gave these organizations multiple opportunities to produce them voluntarily. We requested it in writing and phone calls, and reaching out to their offices. In fact, uh, Chairman Rokana and I wrote to them just last week and warned them if they, if they did not comply voluntarily that the committee would be forced to consider additional steps to obtain compliance. So we have been true to our word, and we sent, spent a, a great deal of time trying to obtain these documents we were not able to obtain them. They are important. We are now requesting them with a subpoena. I have draft subpoenas here. I'm willing to share them if you'd like them. And we, we, we strongly, Madam Chair, we strongly reiterate the fact that we feel this is a, an infringement upon their First Amendment rights. This is the government, uh, this is the Oversight and Government Reform Committee we're supposed to focus on waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal bureaucracy. Great. The meeting is adjourned. Uh, before we close, in closing, I want to thank our panelists once again for their remarks, and I want to commend my colleagues for participating in this very important conversation. With that and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you can. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>